Blowback, a Titus Black novel, book five, by R.J. Patterson, performed by Kyle Tate. Chapter One, Qom, Iran, Fordow Nuclear Enrichment Facility. Titus Black leaned against the side of the box truck and remained frozen in darkness. A latch squeaked before the back door rolled up, light flooding the cargo hold. Seconds later, an armed guard hopped inside. With Black tucked halfway back amidst boxes of food, he had a small window through which to view the inspection. He clutched his weapon, hoping he could get inside the facility undetected. Wide-eyed, he watched Carton slide aside, and other containers moved, as the guard drew dangerously close. Looks good to me, the guard said in Farsi, before exiting the truck. Black exhaled as the door slammed shut. Moments later, the truck rumbled on, taking Black deep inside the underground structure. When he finally came to a stop, the door rolled up again, and workers began unloading the supplies. Black studied the men for a moment, praying that his uniform wouldn't cause him to stand out. Once he determined he matched perfectly, he waited for the workers to disappear before grabbing a box and following them into the building. Black kept his head down and set the box just outside the double doors leading into the kitchen. Then he continued walking down the hall until he reached a passageway that led toward the women's dorm. Black spoke into his comms. I'm in, and headed for the target now. Roger that, said Christina Shields, his partner who was managing the operation from the comfort of the Firestorm offices in Washington, D.C. The target was Jana Shadid, a nuclear engineer who'd been recruited by Iran after she graduated from Georgia Tech with a master's degree. In the 24 hours before she accepted the lucrative offer to work for the Iranian government, the Jordanian national student was approached by a Mossad agent who asked Jana to spy for them. According to the dossier Black read on her, she was helpful in providing information to the Israeli intelligence organization about Iran's plans. However, her omission from Mossad's sudden extraction of all its agents in Iran had puzzled Black. When CIA Deputy Director Robert Besserman heard about Mossad asking for help, he inquired about Black's availability. His obsession with staring death in the face had made him the type of agent suited for such assignments. Black wasn't afraid of dying, and the thrill of confronting his mortality was a high he couldn't find elsewhere. When Firestorm Director J.D. Blunt presented the opportunity, Black didn't hesitate to accept. Extracting a Mossad agent from Iran on a solo mission? That was an assignment Taylor made for his adrenaline appetite. However, as Black moved down the corridor of the secret nuclear site, he understood why an intelligence agency might leave someone like Jana behind, though he vehemently would disagree with such a decision. A few weeks earlier, a Mossad agent had defected to Iran and revealed the identities of more than two dozen spies on the Israelis' payroll, including Jana. However, most of them were in lower-level positions, ones easily abandoned. The intel gained from those agents was minimal, considered a luxury by the agency. But Jana was different. Her insight was incredibly valuable, while at the same time nearly impossible to reach. Mossad wanted her out, but didn't want to chance an international incident by sending in another agent on an incredibly dangerous rescue mission. Fortunately, the CIA owed Mossad a favor, one Black was happy to give on behalf of Americans. This place is more insular than the underground bunker facility in Cheyenne Mountain, Black said in a hushed tone into his comms. Only a lunatic would think he could get out of here alive, much less with an asset. They found the right man for the job then, Shield said. Just say a prayer for me. Black said. He rounded the corner and then eased into the laundry room outside the women's dorm. At least the Mossad schematics of this place are dead on, Black said. What else would you expect from an engineer? 
And a hell of an engineer at that, she asked, breaking into a sing-song voice. Is that some kind of a joke? He asked as he donned a keffiyeh. I grew up in Georgia, remember? It's a line from the Georgia Tech fight song. I didn't know they had a football team. They don't, according to my dad. Black chuckled as he finished squeezing into the traditional women's garb. According to intel from Mossad, the majority of the women on staff at the facility didn't wear full head coverings. However, the custodial staff did, and Black took full advantage of the opportunity to walk around in complete disguise, without even raising an eyebrow. Here we go, Black said, before taking a deep breath and returning to the hallway with a cleaning cart. He fiddled with his supplies while waiting for someone to open the door. After a couple of minutes, a woman strolled past and waved her security card in front of the access pad. Black hustled after her, pushing his cart into the main floor of the women's dorm. Once he got his bearings, he navigated toward Jana's room. Upon reaching it, Black knocked and waited. He leaned in to listen, but didn't hear anything. Everything all right? Shields asked. She's not answering, Black whispered. Be patient. Nearly a half minute passed before Black heard the shuffling of feet across the floor. Then the door swung open, where a squinting Jana greeted him. I'm here for your cleaning, Black said in Farsi with a high-pitched voice before pushing his way inside. Jana protested briefly, before sighing and moving over. I thought my room was already cleaned this morning. After the door latched shut, Black put his back against it and asked in his normal voice, Jana Shadid. Her eyes widened as she drew back. She strode over to her desk and reached beneath it before flipping a switch. Yes, you may speak freely. I'm with the U.S. government and I've been tasked with extracting you from this facility. She scowled. I don't work for the U.S. government. I know, he said. You work for Mossad, but they couldn't pull you out of here on such short notice. Pull me out of here? What for? What happened? Someone defected and had access to all the names of Mossad agents, which were turned over to the Iranians. It's only a matter of hours before they make a sweep for all of you, and turn you into political puppets, or bury you in a shallow grave. The Israelis weren't keen on either option. Neither am I, she said. But why would they leave me behind? Everything happened so suddenly, Black said, and they couldn't risk having more of their agents caught and igniting a new conflict between the two countries. So we must not have good odds of escaping? Black shrugged. Your odds of survival are about a million to one, if you don't want to come with me. And if I go with you? I put it at about three in ten, maybe four. That's not instilling a lot of confidence in me right now. You're an engineer, Black said. You're good with numbers. Which of the two is more promising? She sighed. Okay, let me get my things. No, Black said. We're traveling as light as possible. Take what you can fit in your pockets, and then we're leaving. Do you have a plan? Black grunted. Jana, this is what I do. My life is on the line, too. I wouldn't dream of trying to get you out of this place without a plan, and a good one at that. Fine. Give me a second. She scurried around the room, quickly deciding what few items she wanted to take but her dithering was cut short by Black. We need to leave right now, he said. She hustled over to the door, where he stood waiting. Just follow my instructions, and don't hesitate when I tell you to do something. Understand? Jana pursed her lips and nodded. Black smiled wryly. I might even upgrade our chances to five and ten with your full compliance. Now let's go. He navigated them out of the women's dorm and back to the janitorial offices. Then Black checked his watch. They had five minutes to reach the docks and find the transport truck exiting the facility without getting caught. How's your upper arm strength? Black asked. 
If I'm going to be hanging on for my life, it'll be well above average. That's what I like to hear. So what's the plan? She asked. Black put his finger to his lips before leading her down another corridor. He stopped outside a pair of double doors that opened up to a loading area. Peering through a small opening, he assessed the situation. There's a truck out there that's leaving in a few minutes, Black said. Some workers are going to load it with nuclear waste, and we're going to hide underneath it. Wait, what? You heard me, Black said. When I open this door, we're going to sprint toward that truck, slide beneath it, and then grab onto the axle. Get comfortable however you can. And then what? We're not going too far down the road before I put a stop to the truck. But you've got to hold on like your life depends on it. Because it does, doesn't it? Black nodded. Sorry about this. But I promise you it's better than the alternative. I can handle it. Good. Let's go for it. Black poked his head out once more to make sure the area was clear before sprinting with Janna toward the truck. He crouched low as he ran, and wasted no time sliding beneath the vehicle. Seconds later, she joined him, leaving them both with nothing to do but inspect the undercarriage. Black identified the most comfortable spot for her to hang on to, before finding a place for him to grab hold. They both rested on the ground until they heard voices and footsteps approaching the truck from around the corner. Two men strolled out, and got inside the truck, while a guard circled it. Everything looks good to me, the guard said in Farsi. Don't you want to check inside? One of the drivers asked. I'd rather not get around it. He pounded on the side, before the engine roared to life. Black glanced at Janna. Hold on. He wrapped his feet around the axle, and hugged it tightly, as the truck wove its way through the underground roads before emerging into the daylight. Soon, the truck stopped for another checkpoint near the gate, and Black peered over at Janna. Are you okay? he asked. Never better, she whispered with a grimace. Once cleared to proceed, the truck rumbled along again, before turning north onto the highway. Black quickly grabbed his weapon with his right hand, and flung his arms over the axle. He had to time his move just right, waiting until the truck reached full speed. As soon as it did, he looked down the road to see how close they were to the overpass. Satisfied that they were at a safe distance to reach it, he looked over at Janna one final time. Get ready, he shouted. He took aim at the back left tire and pulled the trigger. The truck wobbled for a second before the driver started to slow down and edged toward the shoulder. Before we come to a full stop, we have to make a run for it. Follow my lead, okay? Got it. With the truck coasting beneath the overpass, Black gave Janna a knowing nod and then let go. Once the truck rolled past them, they both leaped to their feet. Black raced up the embankment with Janna nipping at his heels. They took cover in a nook, enabling them to see down onto the truck. The driver got out and inspected the wheel before kicking at it. He threw his hands up, and yelled a few expletives in Farsi before getting to work. Fifteen minutes later, the tire was changed, and they were returning to the highway. Black waited until the road was empty for as far as he could see, before he charged down the embankment and crossed to the other side. Janna bounded after him. Waiting for them across the road was a Samand, a white four-door sedan, the kind that most Iranians drove. Black knelt next to the front driver's side tire and felt around for the magnetic key box he'd hidden in the wheel well. Working quickly, he unlocked the vehicle and told Janna to get inside. He buckled his seatbelt with one hand as he navigated onto the road. We're in the car, Black said over his comms. Are you still tracking us, Shields? Loud and clear, Shields said. I even have visual. Stay close in case we need you. Roger that. Black looked over at Janna, who had yet to buckle up. You might want to put that thing on. These roads are bumpy. She blew a tendril of her dark hair out of her eyes. I don't know how you expect to get me out of the country without a passport, Janna said as she eyed Black cautiously. 
Why would you need one? Black asked. Passports aren't part of the plan. And how are we going to get over the border? Is Scotty just going to beam us over? Black furrowed his brow and rubbed his chin before responding. Is that a Star Wars reference? She glared at him. Star Trek! Take it easy, Black said. By that look, you would have thought I just killed your grandma. You're an American, she said. I thought you would at least know the difference between the two. Stop messing with her, Black, Shield said over the comms. Space movies aren't my thing, Black said with a wry grin. I know you're lying, she said. You probably have a poster of Princess Leia up in your room. Black chuckled and shook his head. I'm more of a Han Solo kind of guy. Jana clapped her hands and pointed at him. I knew it. Guilty as charged, he said. It's just fun watching you nerds squirm when I act aloof about your cult space classics. Now, are you going to finally tell me how you're going to get me out of the country without a passport? She asked. We're headed to a small port town several hours south of here. Bendar de Lam. Ever heard of it? She shook her head. That doesn't sound familiar. Well, we have someone there who's agreed to help us get onto a ship. Might want to check your six, Shield said, jolting him into action. Black adjusted his rearview mirror and studied the rapidly approaching image of the Iranian police car. He cursed under his breath before slamming his fist on the steering wheel. What is it? Jana asked. We've got company. She turned and looked out the back window. Just do what he says. As the police car approached Black, it flashed its lights. The officer motioned for Black to pull over to the shoulder, and he complied. Think he knows who we are? Black asked. She shrugged. I would never put anything past the Iranians. All I know is that if you try to kill him to help us get away, we will be hunted, and it'll be much worse for both of us. I'll keep that in mind. Seconds later, the officer tapped on the glass. Black rolled down his window. What's the problem, officer? The officer held a steely gaze with Black. I need you to get out of the car. Chapter 2 Washington, D.C. J.D. Blunt stopped on the sidewalk outside D-City Smokehouse Restaurant and closed his eyes. He tilted his head back and inhaled the succulent aroma of ribs wafting through the air. Upon opening his eyes again, a wide smile spread across his face. He stumbled forward when a man put his arm around Blunt. There's nothing like the smell of smoked meat, is there? Blunt turned to see Alaska Congressman Clyde Silver. No, there isn't. Then let's not delay getting in line, Silver said. The lunch crowd is about to descend upon this place like Alaskan mosquitoes on a shirtless man in the wilderness. Blunt chuckled, able to fully appreciate the obscure analogy, as someone who'd spent any time in the backcountry of Alaska could. He had gone on several fishing trips with Silver in the past, when they both served in Congress. Happy to reciprocate, Blunt took Silver on a couple of hunting expeditions in Texas. They placed their order and then found a table in the back of the noisy restaurant, away from the patrons crowding near the counter to order, and sat down. After they caught up on their lives outside of work, Blunt's easy smile vanished. So, you didn't just want to grab some barbecue with me today, did you? Blunt asked. Well, I'd do it any time, Silver said. But you're right. There's something going on that you need to know about. Their number was called out, and Blunt volunteered to retrieve their plates. Neither man spoke as they got settled. Then Blunt picked up his first rib and eyed it closely. What exactly do I need to know? He asked, before taking his first bite. Someone is coming for you, Silver said. Blunt laughed as he chewed his food. When he was finished, he sought out a napkin to clean up the sauce dripping from his fingertips. I'm not trying to be funny, Silver said. This is very serious. I know, I know. But it's not a day that ends in Y if someone isn't coming after me. Listen, JD, this isn't a joke. 
Vernon Roberts has placed you directly in his crosshairs and has nefarious plans for you. Well, that might be something new. I've been told that people have plans to destroy me, but nefarious plans, that's even a new one for me. If you don't pay close attention, it's not only going to be nefarious, but also fatal. Do you really think I'm afraid of him? Blunt asked. That guy's an attention hound, just trying to stay in the public's collective consciousness so he doesn't get bounced after the next election. Some people just aren't cut out for the grind of serving in the House of Representatives. Running for office every two years is just exhausting. I know Roberts has yet to make his mark on Capitol Hill, but that doesn't mean he isn't dangerous. Dangerous how? Do you remember the Tilly bill that you helped author? Blunt nodded. That was my crown and achievement. How could I possibly forget it? We eliminated more than half a billion dollars of government waste. You also eliminated his father's job. Blunt shook his head. So his father was working for one of those corporations bilking the government? It's a pity when it hurts the hard-working American, but that kind of corruption has no place in this country. What became of his father? He fell into alcoholism and committed suicide a few years ago. That's when he said he realized just how broken this country was. And I guess he's zeroing in on me as part of the problem. Silver nodded as he sucked clean one of the ribs. Behind closed doors, he's let it be known in no uncertain terms that he's going to make sure you are eliminated from any connection to government funding. Firestorm is an advisory group to help secure our troops abroad and our country at home, Blunt said, parroting the organization's mission. I know what Firestorm claims to be, and we all know what you stand for, but that's not going to stop Roberts. We just aid and assist the government when it comes to thinking through good policies. Not everyone sees it that way, the congressman said, and he's weaseled his way onto the House Intelligence Committee. Blunt put down his rib, his eyes widening as he looked up at Silver. How in the hell did a freshman representative get onto that committee? That's a question plenty of us around the Hill are asking. A freshman in that position is rarer than a two-headed peacock. Now that's one Texas saying I haven't heard before, Silver said with a faint grin. That's because I just made it up, Blunt said. I'm so mad I could spit nails right now. I just thought I'd warn you to watch yourself, because somebody is watching you, Silver said. Roberts made his entire platform about coming to Washington to end corruption and eliminate the kind of politicians whose aim is to pad the pockets of the rich. You mean... He's just like 80% of the newly elected representatives when they first arrive in Washington? Yeah, well, I wouldn't mistake his campaign rhetoric for hot air. Roberts is out for blood, namely yours. You're the only one on the committee who knows what we do, right? Silver nodded. It's a well-kept secret, and I intend to keep it that way, Blunt said. You do important work and I won't let some rogue congressman derail that, no matter how hard he might try. But I wouldn't get adversarial with him just yet. Let him show his hand before you try to take him down. It might be easier than you think. Blunt grunted and shook his head. Nothing ever seems to come easy for me. Except scarfing down these ribs, Silver said with a grin. I'd come here every day if I could. Agreed. I'd make it a standing lunch date if I didn't have this business of stopping terrorism everywhere all the time. Silver stood and untucked his tie from his shirt before he put his blazer back on. Just keep your guard up, J.D., and don't do anything rash. Chapter 3 Calm Iran Black looked down at the document in his hand casting him as Dr. Benjamin Tyler, a visiting archaeology professor from the University of British Columbia. He took a deep breath and then stepped out of the vehicle. Jana joined him, getting out on the other side. The officer took the paper and studied it for a moment. Dr. Tyler, the officer said, would you prefer that I speak English? Black shrugged and responded in French. 
I was born in Quebec. If it's all the same to you, I'd rather speak in French. He wanted to ward off any suspicion that he was actually an American. The officer muttered something in Farsi. He turned toward Jana and spoke in Farsi. Can you translate for him? I don't know what language he just spoke in, and I obviously don't speak it. He can understand you just fine, she said. But it might be easier for him to explain in French. The officer huffed and continued in Farsi. Where were you going? We're driving to a dig site, Jana said. I'm escorting him there. Well, you were speeding, the officer said as he looked at Black. And I'm going to give you a ticket. Black shrugged. Maybe the speedometer is broken. Get in the car, the officer said. I will be right back. He took Black's papers and retreated back to the police cruiser. Once Black and Jana got back inside, he drew a deep breath and then exhaled slowly. I don't like this one bit. Just stay calm, she said. I don't think he suspects a thing. I'm calm. I just don't like this. He's likely just trying to get you to pay a bribe. Just watch. A couple of minutes later, the officer returned with all of Black's papers. Here is your ticket, which is to be paid at customs upon exiting our great country. Visiting here is a privilege. As he went to hand over the documents, he drew them back suddenly. Black, waiting to take them, kept his hand out. Is there another problem? I need my papers, please. And I'm going to need some money. Black shook his head. I'm sorry, but I was warned by my consulate not to pay any bribes to police officers. Did they tell you that I could arrest you and keep you in prison for up to two weeks for any reason? The policeman asked. I'm not a man of great means. So if you're attempting to get more money from me, I'm afraid you've pulled over the wrong driver. The officer put his hands on his belt. I think we need to talk again outside the car. Black lingered for a moment, considering all his options before joining the man. I don't have any money for you. Then you don't get these back, Professor, the officer said, waving the papers in front of Black. Before Black could respond, a man's voice squawked on the officer's radio. Black listened intently, making out bits and pieces. Scientist escaped from Fordow. She left the facility with another woman, last seen heading north of Com. The officer spun on his heels and raced back to his cruiser. What about my papers? Black asked. The officer hurled them off to the side of the road before driving away. Black retrieved the documents and then hustled back to their car. What was that all about? Jana asked. If I wasn't speeding before, I'm about to be now, Black said. She eyed him closely. What just happened? The officer received an update on his radio, Black said. They know you broke out. Then why didn't he arrest me? The alert said that you were traveling north of Com, and with another woman. Jana huffed a soft laugh through her nose. I guess they'll never find me then. Not a chance, Black said before switching to his comms. Shields, are you still there? Ready and waiting, Shields replied. Keep an eye out for any more law enforcement vehicles, he said. I feel like we need to get out of here as quickly as we can, before they figure out what happened. Roger that, she said. I'll keep my eyes peeled. Black ignited the engine, returning the vehicle to the road. They roared south, keeping a watchful eye for any lurking police officers. As dusk fell, Black pulled into Bendar de Lam, and then parked in a small lot near the water. He surveyed the area one time, before leaning back in his seat. So, we're just going to spend the night here? Jana asked. Black took off his jacket, and balled it up to use as a pillow. I would spring for a nice hotel room for the both of us, but since we're being hunted, I'd rather not risk it. This is it? Your big extraction plan comes to a stop right here. Not exactly, Black said. At the crack of dawn, we're going to sneak onto that fishing vessel right there. It's going to scoot across the Persian Gulf tomorrow and drop us off in Kuwait City. And you know this, how? 
Black sighed. Just get some sleep, Janna. We've got a long day ahead of us tomorrow. After a restless night of sleep, Black arose just before dawn and inspected the activity around the docks. Aside from a few fishing hands prepping their boats, the scene was relatively quiet. He crept back into the car and nudged Janna awake. Time to get moving, he said. She groaned and rolled over, turning her back to him. I realize it's early, but we've got to move right now, he said. Janna stretched before sitting upright. Once she did, Black repositioned her seat and hustled around to her door. He opened it and then offered his hand to help her get out. Such a gentleman, even at 5.30 in the morning, she muttered. I'll take all the compliments I can get right now, Black said. And why's that? she asked as she staggered to her feet. You'll know in ten minutes. That was almost the amount of time to the second that Black needed to guide Janna undetected along the docks and into the hull of the Carcadon. They found a cozy spot behind empty pallets and settled in amidst the silence. A half hour later, the boat rocked from side to side as men boarded the ship and prepared for the day. Black glanced at Janna and put his index finger to his lips as one of the men lumbered toward them. He grabbed a rope and grappling hook from a box of supplies and hustled back up the steps. When he disappeared, Janna eyed Black. How long are we going to have to stay like this? Once we leave the docks, I'm guessing several hours at least, he said in a hushed tone. Then this isn't a rescue operation that requires precision timing? No, it'll be precise, but I'm just not privy to that. I'm just doing what I've been told. Her eyebrows shot upward. And if this doesn't play out like it's supposed to? We'll improvise. Improvise? She asked, her voice rising slightly above a whisper. This is my life we're talking about, and you're just going to improvise? Like I said, if it comes to that. Let's hope that it doesn't. But if it does, you're still in good hands. Not to brag or anything, but I've survived every mission I've been on. So far, she said, there's always a first time. It'd also be the last time. But let's try not to dwell on that, okay? An hour later, the engine rumbled louder as the boat slowly entered the channel along the shore. After a few minutes, the low-pitched hum morphed into a roar as the boat bounced more noticeably. Welcome to the open seas, Black said with a slight hint of a smile. Hope you enjoy the ride. Jana shook her head. Exactly how long did you say this was going to last? I didn't, Black said. I just gave you a rough estimate of several hours. Could you give me a better range? Black shook his head. I know, I know. I'll just know it when I see it she said, rolling her eyes. Sorry, but it's the best I could do under such conditions. Two hours passed before one of the crew members returned to the hall to fetch more supplies. He rounded up several nets before venturing toward the stack of pallets. He looked between them and then around them. Janna shrank deeper into the corner, her lips moving with what Black thought was a prayer. She exhaled in relief when the man turned his back. But then he spun around again and yanked the pallets away, waving a knife at them. Janna shrieked and then drew back as the man lunged toward them. A couple of stowaways, the man said in Farsi. Someone needs to visit the captain. He motioned with his knife for Black and Janna to come out from behind their hiding place before nodding toward the stairs. The sailor paraded his prized catch up onto the main deck, past a rowdy crew. Janna even drew a few whistles from the men. As soon as the man briefed the captain on the detainees, he ordered the sailor to get two large blankets. I don't want to make a big mess in my quarters, the captain said. Black reached over and grabbed Janna's hand as the captain launched into a tirade. By the time he finished, the man returned with two bright red blankets before he was dismissed. The captain looked at Black, 
and nodded before opening the window. Without hesitating, he fired his gun out of the window several times, drawing screams from Jana. That was good, Black said in a hushed tone. Jana's eyes widened. What is going on? The captain winked at her. Just keep screaming until I fire my gun again. Jana furrowed her brow, but played along as the captain began another rant. As ordered, she protested and shouted until the captain pointed his gun outside again and fired another two rounds. He set his gun down and drew them in close. Here's the tricky part. You're going to need to hold your breath for a few minutes and remain face down in the water until we clear the area. But it won't be long. The boat is about five minutes away. Five minutes? Jana asked. I can't hold my breath that long. From the moment you hit the water, try to stay as still as possible, Black explained. Just clutch this life preserver and create a pocket of air without peeping out from beneath the blanket. Black demonstrated the procedure until Jana felt comfortable. The captain instructed her to lie down so he could wrap her up. For the record, I think this is a dumb idea, she said, glaring at Black. Better than the alternative, Black said. The captain wrapped up Black as well, and then grunted as he picked up Jana and hoisted her over his shoulders. She groaned quietly. No more noise, the captain said. I'm about to toss you overboard. Moments later, he returned to his quarters and grabbed Black, hustling to toss him near Jana. The water chilled Black so much so that he had to bite his lip to keep from shouting in pain. He opened his eyes as he drifted slightly beneath the surface. After a half minute, he swam upward and then repositioned himself beneath the blanket. When he was satisfied that he still appeared lifeless from a distance, he peeked from under his soaked covering. Where is she? Black looked east and then west, followed by a glance north and south. But Jana, nor her blanket, were anywhere in sight. He started to panic, afraid that he'd failed to do the one thing he was assigned to do. Get Jana Shadid and return her safely home. As Black contemplated his next move, he almost didn't notice the fishing trawler chugging in his direction. It swept in front of him, creating a visual barrier between him and the Carcadon. A man dangled a rope into the water. Grab on, he said, and leave the blanket in the water. We'll get you a fresh one. After several men hoisted Black on board, he surveyed the deck. Jana, he asked. Where's Jana? He felt a little tap on his shoulder. Seconds later, he turned around to see Jana in mid-swing at him. He drew back, but she still managed to catch him on his chin. What was that for? Black asked as he staggered back. I think I lost a year of my life back there, she said, glaring at him. The least you could have done was warn me what was coming. Black shook his head. I wasn't sure what kind of acting job you could pull off. If the fear is real, it won't sound fake. Such sage advice. Where did you get that from? A fortune cookie? Black sighed. Look, I'm sorry, but it was for your own good. We're safe now, aren't we? Jana held her steely gaze on him. Don't ever do that to me again. Again? Black asked with a soft chuckle. You plan on having me extract you from somewhere again? She shrugged. Maybe. But in the meantime, you're stuck with me. There's no way I'm going back home. Black didn't object. His chin was still throbbing from the haymaker she landed. With a little training, she could be dangerous. Black tried the comms, but they were dead. Over time, he figured they would dry out and be usable again. But that'd take a while, the kind of time he didn't have. The captain of the new ship approached Black. Welcome aboard, agent. Make yourself at home. We've got a long day ahead of us before we reach safer waters. Aye, aye, captain, Black said with a salute, before he settled into the seat next to Jana. A long trip indeed.
Chapter 4 Washington, D.C. J.D. Blunt lumbered up the steps to the Capitol building and stopped when he reached the top. He turned around and took a deep breath, surveying the traffic inching past on the nearby streets. Every time he returned to the hill, he always wondered if he'd ever get the itch to return to politics. Nope. I still love my new life. The constant bickering with senators from the opposing party, or the infighting within his own side, flooded his mind with every old face he saw. There wasn't a single person he didn't clash with at least once over some issue, big or small. But Blunt's ability to work through conflict was what made him so effective when he served as a Texas senator. Yet it was also the aspect of his position that he hated more than anything. Statesmanship, the element he needed to survive in Washington, was exhausting. And despite the occasional itch to go back, he only needed a few minutes walking through the congressional halls to quell such notions. He took in one more deep breath before entering the front doors, where he only needed 30 seconds to become the target of an insult. Representative Zeke Morton, a congressman from Oregon, put his hand on his chin in mock thought before addressing Blunt. Now let me see, how many bills did you help write that we defunded last week? Was it two? Three? Twelve? Good morning to you too, Zeke, Blunt said shrugging off the insult. Like everything else out of Zeke's mouth, Blunt knew it was a lie. In less than a week from now, we're going to pass the Morden-Arnold Act, which is going to undo the last little fingerprint you made on this country, Morton said. Our country will be literally and symbolically washing its hands of all the terrible things you did. Zeke, do you realize that you can't be a jerk to everyone around here? Blunt asked. Representatives are supposed to be working together to help the American people, not scoring points with your political base. I'm doing both, Morton said with a sneer. Something you could never do. Not according to your latest poll numbers. I took a peek at them yesterday. If I were you, I'd be very concerned that the people aren't too keen on your caustic style. Morton moved in closer. Listen here, you lame old man. Blunt forced a smile and nodded behind Morton. He stopped and turned around to find a camera crew following him, along with a field trip class of middle school-aged students who'd all stopped and were gawking at the exchange. The teachers ushered the kids past quickly as they all watched silently, as if waiting for the fight to reignite. You're setting a really good example, Zeke. Keep it up. Blunt darted off to his left leaving Morton with narrowed eyes and a slack jaw. Who would ever vote for a jerk like that? Unfortunately, Blunt's simple stroll toward the meeting room was impeded again, this time by Congressman Vernon Roberts. The fiery freshman rubbed his graying goatee as he eyed Blunt from across the hall. Senator Blunt, Roberts said as he approached slowly. What a pleasure it is to run into you here. Blunt stopped and sighed, wanting desperately to ignore Roberts's call and continue walking. But despite what Clyde Silver had told Blunt, he opted for a cordial response. Congressman Roberts, Blunt said, turning to face the Pennsylvania representative. You wasted no time in making your mark in Washington, along with several other new go-getters. Roberts offered his hand, which Blunt took. We're part of the new wave of politicians in this city. After sitting around and watching relics, no offense, of course, do nothing but pass favors around to the large donors, we've taken a decisively more pragmatic approach to legislating. And what exactly does that look like? We attack problems head on and develop solutions. Blunt nodded. Interesting. And you don't think all the relics were doing that before? Not like us. We're changing the world. That's one way of looking at it, Blunt said with a shrug. Look, why don't I buy you a drink? I've got some things I want to discuss with you. Blunt pointed down the hall. 
I'm about to be late for a meeting, so maybe another time. Robert shook his head. Then let's do lunch, and I won't take no for an answer. I have a busy day today, and nonsense, a man has to eat. I know of a good sushi joint just around the corner. Blunt tried not to let his revulsion show. He hated sushi. And if Roberts wanted to take Blunt to the restaurant just a few blocks from the Capitol, he had an even bigger reason to put up a fight. I guess you didn't know I'm allergic to fish, Blunt said. Then we'll get you one of those sissy California rolls. I appreciate the gesture, but I really have a packed day. Roberts glanced at his watch. I know which meeting you're going to. It'll be over at 1230. I'll be waiting outside for you. He darted down the hall, waving his hand in the air. The last thing I want to do is eat lunch with that bastard. Despite Clyde Silver's warning, Blunt couldn't deny that he was genuinely intrigued about what Roberts wanted to talk about. Blunt wanted to duck out early to avoid Roberts, but curiosity won out. At 12.30 sharp, Blunt's meeting convened, and he exited the room. Across the hall, Roberts leaned against the wall, inspecting his fingernails. He looked up and caught Blunt's eye before he could look elsewhere. Roberts smiled as he eased into an upright position. If there's one thing you can count on about morning meetings on the hill, it's that they always end right on time. Nobody's going to miss a meal around here. Blunt forced a smile, walking right past Roberts without saying a word. So, are you ready for lunch now? Roberts asked, hustling to catch up with Blunt. Not with you. Fine, we'll just go with a drink. I won't even make you do it at the sushi joint either. Deal? Only if you promise to stop stalking me. Robert shrugged. If that's all it takes, I'm sure I can comply with that. Fifteen minutes later, Blunt was settling into a chair across from Roberts at a small tavern, three blocks away from the Capitol. All around them, lobbyists, congressional aides, and a few politicians sat hunched over pints of beer or shot glasses. And while Blunt couldn't hear every conversation... He knew the topics likely ranged from the latest bills placed in the legislative pipeline to the juiciest bits of gossip from the morning session. Roberts ordered two glasses of bourbon for them, further irking Blunt. He preferred to order for himself, even if he would have ordered the same drink anyway. Blunt's mood soured by the second, and he wondered if the meeting might end with him slugging that smug smile off Roberts's face. How does it feel to be back in the middle of all the action? Roberts asked. Blunt grunted and pulled out his cigar, which he started gnawing on again. It's like I never left. Maybe that's because you never did. Their waiter dropped off two tumblers and then darted away. Blunt took a long pull on his drink before setting it back down on the table emphatically. He pursed his lips as he leaned back in his chair. What's the purpose of all this, Congressman? Blunt asked. The purpose of what? This little song and dance you're doing right now with me. Stop beating around the bush and tell me what you want. Roberts took a deep breath and then clasped his hands together on the table in front of him. He leaned in close before he spoke. I want to make clear to you, J.D., in no uncertain terms, that I'm coming for you. And I don't just mean that I don't like you, and I want to ruin you. No, I want to bury you so deep in a hole somewhere that the darkness in your cell will match the darkness in your soul. Blunt raised his right eyebrow ever so slightly. Do you know what hate can do to a man? And I don't just mean metaphorically. I'm talking about what it does to you physically. Are you aware of that? Roberts remained silent, so Blunt soldiered on. Aside from changing the chemicals in your brain, hate also leads to anxiety, restlessness, obsessive behavior, and paranoia, just to name a few. Meanwhile, I'm going to be fine over here sipping my bourbon, chewing my cigar, 
and watching you disintegrate right in front of my eyes, without ever having to lift a finger. It'll be glorious to watch all that hubris and bluster get swept away because you harbor such misplaced animosity in your heart. Roberts pounded his fist on the table and leaned forward. The noise interrupted most of the conversations in the bar for a moment, causing a few heads to whip in Blunt's direction. I will destroy you, Robert said. You took away everything my father had worked for, plunging us into poverty, him into depression, and ultimately all of us into grief over his passing. Blunt raised his index finger and wagged it at Robert's. I'm afraid you've got it all wrong. That bill was designed to help people like your father start over again and find a second wind. But that's not how it played out, Robert said. Blaming me for your father's failure to understand what we were doing, even after we sent people around to explain how they could all remain employed, is foolish. My job is all about creating a safer America for all people, not just some privileged few. All Americans. Roberts's eyes narrowed. How dare you speak about my father in that way? You knew what you were doing. My father was viewed as collateral damage, and you forged ahead without any thought or concern about what would become of the working-class people like him. You would have done just about anything to create some fodder for your campaign. Some talking points, if you will, to show how much you care about the workers. And every bit of it was for show. Nothing in that bill you passed did anything meaningful for him. And ultimately me. I'll tell you something you've probably already figured out by now. But that's this. Politics are messy. You do the best you can with the information that you have. And then you pray to God that it all works out for the better. Your words of comfort mean nothing to me now, Robert said. I wrote to you when I was younger, hoping to gain some clarity and insight into why you made that decision. And all your office did was send me a form letter. A form letter. I was a kid, and you screwed up my life. Blunt took another sip as he formulated his response. Perhaps that's your view, but there are always unintended consequences when you root out corruption, which is what we were doing. And that literally was the purpose of the bill, and in a pattern of taxpayer abuse, while offering a lifeline to those who were entrapped by it. I give you my heartfelt condolences on the loss of your father. However, we created a lifeline that plenty of people he worked with took advantage of. It was there for your father, too. Roberts pursed his lips as he slowly shook his head. You made that mess but just know that I'm coming for you and all that waste you're gorging yourself on. I'm going to shut down your little organization and make sure you don't even sniff an office in Washington for the rest of your pathetic life. Blunt had dealt with his share of irate constituents before, and he could tell when it was time to bail on the conversation. With Roberts, Blunt was way past time to leave. Thank you for the drink, Blunt said raising his glass and then finishing off the bourbon. Best of luck during your short time in Washington. He stood and left the bar, without looking back. Once Blunt exited the tavern, Roberts fished his cell phone out of his pocket and dialed a number. He's all yours now, Roberts said, before hanging up. He leaned back in his chair and allowed a smile to wash over his face. If he had to guess, two years had passed since he felt this at peace. Blunt was going to get what he deserved, and Roberts couldn't wait. Blunt returned to the Capitol building to complete the rest of his consulting duties that afternoon. However, the session ran late, and unlike morning meetings, the ones after lunch could drag on and on. By 6.45 p.m., Blunt was checking his watch every minute to see if he could give off not-so-subtle hints that the time had come to adjourn for the day. But no one seemed to be getting the clue. Finally, he stood up and said that he had to go to the restroom, and he was going to go home to find a private stall if they didn't end the meeting immediately. The on-the-nose comment resulted in everyone to feign shock 
as they glanced at their watches and concluded the proceedings. Lunt eased behind the steering wheel in his car and backed out of his spot. A half hour later, he was humming along a two-lane road headed into northern Virginia. He needed to get out of town and think. Roberts was going to become a permanent thorn in Blunt's side if he didn't address the situation properly. Spending some time at one of his safe houses was the best way to clear his mind and develop a good solution. Blunt was deep in thought when he first noticed the pair of headlights in his rearview mirror. The car roared up behind, tapping Blunt's bumper. What the hell? The car backed away before making another run at Blunt. This time he tapped the brakes before stomping on the gas to pull away from the vehicle. Blunt wanted to pull over, but wasn't sure if the attacker intended to kill him and didn't want to cede any safety the car gave. The car roared up toward him again, this time more aggressively. When the vehicle hit Blunt's, he fishtailed toward the side of the road before regaining control. Then the car sped past Blunt and disappeared around the next bend. Is that how you want to play it, Roberts? Blunt asked aloud. Things are not going to end well for you. He took a deep breath and then jammed a cigar into his mouth. As he chewed on the tobacco imported from Cuba, he weighed how effective his plan would be at stopping Roberts. This wasn't how the Firestorm director wanted to deal with the situation, but Roberts had forced his hand, and Blunt was up to the task. Chapter 5 Camp Doha, Kuwait Bay, Kuwait Black awoke to the sound of a fist pounding on his door. He scrambled to his feet and peered through the peephole to see who was making such a ruckus outside. After glancing at his watch, he realized why, though the bright sunshine flooding his room should have been his first clue. Just a second, he said as he scrambled across the room to grab his pants and a shirt. He didn't want to keep his army escort waiting. The military policeman stood just outside Black's room, with a freshly showered Jana Shadid, her brown curls bouncing on her shoulders as she shifted her weight from one foot to the other. Black never intended to get that presentable after spending the previous night sleeping in a car and then long hours puttering across the Persian Gulf. He wanted to squeeze every minute of sleep he could get out of that night before conducting a quick exit meeting with Jana. Once they were finished, she would be placed on a plane headed to Tel Aviv, where Mossad could handle her return. When Black exited his quarters, he followed their escort to an SUV. Inside the vehicle, the air conditioning was blasting cold air throughout, barely winning the battle against the hot desert sun. Several minutes later, the soldier led them into a building, where they found a conference room with a computer monitor. It was already set up and connected to Christina Shields back in Washington. Her serious look melted away into a smile when Black took a seat in front of the camera. Jana sat down next to him, and they started their meeting. I'm glad the two of you made it out of there in one piece, Shields said. He tried to get killed, Jana said, pointing at Black, but it wasn't our time. What's she talking about? Shields asked. A crazy experience for her is just another day at the office for me, Black said as he waved dismissively. It's no big deal. I'll expect to hear more about it later, Shields said. In the meantime, let's chat for a moment so I can create a debriefing report. Black and Jana nodded in unison. Anything to get out of here, Jana said. In that case, let's get started, Shields said as she glanced down at her notes. I guess we'll get started with some of the more pressing information first, if that's all right. One of the major questions people here want to know is about Iran's uranium enrichment program at the Fordow facility. Enrichment program? Jana asked with a smile before breaking into a laugh. What enrichment program? Has nobody passed that information along yet to Mossad? Black scowled, as did Shields. What information? Black asked. There's no enrichment going on at Fordow, Jana said, throwing her hands in the air. It's all outsourced. 
Outsourced, Shields asked. To who? Jana shrugged. It's more like, to where? And that would be East Africa, Jana said. In Malawi. There's a mine just outside the city of Karanga they're using as a cover. Black cocked his head to one side. And you never told Massad about this? Jana shook her head. I just found that out this week and hadn't communicated with anyone about it. I would have informed Massad that the Fort Al facility wasn't enriching their own uranium, had I known earlier. I swear. Black and Shield spent the next hour asking Jana more questions about the facility and its role in Iran's nuclear program. When they finished, Black thanked her and told her they had made arrangements for her return to Israel. The news wasn't received as well as Black would have guessed. Why would I want to go back there? Jana asked. They viewed me as expendable and left me to die. Had you not rescued me when you did? She sighed, letting the rest of her thought go unsaid. Tears welled up in her eyes, and her lips quivered. Black took her hands. You're going to be okay. After a long pause, Jana spoke. I want to go back to the United States. I'm sure we can arrange something, Black said. A talented engineer like yourself shouldn't have trouble finding work. That's not the kind of job I want, she said. Black's eyebrows shot upward. Oh, then what are you interested in? Espionage, she said. The tears in her eyes replaced with steely resolve. I've tasted what it's like to help uncover secrets, and I can't get enough. I want to work for an organization like that. Why don't you come back to Washington with Agent Black, Shield suggested. We just might be able to find a place for you. Black nodded in agreement, giving Jana's hands a final squeeze. Wheels up in 12 hours. Go get ready. When she left the room, Black turned toward the screen to address Shields. You think you can find something for her? I'd hate to give her false hope after all that she's been through. Shields grinned. Just bring her here. I've got the perfect job for her. Chapter 6 Washington, D.C. Blunt ventured onto Bobby Besserman's dock and surveyed the calm water flowing along the Potomac River. The CIA's deputy director was lounging in a chair while clutching a nearly empty glass. He didn't even turn around as Blunt lumbered toward his host. Fine evening, isn't it? Besserman asked before tossing back the rest of his drink. If you say so, Blunt said. My day has been downhill since this morning, and there's no reason to think it's going to turn around just because the sun is setting. It's all about perspective, Besserman said, slapping the seat of the chair next to him facing the water. Take a load off, and let's talk about it. Blunt sat down and glanced at the tumbler resting on the small table to his right. That's for you, Besserman said. I had to go buy some bourbon especially for you, since I don't stock that weak stuff in my liquor cabinet. So I hope you like it. Blunt picked up the glass and inspected it for a moment, before taking a sip. Mmm, Evan Williams Black Label. Not bad, but you certainly didn't splurge. I've splurged on other drinks, Besserman said with a wry smile. If you're willing to open up your horizons, I have other offerings. Nah, I'm good with this. Besserman chuckled. So what's stressing you out these days? You sounded disturbed on the phone. It's Vernon Roberts. He seems pretty intent on making trouble for me. And why's that? Blunt took a long pull on his drink. You remember that anti-corruption bill I sponsored? How could I forget? How could anyone forget? It sent the rats scurrying into the open. Apparently, Roberts' father lost his job, a casualty in the war on those lion leeches draining the federal government of its money. And he blames you somehow. That's essentially what he told me, along with warning me that he's coming for me. Messerman shook his head. He's a freshman congressman. I wouldn't be too worried about him. He's finagled his way onto the Intelligence Committee. 
Does that change your mind? Besserman's eyebrows inched upward as he turned his gaze toward Blunt. That's news to me. How did he manage that? It's still a mystery, though there are rumors that he has dirt on just about everyone in Washington. I'm not sure how much of that's true, but I can assure you he didn't get the invite because of his charming personality. He's a bit caustic at best, belligerent at worst. Since when does someone like that suddenly vault onto one of the more prestigious committees as a freshman? There's not much precedent for it, but it's a moot argument at this point. I just want to make sure somebody keeps an eye on him. Besserman sighed. I'm afraid I can't exactly help you there. Unless we have reason to believe he's doing something illegal. My hands are tied. How about he literally threatened to kill me at a lunch meeting? Blunt said as he pulled a cigar out of his pocket and clipped the end. Is that illegal enough for you? Can anyone corroborate that threat? Blunt sighed and shook his head. Roberts would just say it was all politics, Besserman said. I know, I know. I had to ask, but I'm taking this threat seriously, so I need some ideas on how to do that. When he comes after me, I don't want to be surprised. If he's going to try and hit me below the belt, I want to be able to sucker punch him in the mouth first. Fair enough, but you're going to need some help. Any recommendations? Besserman swiped open his cell phone and scanned it for a few seconds. Got just the guy. Do you remember Ned Edgerton? Edge? The former linebacker for Arkansas turned FBI agent? That Ned Edgerton? There's only one, and he's one of the best to ever come out of Quantico. He's private sector now, working for Washington's elite. Give him a call. He's not cheap, but I can promise that he won't disappoint you. If he can't persuade Roberts to stand down, I'll be shocked. And pissed, Blunt said as he bit down on the unlit stogie and started chewing on it. Edge will find a way to fix a pressing issue like this, one way or another. Besserman's phone emitted a short burst of airy bells. I just sent you his contact information. I've already got it, Blunt said. He's worked for me on more than one occasion. I'd just forgotten about him since I typically only utilized his special skills when I needed a show of force. He's expanded his repertoire, Besserman said. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. The Bureau dismissed him because he was so bullheaded and one-dimensional when it came to being an agent. However, that all changed when he decided to go into business for himself. He took the criticism to heart and is one of the most skilled agents available for hire. The FBI wishes they had him back, I'll tell you that much. Okay, okay, Blunt said. Don't oversell him. I'll give him a call. If that doesn't work, I'll give you other suggestions. But I'm fairly confident you'll be able to handle your problem without incident. After Blunt finished his drink, he stood. Thanks for the advice. I've found that just like in wildlife, the wounded are always the most dangerous. Never a truer statement has been spoken, Besserman said. Good luck, J.D. Blunt returned to his car and wasted no time in calling Edge. The firestorm director piped the conversation through his car speakers as he drove home. Mr. Blunt, Edge said with his deep baritone voice. I was beginning to wonder if I'd done something to make you upset. It's been quite a while since you contacted me. Fortunately for me, I haven't required your services. And there's been a recent change in your fortune. Blunt chuckled. I guess that's one way of looking at it. Which also means your fortunes have changed for the better. Edge dispensed with the notion that any more small talk would occur. What can I do for you, Mr. Blunt? I need you to watch someone for me. Just watch them. Blunt grunted. Unless I heard wrong. Someone told me that you've expanded your skill set to include a more discreet surveillance package. Whatever you need me to do. Excellent. I'll forward you all the details. Looking forward to working with you again. Blunt hung up and took a deep breath before exhaling. 
He knew things with Vernon Roberts were far from over. But Blunt felt confident again that he'd be able to withstand anything the freshman congressman threw at him. Vernon Roberts smiled as he listened in on Blunt's call. He could recognize that voice anywhere. The man who'd helped Roberts acquire all the valuable dirt on much of Washington's elite over the past few years was in his pocket. All he needed to do was make one phone call. Roberts was proud of himself for successfully planting the bug on Blunt, who would have never suspected such a move from the freshman congressman. Time to lay a trap. Chapter 7 Black and Shields returned to the Firestorm offices with Jana Shadid in tow. Her presence in their offices surprised Blunt, even though he knew she was unhappy with the state of affairs. After Black extracted her from Iran, she said being left behind by the organization she'd risked her life for was not something she'd easily forgive them for. But there was one final act that she said tilted the scales in favor of leaving Mossad for good. While Shadid was still considering what to do in the aftermath of her public outing as a spy, she was sitting with Black and Shields in the lobby of a building on base in Kuwait when the evening news program began airing. A man with a furrowed brow reported the story of a woman being attacked in her home by a group of terrorists in Jordan. When the woman's name was read, Shadid shuddered. What's the matter? Shields had asked. You look like you've seen a ghost. That's what I feel like, Jana said. What do you mean? I know that woman. She was a Mossad agent stationed in Iran. She was the first handler I had when I agreed to work with the agency. Minutes later, Jana called her current handler to inform him that she wouldn't be returning to Tel Aviv. Not for her family, not for her government, and most of all, definitely not for Mossad. Shields tried to explain to Jana how Mossad actually cared enough about her to call in a favor to get her extracted by a U.S. agent, and how operations like that can be tricky, both logistically and politically. However, Jana wasn't hearing any of it. Yet the incident didn't seem to dissuade her from spying. Rather, her interest in espionage seemed to escalate, while Black and Shields considered what to do with her. The decision to bring her back to Washington was one that Black and Shields made together, choosing to do so without Blunt's permission. Black insisted that Blunt would handle the situation like a statesman, if asked. But ever the opportunist, Blunt would choose to bring the disgruntled Mossad asset if he thought she could help the team. And only after five minutes of making her intentions known about wanting to help cripple the Iranians' nuclear capabilities... Blunt signaled he was open to the idea by asking her to stick around for the rest of the afternoon following their meeting. Blunt paced around the room as he inspected his unlit cigar. What you're bringing us is a very critical piece of intel, something that I have a hard time imagining stayed a secret for so long. Jana shifted in her seat. I learned more specifics about the operation the day before Agent Black stole me out of my dorm room. The fact that Iran was enriching their uranium elsewhere hasn't been a big secret. It's where that was. And you've told no one, Blunt asked. Jana nodded. Not a soul. Besides, my handle is dead now anyway. I wouldn't know who to talk to or who to trust with Mossad. I'm just a recruited asset, remember? I have some trustworthy contacts with that agency including the one who called in a favor for us to get you, Blunt said. But I don't see any harm in checking out this claim first, before we share it with him. Black stroked his chin and eyed Blunt. You would send me to Malawi just to check out a claim? Of course not, Blunt said with a wink. I prefer you sabotage the facility so it can't enrich any more uranium. Shields tapped her pen on the table as she studied her computer. I think we can make that happen. And I'm assuming by the wild look in your eyes that you already have a plan, Blunt said. I've been busier than a one-legged woman in a butt-kicking contest.
she said with a wry grin. Blunt crossed his arms over his chest and stared at her for a moment before responding. Okay, if we're going to do this, we need to do it quickly. I can't sit on this kind of intel for very long. I prefer not to have half of Washington and all of Tel Aviv pissed at us if they find out we held back information of this magnitude. Don't worry, sir. I've already secured the schematics for the plant. We'll have Agent Black in and out in no time. Blunt nodded at them. Do it. Chapter 8 Percival, Virginia Blunt rolled down his car door window and placed his hand outside, catching the cool air. The hour trip out of the city was slightly inconvenient, but he refused to complain, especially when a plate of freshly smoked barbecue awaited him at Monk's. While the rest of Washington moved at breakneck speed, Blunt longed for the days when the pace was slower and decisions were more measured. He found the culture of rapid reaction exhausting, despite being necessary at times. When Ned Edgerton proposed meeting at Blunt's favorite restaurant in Northern Virginia, Blunt understood why. While Edge could still run surveillance on a target, he was still well known in the nation's capital and often recognized from both his playing days as a star running back at Arkansas and his FBI fame. The latter was more like infamy. Edge once served as the lead investigator on a case involving two prominent members of Congress. When he went to arrest one of the representatives, Edge punched the man in the face. The incident was caught on camera, framing Edge as an overaggressive agent who used excessive force, as well as abused his authority. Edge swore the video didn't capture the full incident, which he claimed started when the man uttered several racial slurs before going for his gun. After a brief investigation, Edge was dismissed, and the politician parlayed the fiasco into a censure from his peers and a public reprimand. Blunt believed Edge because he found the agent's integrity to be impeccable. Then there was also the fact that the politician involved in the fracas was none other than the late Guy Hirschbeck. He'd been a bane in Blunt's side while the two were serving together in the Senate and he didn't shed any tears when the ill-tempered senator died. Blunt found devouring barbecue in small-town Virginia to be therapeutic, and he jumped at the opportunity to meet at Edge's suggested location. After Blunt pulled into the parking lot, he got out and lumbered toward Monks. The smoky aroma wafted in the air, riding the light breeze right up into his nose. His mouth watered after a second deep breath that inhaled the mixture of burning hickory and delicious spices. He stopped and closed his eyes for a moment. When he opened them, he caught Edge looking straight at him. It's intoxicating, isn't it? Edge asked as he approached Blunt. Blunt nodded and grinned before extending his hand. It's great to see you again. It's great to be seen, Edge said with a smile. In our line of work, the fewer people see you the more successful you are. Amen to that, Blunt said, before lifting up his cane and pointing it toward the entrance. I say we save the chit-chat until we've placed our order. I'm starving. Edge clapped his hands and rubbed them together. Age before beauty, J.D. Blunt grunted. I ought to whack you with this cane. That's not advisable. Remember what happened to the last senator who came at me? From the looks of things, I'd say that whole situation had a fortuitous bounce in your favor. Edge nodded. Ain't that the truth? I'd probably still be a G-man instead of running my own business. You've quite a few of those in your life, Blunt said as he eyed the menu scrawled on a chalkboard behind the counter. You reckon you'd still be able to walk at your age if you hadn't gotten injured your senior season? Edge shrugged. I still wouldn't be able to run like I do, that's for damn sure. But that money, though. He let out a low whistle, his words hanging as he slowly shook his head. I bet you half the retired players in the league would trade what you have now for their money, Blunt said. I'd bet it's more like three-fourths. Both men placed their orders 
before finding a table in the back of the restaurant to sit down. Now, we didn't come out here to discuss my shattered NFL dreams, did we? Edge asked as he shifted in his seat. That's right, Blunt said. So, give me an update. First of all, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. I've always admired and respected the way you've gone about your business as a politician. And I'm sure that's no different in the way you run your organization today. Also, I didn't want you to think I was being overly paranoid by coming this far out of the city to talk about this surveillance case. I have just found that some people raise more suspicion than others. Vernon Roberts is definitely one of those men. Based on what you've learned about him? Ed shook his head. No, this is based on having a reliable network of people who speak the truth to me about any possible target. Roberts hadn't even finished his first term yet, Blunt said. Yet he's already acquired quite the reputation. That ought to tell you something right there. Blunt scanned the room for a moment before leaning in close. So, what did you find? I had one of my contacts dig up some information on Roberts, if you know what I mean. Blunt nodded. He knew exactly what Edge meant. Undoubtedly, he'd hired a hacker to plumb the depths of Roberts's computer to unearth anything that could be used to shut down the rowdy freshman congressman, either legally or by other measures. But nothing would happen without the right intel. My contact found this, Edge said as he offered his cell phone. Just tap the screen to play the video. Blunt followed Edge's instructions and began watching footage taken in a dimly lit room. However, the lighting was bright enough that Roberts's face was easy to identify. The shot appeared to come from a hidden camera of sorts, likely tucked at the back of a bookcase. Blunt couldn't make out who the other men were, nor did he recognize any of their voices. But they all were swilling their drinks as they spouted off about who they wanted to take out in Washington. The other men in the video named prominent judges and politicians, against whom they held a grudge. But the chilling moment came when Roberts appeared to look almost right into the camera and say, This isn't hypothetical for me. I'm literally going to eliminate someone by killing them. A few gasps came from the men seated near Roberts, before a couple of them broke into laughter. You're really going to kill someone? One man asked. Roberts nodded. And I'm going to do it in the most painful way possible. And who are you going to kill? Another man asked. I'm going to kill J.D. Blunt, Roberts said with a hint of pride in his voice. Well, that's a name I haven't heard in a while, one of the men said. With a cold stare, Roberts looked at the man. I hope nobody ever speaks his name again after I murder that bastard. Blunt paused the video and slid it back to Edge. You won't have to worry about that, because I'm going to beat Roberts to the punch. Edge laughed nervously. You're kidding, right? Blunt ignored the question. Is there anything else out there I need to see? Edge shook his head. I figured that'd be enough, at least enough to get him shut down, maybe censured by his peers. Anything to help create more safety for you. Once this hits all the major news outlets, Roberts will never be able to do anything to you. He'll say he was joking, or that it was a game, Blunt said. Yeah, but if he was serious, he wouldn't be able to be serious anymore. Blunt nodded as a smile spread over his face. A waiter delivered Blunt's and Edge's food platters, setting them down in front of the two men. Blunt bowed his head and said a quick prayer of thanks before attacking the ribs. Edge tucked his cloth napkin into his shirt before picking up his utensils. Is there anything else you want me to do with this case? Blunt nodded. Yeah, you're on retainer because we're just getting started here. I'm convinced there's much more to find out with Roberts. From what I've learned about him, he's a very calculated man and will play the long game in lieu of the short one, just to get a rise out of people, 
and form a small mob on social media. He's going for the win, not the tie on this one. It's take me down and get vengeance for his father's death, which he blames me for. Or bust. So what's next? Edge said between bites of his pulled pork. Continue your surveillance of him. I understand he's hired another former agent himself. Just be careful, whatever you do. And then we can discuss what you find at another fine barbecue restaurant establishment well outside the city limits. Sound good? Sounds perfect, Edge said. The small talk ceased as the duo concentrated on their food. Roberts drummed his fingers on the table in front of him as he listened to Blunt's conversation with Ned Edgerton over the bug planted in Blunt's jacket just a few days earlier. The deft move by Roberts proved to be an important one. The Pennsylvania representative had the inside scoop on what J.D. Blunt was planning and how he was attempting to collect any data about him. Being two steps ahead of the former Texas senator was the kind of advantage Roberts needed to win. J.D. took the bait. He gazed out the window, pensive about how to proceed. Once he was satisfied that his initial plan was still the best one, he picked up his phone and dialed a number. Once a man answered, Roberts addressed him. He took the bait, Roberts said. Time to move to phase two of this plan. Chapter 9 Karanga, Malawi Black checked all the gear in his backpack before sauntering down to the hotel lobby. While he enjoyed operations in Africa, the accommodations were often less than ideal. He'd arrived in late the previous night, just over 72 hours after Shields boasted that they could execute a lightning-fast operation in a foreign country. However, Black needed a good night's sleep after the long flight to get to Malawi, but he didn't get it. He spent most of the night dealing with a pair of competing needs, staying cool and avoiding mosquito bites. With no screen on the window, Black oscillated between cracking it open for a few minutes before jumping up and closing it once the bugs poured into his room. Add in the burlap sheets and the lumpy mattress, and the bed was more suited for torture interrogation than sleep. Black inserted his earpiece and turned on his comms. Can you hear me, Shields? Like you're in the next room, she said. I wish, because that would mean that I just awoke from a good night of sleep. That bad, huh? Just picture all ten Egyptian plagues from the Bible striking at once, all while you're trying to sleep. Sounds dreadful. Black continued his rant. Flies, locusts, undrinkable water, frogs. And to top it all off, there was no coffee this morning in the lobby. That's a Tuesday in Syria, Jana chimed in on the comms. Oh, great, Black said. You're on here too, Jana? The last thing Shields needs is a partner to team up against me. You're going soft on us, Shields said. All you former spooks don't know what a hardened life we lead in the military, especially when we're at war in the desert. I'm still going to shoot circles around you at the range when I get back, Black said. In your dreams? Shields said. Black checked the room one final time. Confident he had conducted a thorough search, he walked outside to meet his guide. I'll check back in when I'm approaching the facility, Black said. Roger that, Shields said. Black turned off his comms unit and approached a man who appeared to be in his thirties, sucking on a lollipop and leaning against the side of a faded blue pickup truck. Rust spots on the hood and a deteriorating bench across the width of the cab signaled that the vehicle was well past its prime. In the truck's small bed, a dirt bike was cinched down, its back tire sticking out so far that the tailgate was left open. Kajombo? Black asked as he offered his hand. The man took it and smiled. Mr. Black, it's nice to finally meet you in person. I appreciate you taking me on with such short notice, Black said. It's my pleasure. If you weren't here, I would be standing against my truck, looking to the sky and waiting for rain that will never come. Black chuckled. And I'm glad you get a little break from that. 
Kajumbo rubbed his middle and index fingers against his thumb. And money, too. Ah, yes, Black said. Here's the money I promised you. He reached into his rucksack and dug out an envelope before tossing it to his guide. Is it all here? Of course, Black said. I wouldn't dream of shortchanging you, but feel free to count. Kajombo pulled out the sucker and inspected it for a moment before returning it to his mouth. I am very good at reading people, and I believe you are a good and honest man. Be careful, because not all Americans are like that. There are always a few bad apples. I've already learned that in my limited experience with Americans. Black's eyebrows shot upward. You've worked with Americans before. Out at the mines? Kajombo nodded. Just this week, I worked with four other Americans. Three of them were good to me, but one was a bit nasty to me. Wait, there were Americans here? This week? Yeah. American soldiers. I thought maybe they came with you. Black wasn't interested in explaining as he felt his heart rate quicken. I'm just a researcher, not a soldier. Do you know where they went? Kajombo shook his head. I saw them yesterday afternoon, but haven't seen them since. Their presence intrigued Black as much as it concerned him. What are American soldiers doing out here? Black climbed into Kajombo's truck and attempted to buckle up, but the seatbelt latch was broken. Don't worry, Kajombo said. We're just going to drive 20 kilometers into the desert on a paved road. You have nothing to worry about. Black shrugged and then turned his attention to the sandy terrain. It appeared to stretch endlessly in every direction beyond the small town of Karanga. They rattled along in silence for a few minutes. How come you don't work at the mine? Black asked. I don't like tight spaces. Black continued to scan the horizon, which appeared to be little more than rolling waves of sand, interrupted by massive rock faces that cropped up out of the ground. Tired of the staid scenery, he pulled out the schematics Shields had given him, so he could go over all the key locations necessary to sabotage the mine. While detonating charges would have been a more effective method, Rendering the enrichment facility inoperable was the best route to take, given the toxic contents. Kajombo glanced over at Black. Do you mind if I play some music? Not at all. Kajombo inserted a cassette tape into the truck's stereo system, and Black did a double take. You have a cassette player in this truck? Black asked, his mouth falling open. Kajombo nodded as he swayed to the rhythm of Bob Marley and broke into song. After a few lines into the tune, Black found the famous lyrics irresistible and joined. I shot the sheriff, but I did not shoot the deputy, the two men crooned as they rumbled toward the facility. However, Black stopped cold when he glanced out his window and noticed a truck parked across the roadway, about a hundred meters ahead of them. What's that? he asked, pointing at the blockade. Kajombo scrambled to turn the music down before leaning forward to inspect the scene. Is that normal? Black asked again. Kajombo shook his head. I've never seen anything like that. Whoever they are, they don't want us getting to the facility today. The Tan Humvee prevented traffic from flowing in either direction, but since they'd only passed one car since leaving Karanga, Black doubted it would cause much of a problem. However, his intense curiosity morphed into concern when he noticed two of the men positioned behind the vehicle were carrying automatic weapons. This doesn't look good, Black said. Don't worry, Kajombo said, waving dismissively at Black. This kind of thing happens in Malawi all the time. I'll handle it. As Kajombo slowed to a stop in front of the roadblock, one of the men sauntered up to Kajombo's truck. Black's eyes remained locked on the man, who stooped down and looked inside. You need to turn around, the man said, his accent containing a slight southern drawl. Black noticed a bone frog tattoo on the man's bicep, a popular design among Navy SEALs. What are you guys doing out here? Black asked. 
We're just running security for the mine, the man said as he stepped back, clearly uninterested in a prolonged conversation. Black pressed the issue. Private contractors? Are you a journalist? Black ignored the question after his went unanswered. I find it highly unusual that a bunch of Navy SEALs would be protecting this facility, especially since it enriches uranium for the Iranians. Former Navy SEAL, the man said with a growl. I don't need to show you my credentials. This weapon here ought to be the only thing you understand. Black brandished his gun. Mine too. Finger off the trigger, right now. The man nodded. We can both lower our weapons. Both men put their guns down. What's this about being a former Navy SEAL? Black asked. Once a Navy SEAL, always a Navy SEAL. Kajombo leaned back, his hands remaining in the air, before glancing at Black. You said you were a scientist. A scientist who knows his way around a gun, Black said. These men have some explaining to do. The soldier huffed and then shrugged. I'll let you go first. He nodded toward the other men, who all had their weapons trained on Black. What the hell are you doing in Malawi? Black asked, uninterested in addressing the threat. The man ignored Black's question. If you know that I'm a Navy SEAL, then you know there's a good chance my buddies over there are too. They won't miss if you try anything. I'm on a mission, and I don't intend to be stopped by some hired muscle who think they can intimidate us. We're on a mission too, the soldier said, and it involves stopping anyone from getting to that facility today who doesn't belong. You're one of those people. By whose orders? The Pentagon's. Satisfied? Black cocked his head to one side, his jaw falling open. Yeah, bet you didn't see that coming. Black hadn't. He stared in disbelief at the man for a few moments before continuing. The Pentagon? Yeah, you heard of it? Why would someone at the Pentagon want this place protected by a bunch of Navy SEALs? He wondered aloud. I'm a good soldier, the man said. I don't ask questions. I just follow orders. That's not what makes a good soldier, Black said. He glanced over his shoulder at the other guards, who were now surrounding the front of Kajombo's truck, all their weapons trained on Black. Good soldiers stay alive, the man said. I assume you'd like to remain that way. Or am I wrong about you? We'll leave, Black said. But following orders blindly doesn't make you a good soldier. It makes you a robot. I didn't ask for commentary, the soldier said as he stepped away from the vehicle. Kajombo wheeled the truck around and pointed it in the opposite direction before peeling rubber. He said nothing for a few minutes, nervously drumming his fingers on the dashboard to the rhythm of a song Black recognized as belonging to Bob Marley. Finally, the man broke his silence. What was that all about back there? Kajombo asked. What are they doing here in Malawi? Beats me, Black said. Your guess is as good as mine. Black turned his comms on again to raise shields. Thank goodness, she said, seconds later. I've been tracking your progress. What's going on? Why did you turn around? We ran into some Navy SEALs blocking the road, Black said. Are you serious? As a heart attack, Black said. Not sure why they were there, but I intend to find out. Chapter 10 Marriottsville, Maryland. Two days later, upon returning back to Washington, Black coerced Shields into visiting an outdoor shooting range with him. The wooded landscape of Maryland stood in stark contrast to the desolate terrain of Malawi. He rolled down his window and drew in a deep breath. There's nothing like the fresh smell of the woods on a warm summer day, Black said. It definitely beats slogging through sand in the desert. Shields said. If only I'd had a chance to experience that before getting turned around. Yeah, well, we're going to get to the bottom of that after I kick your ass here at the range. Black smiled as he pulled into the range's parking lot. 
You're going to regret those words. I doubt it, Shield said as she checked her weapon. So loser buys on the way home? Look, if you want to buy me dinner, just say so. You don't have to humiliate yourself to do it. She made a talking gesture with her hand. Keep it up, Black, because the winner gets to pick the restaurant. And I love that expensive Thai place downtown. Now you're sabotaging yourself, because there's no way I'm setting foot inside that restaurant again, he said. You remember what happened last time we were there? How could I forget? You nearly lost your mind that night, and all because you didn't read the menu properly. I hate undercooked meat, especially fish. Shields got out of the car. You and Blunt are two peas in a pod. I'm genuinely shocked you're not related to him. They strode toward the entrance. Inside, a thin bespectacled man greeted them with a friendly wave. Good afternoon, he said. First time here? Shields shook her head. No, but it's been a while. And for the gentleman? The man asked. I've been here several times before, just not in quite some time. The man flipped two screens around and pointed toward the stylus. In that case, you'll need to sign our new waiver. And as you're doing that, I'll fill you in on all the upgrades to our facilities since you likely last visited. Black mindlessly checked off the boxes as the man droned on about all the new features. Nothing really interested Black, until the man started talking about the addition of a sniper range, which could accommodate shots of up to a thousand meters long. That's what we want, Black said. What, access to the long distance range? Oh yeah, Black said. We're not messing around. Shields shook her head. No, not today. I didn't bring my rifle and I'm not about to use your piece of junk. We'll be shooting inside. That's a relief because the long-distance range is occupied until this evening, the man replied as he started tapping the screen in front of him. After collecting their money, he ushered Black and Shields to their assigned stations at the indoor range. Once the attendant left, they began preparing their weapons. Shields paused before she put on her ear protection. That Thai food is going to be so good tonight. You're out of your mind if you think you're going to beat me this afternoon, Black said. If I didn't have ample motivation before, I've got it now. Shield stuck her head around the corner and pointed to her earmuffs. I can't hear you, she mouthed. They both warmed up by firing a few rounds. When they were finished, Black looked around and realized they were the only people left in the building. They sat on a bench against the wall for a few minutes to talk. So, who do you think was behind stopping our op in Malawi? Black asked. Surely by now you have some theories. She shook her head. I've got some hunches, but that's about all it amounts to. I'm just spitballing like you are at this point. But I couldn't think of anyone who seemed likelier than all the others on my list of suspects. We need to pay a visit to General Higgins, Black said. My dad always spoke highly of him, so if there's something going on in the shadows, he should be able to shed some light on it for us. Shields looked at Black, holding his gaze for a moment. How are you doing with everything you found out about your father's death? Black shook his head. I still miss him so much it hurts. Like when I just call him to talk about anything. Politics, football, the latest weather patterns. I didn't really care what the topics were. I just wanted to hear his voice, especially when I'd had a bad day. After we'd hang up, I felt like everything would be all right. You understand, right? That's exactly how I feel when I talk to the sheriff, she said, referencing her father. I know it won't last forever, but I sure wish it could. Black nodded knowingly. So to answer your question... I'm doing okay, in light of all that I learned about why my dad's really dead. None of it will bring him back, but it does make me appreciate what an honorable man he was. I hope I'm half the man he is when I grow up one day. Shields patted him on the knee and laughed. You're probably halfway there now, even if you still shoot like a kid. Black looked up at her as the mood lightened. I hope you're ready to go down. 
Not a snowball's chance in hell. After outlining the terms of their competition, they stood and took their positions in front of their targets. Ready? Black asked. Ready to lose? Shield snapped back. Go. The two agents unloaded and then inspected each other's targets. I think I took round one, Black said. I can already taste that tender filet cut cooked medium rare. Three rounds, Shield said. Better not get too comfortable there. You only beat me by one point. Black winked and gave her a sly grin. It'll be enough. They reset their targets and commenced with the second round. After grading their shooting, Shields put her hands on her hips. It got awfully quiet over here, she said. I can taste the pad tie right now. Like you said, Black quipped. Three rounds. They prepared for the tiebreaker before starting on Shields' signal. When the last shot was fired, Black watched the two targets hum toward them on the pulley line. Medium rare, Black said as he shot a sideways glance at Shields. You're going to be very disappointed, Shields said. I was lights out that round. So was I, Black said. They traded targets, graded them, and exchanged them. Would you look at that, Black said, shaking his head in disbelief. A tie, Shields muttered as she examined her shots. This can't be right. Feel free to recheck it, but it looks like we're going to that Tex-Mex place on the way home. The one we both hate? She asked. Black nodded. Seems appropriate. No, we're flipping a coin. A coin flip? Are you kidding me? I wouldn't risk eating Thai food on a coin flip. That's ridiculous. Then one final shot to settle this, she said. Fine, Black said. That wasn't agreed to in our original terms for this competition, but I'll go along with you this time. Excellent, she said. Put out a fresh target. One shot. Closest one wins. They loaded their guns and took their positions. Black adjusted his protective glasses and then looked at Shields. Are you ready? She asked. Just say the word. Go, Shields said. Black steadied his weapon taking a moment longer than he normally would have if he were facing a hostile. This wasn't life or death in the traditional sense, but it was an all-out assault on his taste buds, and he wasn't apt to give in so easily. Just as he squeezed the trigger, hot breath caressed on his neck. He pulled his shot ever so slightly, resulting in a string of expletives. When he peeked around the corner, he saw Shields firing her shot, hitting it dead center. That was over the line, Black said. Shields winked at him as she removed her earmuffs. Relax, you're going to love this tie place. After they exited the facility and headed back to the city, Black replayed his final errant shot in silence. He knew Shields would give him a hard time for losing, but the competition was all in good fun. Eventually, he'd return the favor and win back bragging rights. However, there were more pressing matters to discuss. You mentioned that you wanted to talk about something else that was troubling you, Black said as he turned onto the main highway. Now's as good a time as any. Shields nodded. While you were in Malawi, I found out that Blunt hired a contractor to help with an issue he's having, with Vernon Roberts. The freshman congressman from Pennsylvania? That's the one she said. Apparently, he said he's after Blunt and wants to expose Firestorm. Some kind of retribution for a bill Blunt passed years ago while he was serving in the Senate. Good luck with that. Yeah, well, I doubt he'll be able to make much headway there. But it's who Blunt hired that has me concerned. Who did he hire? Shields took a deep breath and exhaled slowly before responding. Ned Edgerton. Ned Edgerton? Are you kidding me? I wouldn't joke about something like this. Black squeezed the steering wheel and pursed his lips. Edge tried to kill me once. And he apparently failed. So at least we can strike Assassin off the assignments Blunt gave him. Why would he hire Edge? With all the baggage that guy has, he's just toxic. 
not to mention easily recognizable, since his face has been plastered all over television in the past. Shields eased onto the headrest as she stared straight ahead at the winding highway. I'm going to spy on him and see if he's on the up and up. The last thing we need right now is to get blindsided by some rogue operative. Edge was kicked out of the FBI. This just doesn't sound like blunt. I'm going to tail him tonight. You can tag along if you want to. Black chewed on his bottom lip and shook his head. Since it sounds like you have plans already, and I suddenly don't feel like eating, why don't I take a rain check on that Thai food? I promise I'll go there the next time you want to go out to eat. Fine, she said. If you don't hear from me in the morning, at least you'll know what happened. Be careful, Black said. Edge is dangerous. I know, Shield said. He almost killed me once, too. Chapter 11 Washington, D.C. The next morning, Black handed over his credentials to the guard at the visitor's entrance to the Pentagon. He inspected them for a moment before directing Black through the metal detector. Once he was cleared, he proceeded to the E-ring on the third floor to meet with General Higgins. A young woman nursing a cup of tea sat behind a desk in the lobby of Higgins' office. She buzzed the general to let him know that his 10.30 a.m. appointment had arrived. Two minutes later, the general exited his office to usher in Black. General Theodore J. Higgins flashed his winning smile as he walked straight toward Black. Titus Black, Higgins said as the two men shook hands. What's it been? Five years? Six? It's been a minute, Black said. Well, I appreciate that you still think of me as a family friend. Please, after you. Black entered Higgins' office, which looked like a museum of sorts. Higgins displayed an assortment of trophies and awards from his days playing collegiate football at Notre Dame, wartime commendations, and pictures of him with famous heads of state. With one quick glance, Black wished he had time to get the full tour of the room, complete with a general's narration. Higgins was nearly bald, save the thin strip of gray hair that formed a ring around his head. He fiddled with the ring on his right hand, a nervous tick Black had noticed the first time they met. Black's father and Higgins had served together before the war in the Middle East started, while stationed at Hill Air Force Base near Salt Lake City. During their time there, Higgins's and Black's father coached Black's youth baseball team, which had won the league championship two years in a row. All these pictures, and nothing about the Bankers Trust Tigers' back-to-back -back titles? Black asked. Surely this has to rank up there with all your greatest achievements, especially when Willie Turner couldn't throw hard enough to break an egg. As I recall, you bailed that team out of many jams with your bat. The best defense is a great offense, right? Higgins chuckled. That was all we had with that team. Thanks for taking the time to meet with me on such short notice. Black said, as he eased into the chair across from Higgins' desk. Of course, Higgins said with a dismissive wave. So, how have you been getting along? I miss my dad, but at least I have some answers now about what really happened. That gave me some much-needed closure, but I still have some questions about why Wellington was allowed to get away with so much. Where are the checks and balances? It's unfortunate but there are a lot of politics in the military, and Wellington knew how to play the game. I wish I could answer those questions for you, but they're just as much of a mystery to me, too. If you do learn anything else, I'd love to know about it. Absolutely, Higgins said, as he leaned forward in his chair. Now, what else is on your mind? On your call yesterday, I believe you said there was an operation you wanted to know about. Black nodded. That's right. I was in Malawi a few days ago to run an operation on a facility enriching uranium for the Iranians. Higgins's eyebrows shot upward. That's interesting. First you've heard of that, right? If I'd heard that the Iranians were getting their enriched uranium from there, you would have never heard of that facility. As I'd expect, Black said. We got the intel from a Mossad agent that I extracted out of Iran 
when some of their agents and a few assets got exposed. I heard about that debacle. What a mess. Turned out to be a gold mine for us, Black said. The asset was working at the Fordow nuclear facility, and had just learned exactly where they were getting their uranium enriched, since they don't have the capability of doing it on their own yet. Interesting. So why the visit? Black took a deep breath before continuing. When I went to Malawi, I was all set up to sabotage the facility. We were going to take down operations for a few days, draw attention to the relationship, and put pressure on the Malawi government to end their relationship with Iran. All straightforward stuff. But something happened, right? Black nodded. I was stopped by a team of Navy SEALs. Or former Navy SEALs. I can't be sure which. They prevented me from going to the facility. Now that's a twist I didn't see coming. The biggest surprise of all was that they said their orders came from the Pentagon. So what I want to know is who here is ordering soldiers around the world, stopping black ops initiatives? Higgins leaned back in his chair and stroked his chin before answering. That's not exactly what we do here, but I think you know that. Of course, but I expect to get the truth out of you, if anything because of the relationship you've had with our family. The truth isn't always as cut and dry as you might think. You don't think I realize that? Black said as he placed his hands on Higgins's desk and leaned forward. I've been in the intelligence business long enough to know how things work, but I'm also fully aware of how much activity, some of it even illegal, goes on behind the curtains, far from the spotlight of public accountability. Now, are you going to tell me what the hell was going on, or am I going to have to start conducting my own investigation? Higgins pursed his lips. If I knew what was going on, I swear I'd tell you. There are a lot of secrets in this building. Well, whoever's intent on keeping them will have a reckoning coming. Agent Black, I want you to understand before you go poking around that there are some rocks best left undisturbed. You go looking under every one. I promise you that trouble will follow. There's trouble whether I look or not, Black said. The only remaining question is whether I'm going to find it before it finds me. The odds aren't in your favor there. Black narrowed his eyes. What are you not telling me? Higgins gripped the arms of his chair and held Black's gaze. I don't know anything about this specific case, but I do know that there are powers that be in the Pentagon who exercise an enormous amount of authority, well outside the legal bounds. Do you know who's behind it? Higgins shook his head. I've just heard rumors, but I'm not quite high enough up on the food chain to catch anything but the break room whispers. If you do learn anything else, promise me you'll tell me, Black said as he stood. Something sketchy is going on, and it's not in the best interest of this country, I'll tell you that much. Higgins eased out of his chair and then strode around his desk. He shook Black's hand before ushering him toward the door. If I hear anything else, I'll be in touch, Higgins said. And don't hesitate to reach out again. You know I thought the world of your father. He'd be proud of the man you've become. Black's expression softened. Even though I still never learned how to throw a curveball? Higgins smiled and patted Black on the back. Take care, Agent Black. Black nodded before exiting the office. As he rode the elevator down to the ground floor and returned to his car, he replayed the conversation in his mind. Higgins had issued a vague yet ominous warning. He knew more than he was saying, that much Black was sure of. You better believe I'm going to turn over every rock. The Bon Thai restaurant wasn't even among the top 500 restaurants in Washington that Black wanted to patronize. While he would eat just about anything, he couldn't get past the texture of the Thai food. Despite not being happy about losing his bet to Shields on a last-minute rule change, he felt the need to be a good sport. Shields volunteered to drive, 
and picked him up a half hour before their early dinner reservation. She wore a big grin during the short trip to Bantai. Just because I'm doing this doesn't mean I'm happy about it, he said as they were getting out of her car. You may not be now, but your mouth is going to thank me for it later, she said. In fact, I'm going to order for you tonight. Whatever it is, it better be cooked, Black said. Don't worry, she said with a wink. I won't torture you. If you order me raw fish, I'm getting up and walking out. Relax. It's just one meal. Besides, I drove. How will you get home? Black cast a sideways glance at her before they entered the restaurant. They followed a hostess to their table and then ordered drinks. After some brief small talk, he updated her on his meeting with General Higgins. When he finished, she shook her head. That was a cryptic message he was sending you. He nodded. There's something about this situation that he knows that he's not telling me. Their waiter returned to take their orders. Shields ordered a dish of chicken and bamboo shoots for herself and a plate of pork curry for him. Black's mouth fell agape. Wait, they have pork shoulder here? The waiter chuckled. It's quite good, actually. Shields leaned back in her chair and eyed Black. You need to live a little and try new things more often. Just wait until you taste it. Black scanned the room before scooting closer to the table. So, what did you find out on your little expedition today? Anything on Blunt's latest hire? I did more than just hack a few files to see what he's been up to, Shield said. I found him. What was he doing? At first, it looked like he was running a simple surveillance op on Vernon Roberts. But that was before I saw them talking with each other. That's not standard protocol. You never engage the target. Edge is his own man, apparently. Black sighed. Are you going to speak with Blunt about this? I'm planning on it first thing tomorrow morning. This kind of recklessness is putting us all in danger. Agreed. You can't let this go on much longer. Blunt needs to know what's happening, even if he's not bothered by it. Edge plays by his own rules. When the check arrived after the meal, Black insisted on paying. Shields put up a mild fight before relenting, using her victory at the range as her reason why he should pay. On the way home, they discussed what duties each one of them would tackle in the morning at the office. However, Shields grew agitated throughout the trip back to Black's townhome, so apparent that Black brought it up. What's wrong with you tonight? Black asked. What do you mean? Ever since we got in the car, you've been short and snippy, like you're paying attention to something else. Shields glanced in the rearview mirror. I think we're being followed. You know how to lose a tail. Her eyes narrowed. Hold on. She jerked the steering wheel hard. Black braced himself as the sudden turn forced him to the right. He resisted just long enough to keep from banging his head against the window. Black turned around to see the car had also made the quick turn and roared up behind them. That didn't work, she said. Got any other bright ideas? You gotta make that light, he said, pointing ahead. Shields pressed the accelerator even harder as her car sped toward the intersection. The light turned yellow as she approached it, but she didn't waver. With her foot on the gas, she plowed ahead. One of the cars that started to go in the other lane honked at her. Then Black heard it honk again. He glanced back to see the car still closing in on them. What the hell, Black said. I've got him, Shield said. There's an alleyway up ahead on the right that I know I can make it down. Moments later, Shields whipped the wheel to the right. Her car careened down the narrow passageway and hit several trash cans along the way. Black looked behind them to notice that the trailing vehicle had managed to keep pace and was closing fast. Shields swore as she clenched her fist. Nobody is this good. They won't be able to keep pace forever, Black said. Lead them to a very public place where they can't touch us. I don't think these people are going to care very much about getting identified by someone, she said. He's bearing down on us and shows no signs of concern about his own well-being. 
Then use that to your advantage, Black said. Let's take them someplace where the odds of navigating through a stretch of road will be more difficult for them than you. It's not going to make much difference. They're going to hit us and... Before Shields could finish her sentence, a car nosed out in front of her at an intersection. She tried to swerve to avoid it, but she didn't react quickly enough. In a matter of seconds, she went from humming down the road to clinging on to her life. Black gripped the side of the door tightly and let out a few choice words as the car hit a stack of pallets, resulting in the vehicle entering a barrel roll. He closed his eyes and said a quick prayer as he heard a cacophony of sounds that included tires skidding and pieces of glass tinkling onto the pavement. That was the last thing he remembered before everything went dark. Chapter 12 Washington, D.C. Blunt eyed the vast selection of bourbons scattered behind the bar at the dignitary. While it wasn't his usual haunt, he wasn't about to turn down an invitation from Madeline McMurtry, a rising political star who'd already managed to attain the position of Secretary of State. McMurtry's fiery red hair matched her personality, which made her a fierce ambassador for President Michaels. And while she was easy on the eyes, Blunt knew her loyalty was the real reason Michael selected her for the job. Over the last half hour, Blunt engaged in a few minutes of small talk with several representatives who recognized him, but spent most of his time pondering why McMurtry asked to meet with him. He glanced at his watch and knew she was more than 15 minutes late before he wondered if maybe he'd heard her wrong when she invited him out for drinks. Blunt finally placed his drink order and then turned around to see a smiling McMurtry sliding onto the seat next to him. I'm so sorry for being late. Madeline said. I was in the middle of dealing with the Russians and the Ukrainians, who were already up this morning and fighting. You mean they actually stop sometimes? Blunt asked. She smiled and waved dismissively. What am I telling you this for? You know more than I do about all the geopolitics. I'm still wet behind the ears. Don't sell yourself short, Madam Secretary. Please, call me Madeline. No need for all those stuffy titles now. Okay, Madeline, don't sell yourself short. I've been following you since you assumed the office. You're doing a great job. And I'm not just saying that because of my relationship with the president. Well, that's what I wanted to talk with you about, she said, lines creasing her forehead. She ordered a drink and then turned her gaze toward Blunt. Word is that Vernon Roberts thinks he has something on you, she said. Blunt cocked his head to one side and furrowed his brow. What do you mean? Quit playing dumb, she said. The president filled me in on what you and Firestorm do. It's quite impressive, I might add, and it makes my job much easier. But none of that will matter if Roberts gets your organization shut down. That's never gonna happen since we don't officially exist. Don't be so sure, she said. Roberts is dangerous because he came to Washington with a vendetta against you and many others, from what I understand. Roberts has made that much expressly clear to me, but I'm not afraid of him. Well, be afraid of the president, because he'd just as soon shut you down as he would endure a scandal if the truth about Firestorm became public. And know that I'll take a number and get in line to whip your ass if you don't figure out a way to handle Roberts. So that's two more people you need to worry about other than Roberts. So I recommend you play nice with him before he takes you to the woodshed. Just know that he won't be handling any of this with caution. He's gunning for you to settle a score. And I don't think he cares very deeply about his political future. There's a reason he came to Washington, and it wasn't about helping the people in his district. He simply wants revenge. The bartender placed their drinks in front of them. Blunt stared at his glass before taking a long pull on it. We've done a good job of keeping what we do out of the public eye, Blunt said, and I intend for it to stay that way. If the president wants me to play along with Roberts, I'll do it, if only for the fact that this country needs a black ops unit like us. I won't disagree with you, she said as she patted him on the back. 
So don't do anything that would jeopardize the organization. The president needs you, and so do I. She stood before throwing back her drink. Blunt's eyes bulged as she slammed the glass down on the table. McMurtry glanced at him before winking. It's all that Irish blood flowing through my veins, she said. Be good. She spun on her heels and then exited the bar. Blunt finished his drink before heading to his car. He buckled up and pushed the ignition button before his phone buzzed with a call. After looking at the number, he sighed and then answered. J.D. Blunt answered my call. Hell hath frozen over. The sound of Vernon Roberts' voice grated on Blunt, like fingernails on a chalkboard. Congressman Roberts, what can I possibly do for you tonight? Plenty of things, actually. And what makes you think I'd do anything for you? Just call it a hunch that you were in a charitable mood toward me right now. Blunt grunted. And why is that? Because you don't want the world to find out that you threatened to kill me. Threatened to kill you? What on earth are you talking about? Roberts chuckled. J.D., J.D., are you acting like you don't remember now? Old age must be getting to you. My memory might not be what it used to be back when I was a young whippersnapper like you, but I don't recall ever threatening your life. Oh, but you did. Just listen to this. After a brief delay, Blunt listened to the sound of his voice on a recording. You won't have to worry about that because I'm going to murder Roberts first. Now, you're not going to try and tell me that wasn't your voice, are you? Roberts said. That was hyperbole and you know it, Blunt said. And as I recall, you said the same thing about me just moments before on another recording. Do you still have that recording? I'm not doing anything for you. So whatever this stunt is that you're trying to pull, you can forget about it. Just hyperbole, huh? Robert said. I wonder what my two million followers on social media would think about your comments. Maybe I should let them judge. Blunt sighed. What do you want? I need you to do me a favor. You have a strange way of asking for one. I march to my own beat, Robert said. Now, what I need you to do is speak with one of your pals about an upcoming vote in the Senate on the Homeland Safety Act. Blunt chuckled. You obviously think I have more pull in this town than I do. You better pray you have pull with Nate Wilcox, or else you're going to learn firsthand how the vultures in this city will pick your bones clean after I play this recording of you. No one will believe that recording is real. You think today's journalists are going to wait to analyze your voice? Hell no. They're going to run with this five seconds after it hits their inbox. And you're going to find yourself in hot water. Now, are you going to call Wilcox or do I need to send out this audio file to every local and national reporter? I'll call him. What do you want me to say? I need my name attached to some big legislation. Isn't that how the game is played? Blunt ignored him as Roberts continued. I need him to break ranks and reach across the aisle to vote yes with my party. If he does that, I'll owe him one in the house. There's no guarantee that he'll go for it. Roberts clucked his tongue. You're doing a lousy job at selling yourself right now, but I bet the moment you start talking to old Nate, You'll turn on the charm and have him walking down Pennsylvania Avenue on his hands while stark naked. At least, you better hope you can convince him to go along with me. They're voting in less than half an hour, so you best make it quick. After Roberts hung up, Blunt dialed Wilcox's number. On the third ring, the senator answered in a hushed tone. Now's not a good time, J.D., Wilcox said. We're about to cast a vote. That's why it's the perfect time, Blunt fired back. What bill are you voting on? It doesn't matter. I'm going to vote against this thing, and we'll be out of here in five minutes. No, wait, Blunt said. I know it's the Homeland Safety Act, and I want you to reconsider. Blunt proceeded to summon every ounce of persuasion he had left in him, 
delivering an impassioned plea to Wilcox. Okay, okay, Wilcox said. Just answer me one final question, J.D. All right, fire away. Would you have voted for this bill? Blunt didn't hesitate. In a heartbeat, no matter what the majority leader said or promised. Are you sure? Have I ever lied to you? Blunt replied. Well, no, but... Have you read what's in this thing, J.D.? It's got more pork in it than a three-meat plate from Maurice's barbecue. You vote how you think is best, but I just think you should. Wilcox let out an exasperated breath. Fine, I'll consider it. Blunt hung up and then cruised over to the Senate website to watch the votes roll in. A couple of minutes later, Wilcox's name popped up. He voted for the measure, resulting in a hint of a smile from Blunt against his haggard face. Add a boy, Nate. Blunt drove home, mulling over what Roberts was really up to. The bill was rather toothless in its efforts to curb surveillance of U.S. citizens, becoming little more than symbolic. But Blunt sensed that Roberts had another endgame in mind. When the firestorm director walked into his house, his phone started buzzing. He answered it, but before he could even tell who it was, another call beeped in on the line. Then his phone started humming with a steady stream of incoming text messages. Blunt hung up and hustled over to his television, fearing the worst, perhaps news that the president was dead. Instead, he was greeted by the story of Wilcox's bill passing. Then came the follow-up story, which started with the dramatic bumper music and the sweeping graphic across the screen that announced breaking news. A young woman stared solemnly at the camera as she read the information in a somber tone. Channel 5 has just received some breaking news. Pennsylvania Congressman Vernon Roberts said that he fears for his life after suffering a threat on his life from former Texas Senator J.D. Blunt. Blunt dropped his phone on the counter before slapping it with both hands. Why, you little son of a bitch, Blunt said as he snarled, shaking his fist at the television. I swear on my mother's grave I'm going to finish you off one day, and it'll be in a moment when you least expect it. But that was all too late. The damage had been done. Blunt had been played for the fool, and Roberts wouldn't suffer any consequences, even when the truth eventually came out but Blunt was going to make sure that didn't happen. Chapter 13 Searing pain shot up Black's back as he regained consciousness. The room was quiet, except for the low hum of a machine. The relative silence stood in stark contrast to the last thing he remembered when Shields' car was hit from behind, resulting in a cacophony of glass flying. Tires screeching, metal crunching. However, the peaceful moment felt contrived. Black's arms felt as though they had been stuck with pins. He looked up to see his hands tethered to a metal pipe protruding from the wall and running the length of the room. The musty, dank smell coupled with the small windows near the top of the ceiling convinced him that he was in a basement somewhere. Shields groaned her hands also hoisted above her head. She had a scratch oozing blood down the right side of her face and a bruise on her chin. Other than some torn clothing, she looked in reasonably good shape. This is why I should have never let you pick the restaurant, Black said. You know this had nothing to do with Bon Tai, she said. Don't make me come over there. I wish you would, Black said. These bindings are killing my wrists. Who says I'd cut you down after slamming Bon Tai? Black smiled. I just thought maybe you could use my help getting out of here. He closed his eyes again and threw his head back. Sucking in a breath through his teeth, he tried to wriggle his wrists in an attempt to escape the bindings. When he heard the clinking of metal, he thought he was successful for a fleeting second. Instead, it was just Shields' cuffs clanging against the pipe as she broke free. I might be persuaded to help you, she said. 
Black looked straight ahead to find S.H.I.E.L.D. standing directly in front of him. She fiddled with his lock for a few seconds. You okay? He asked. That cut on your face looks nasty. As long as it makes a cool scar, I'm sure I'll be fine with it, she said. He huffed a laugh through his nose. Always witty to the end. Before she finished freeing him, the door across the room flung open. Black couldn't see anything, since shields blocked his view. All he heard were deliberate footsteps, and then a slow clap. She turned around and slid aside, revealing a man dressed in a dark suit. He loosened his tie with his left hand, while training his gun on them with his right. Don't let me stop you, he said as he cocked his head. I mean, I will stop you, but there's no fun if you don't at least make me. Who are you? Black asked. Where are you is probably a better question to ask first, though I'm not about to answer either one of them. However, if you answer my questions, I might be persuaded to answer a few of yours. Ready to play? Black narrowed his eyes. Running us off the road and nearly killing us doesn't exactly endear us to you. I doubt you're going to find us very cooperative. Trust me, Mr. Black, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm prepared for any number of responses you might attempt. But I don't think you'll like my mitigation techniques. They're usually swift and sudden. Shields glared at the man. We're not answering anything, but I can promise you that we're walking out of this room, and you aren't. The man smiled and tapped his index finger to his lips. You've got a lot of spunk, Miss Shields. Your extensive file didn't mention just how aggressive you are. Spunk is the word men use to describe women when they don't know how to handle us, she said. Put the gun down and come over here for a hand-to-hand -hand fight. It'll be an ass whipping you'll never forget. He clucked his tongue and shook his head. Such arrogance will be the death of you one day. But it won't be today, she said as she clenched her fists and raised them near her face. And here I thought Mr. Black wore the pants in this partnership. Black eyed their captor. She's my partner, but she's her own woman. She can handle herself. She certainly doesn't need me to hold her hand. But don't take my word for it. Come over here and find out for yourself. He shook his head and dug into his pocket. After retrieving a pair of handcuffs, he threw them at her and told her to attach herself to the bar. Once she finished, he paced around the room, eyeing them closely. Now... This doesn't have to be a long and drawn-out interrogation, he said. You answer me straight away, and I'll get you out of here and on your way. If you stonewall me, this might take a while. Black shrugged. Fair enough. However, I must warn you that unless I can see your security clearance, you're likely not going to get much out of us. Then you're likely to hate the next hour, if you survive. It's your choice. Good luck making us talk, Shield said. Maybe I'll start with you first, beautiful, the man said as he winked at her. Removing your leg might be a fun way to start. Who are you working for? Black demanded. The man wagged his finger. I'm the one who asks the questions around here. Remember? So my first one is this. What were you doing in Malawi? What the hell? Black asked. Who are you? Just answer the question, the man said before speaking in a measured tone. What were you doing in Malawi? Who said I went to Malawi? Black fired back. Maybe you should start there first. The man jammed his weapon beneath Black's chin. What were you doing in Malawi? You're not listening, Black said. The man pursed his lips before drawing back and smacking Black on the side of the head, knocking him out. When Black regained consciousness, he found himself strapped to a chair, with his captor hovering over him. He revved a drill in his hand, holding it inches from Black's face as the sharp bit whirred. Now, I'm going to ask this one more time. What were you doing in Malawi? Chapter 14 Blunt was getting into his car 
when his phone rang with a call from Amanda Russell, the host of the highest-rated primetime news program on cable television. He found her to be pleasant to work with and one of the fairest journalists in the city. On several occasions, Blunt had provided deep background for her, all while maintaining anonymity. However, this time her request was different. You want me to do what? he asked. Go on the air and talk about these accusations from Congressman Roberts, she repeated. I'll interview you, and we can get to the heart of this. After all, these are very serious allegations. And they aren't ones I can deny because I said it. So you just want to leave it at that? Blunt stared out the window of his car, contemplating his reply. There's much more to the story. Of course there is, which is why we should talk about it tonight. We go live in an hour. Are you anywhere near the studio? What makes you think I want to go on air and talk about this? I'm a policy wonk now. Nobody cares about me. That's where you're wrong. You're still one of the most beloved legislators to grace Capitol Hill during my lifetime. People will want to know the whole story, straight from the source's mouth. Don't let him get the last word and sully your reputation. Blunt clenched his fist as he stared at the steering wheel. He wanted to pummel Roberts for creating this situation. And while Blunt preferred to stay out of the limelight since leaving public office, he needed to confront Roberts's claim before it created bigger problems. I'll do it, he said. I can be at the studio in 20 minutes. Excellent, she said. See you soon. Blunt hung up and drew in a deep breath before exhaling slowly. Be cool. Don't lose your temper. He needed to tell himself that, even if he knew there was no chance in hell of it happening. Blunt lumbered into the dressing room area for the Russell Report, escorted by a twenty-something woman with a headset. He gnawed on his cigar while inspecting the chair she asked him to sit in. Please, Senator Blunt. J.D. is fine. I'm not a senator anymore. Okay, J.D. Someone will be with you shortly. A few minutes later, a woman entered the room and introduced herself as Rita. Blunt estimated she was in her mid-sixties. She wore a white shawl over her black blouse and pants. After looking Blunt up and down, Rita peered over the top of her glasses resting on the end of her nose. Ditch the stogie, honey, she said with a wave of her hand. I'm not working on your face while you breathe tobacco fumes all over me. Blunt tossed the cigar into a nearby trash can without getting up. You've got quite a task ahead of you if you think you can make me look beautiful. I'm a makeup artist, not a miracle worker. Blunt glanced at her left hand, searching for a ring as he wondered if she was married. This is my kind of lady. He couldn't help but miss the giant diamond glistening on her hand. Smile, toots, she said as she applied some foundation on his face. That's half your problem right there. Not much to smile about these days. Sure there is, she said. You're about to go on the top-rated cable news program in the nation. Your star will shine a little brighter after tonight. I prefer the shadows. To each his own, she said as she continued applying makeup. When she was finished, Blunt met with Amanda Russell and one of the show's producers in a green room backstage. Thanks for coming on tonight. Amanda said as she shook Blunt's hand. I can't imagine how these kinds of allegations might make you feel. I'd like to ram my cane up his, Blunt said before stopping himself. She winked at him. That's what got you in trouble in the first place. But let's make it all better tonight. Well, that shouldn't be a problem. Especially with this recording, he said as he held out a flash drive. What's this? The producer asked. It's the video footage of Vernon Roberts that I was responding to when I was secretly recorded. It'll show that either it was hyperbole, or that Roberts is a complete hypocrite. I'm good with either one. Have you verified it for authenticity? The producer asked. Black pointed to his eyes. I've got all the verification I need. Listen to it yourself or run it through one of your analyzers. 
These things can be faked today, you know, the producer said. Either way, it proves that I was set up. But see it for yourself. She took the flash drive from Blunt and then hustled out of the room. Amanda turned to Blunt. Do you think you can stay composed during the interview? Blunt shrugged. I'll give it a shot. She placed her hand on his shoulder. I want this to be a positive outcome for you, not get you in deeper trouble. Just ask the questions. We'll let the public decide. After she finished briefing him on the types of questions she intended to ask, she exited the room. Blunt was left alone with his thoughts, pondering how to frame the narrative in order to expose Roberts' agenda. His phone rang again, this time with a call from one of the president's advisors. J.D., this is Mike Lohman. The president asked me to give you a call. Can this wait, Mike? I'm a little busy right now. With what? The Russell Report? That's exactly what I need to speak with you about. Blunt sighed. What is it? The president would prefer you not go on that program. He doesn't want you to give Roberts any more ammunition to try and get rid of you. President Michaels values your contribution to the defense community and feels like we'd be weaker as a nation if you were no longer a part of his inner circle. Is he going to kick me out? Blunt asked. He has no plans to do so, but you know how difficult it is to withstand the pressure from these nut jobs today. They want to cancel everything, and if you don't strike the right notes, they'll come for you too. I'll be fine, Blunt said. I'm going to put this whole thing to rest once and for all. Just watch and learn. A half hour later, Blunt was escorted to his seat during a commercial break. When the director pointed at Amanda, she sat upright in her chair and looked directly at the camera. In a major developing story today, Pennsylvania Congressman Vernon Roberts released a recording of former Texas Senator J.D. Blunt, apparently capturing audio of him saying that he wanted to kill Roberts. However, in tonight's The Other Side segment, we've brought Senator Blunt into the studio to talk about these explosive allegations. She maintained her somber expression as she turned toward Blunt. Thank you for joining us tonight, Senator, she said. I appreciate you having me, Blunt said. Earlier today, Congressman Roberts took to social media to accuse you of threatening him, releasing a snippet of audio where you said this. On the screen behind them, a blue background appeared along with the Russell Report logo. Over the speakers, Blunt could hear his voice. You won't have to worry about that, because I'm going to murder Roberts first, Blunt heard himself say. When you hear that now, what do you think? Amanda asked. I was simply reacting out of frustration. Nothing more than hyperbole, Blunt said. If you're a parent, you'd be nominated for sainthood if you could swear that you never said I'm going to kill little Bobby or Jane. Amanda chuckled. Well, I know I can't say that. But isn't that a little different than a political rival? Look, in private our unfiltered thoughts pour out, especially when we're emotional about something. It's not like we're going to follow through on something like that. Besides, I'm an old man. I'm not up for fighting with a whippersnapper like Roberts. She nodded subtly and cocked her head to one side. So, what was it that you were so emotional about? Someone showed me video footage of Roberts saying something very similar, though much stronger, about me. And we happened to have that video, she said. Let's let the viewers decide for themselves. The image Blunt had watched with Edge appeared on the screen behind Amanda's desk. Robert stroked his chin. I'm going to kill J.D. Blunt. Well, that's a name I haven't heard in a while, one of the men with Robert said. Roberts's gaze was cold. I hope nobody ever speaks his name again after I murder that bastard. Once the video stopped, Amanda turned back toward Blunt. That definitely changes the story, doesn't it? Blunt shrugged. I hope so. I don't intend to kill the congressman. And I hope he doesn't want to murder me either. What would you say to him if he were here right now? She asked. 
I'd tell him that we need to bury the hatchet, and not in each other. I'm willing to let bygones be bygones. Seems like you're intent on taking the high road, Senator. It's the only road to take, Blunt said. Well, thank you for your time, she said, before turning toward the camera. After the break, we'll return with a story about a mother who was confronted by an angry flock of Karens for letting her child do this on a public playground. When the lights dimmed, Blunt stood up, and one of the grips removed the lapel mic from his jacket. Excellent job, Senator, Amanda said. The producer rushed over to them. Yes, Senator, thank you for coming on the show tonight. And based on what I'm seeing on social media, the people there agree with you. It'd be hard not to, Blunt said as he jammed his cigar back into his mouth. It's funny how that happens when you hear both sides of a one-sided story. Again, I appreciate it, Amanda said. My pleasure, Blunt said, before he exited the set. He nodded and smiled as he passed Rita in the hallway. Don't forget to wash that off with soap and water, she said as she scurried past him. And quit chewing on cigars. That's bad for your teeth. Blunt grunted and continued on to the parking deck pleased that he'd been able to squash Roberts's pathetic attempt to turn the public against him. He dug into his pocket to pay the parking garage fee when he felt another small object. He pulled it out and inspected what appeared to be a button. Then he realized it was a bug. Damn you, Roberts. Blunt dropped the device on the ground before crushing it with the heel of his foot. After he climbed into his car, his phone buzzed. He glanced at the number and rolled his eyes. What now? He answered the phone and then started the engine of his car. Please hold for the President of the United States, a woman said. A few seconds later, Michaels's voice boomed over the speaker. Good evening, J.D. Good evening to you too, Mr. President, Blunt said. We need to talk. Chapter 15 Black squirmed in the chair, trying to loosen the bindings as his captor loomed with a drill in hand. The feeling of helplessness wasn't one that Black experienced very often, and he hated it. The whir of the machine activated his will to fight, frustrating him even more. Okay, okay, Black said as he turned his head to the side. I'll talk. The man didn't turn off the drill. I want to know everything. Black grimaced. Just get that out of my face, and I'll tell you what you want to know. The man growled before taking his finger off the drill's trigger. This better be good. I was sent on assignment to Malawi, where I was supposed to meet someone at the mine. And? And then he was going to give me the rest of my assignment. That's bullshit. Black shook his head. I don't know who you are, but that's how things in my world work. You don't always know the what, or the why, or the how. Just the who. The captor tossed his drill aside and pulled out his gun. He eased behind shields and jammed the gun into her temple. Whoa, 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 Black said. Slow down, man. No, you need to speed up and tell me the damn truth. This is your last chance. Black glared at the man, knowing he would likely shoot them both after he got the answer he was looking for. All Black wanted to do was buy some more time. He needed to get the man away from Shields, and then maybe she could incapacitate him somehow. Nothing he could think of was ideal, but at least it gave them a fighting chance. I'm waiting, the man said. Panic settled on Shields' face. She kicked and squirmed to get away from him but he tightened his grip around her head as he eyed Black. Well, this goes against every fiber in my being, Black began. Before he could finish, two bullets ripped through the man. He crumpled to the ground, dropping his gun. As Black looked up, his gaze met Shields's. Where'd that come from? he asked. She shrugged, her eyes open wide. Does it really matter? It might if someone else storms in the room and decides to shoot us as well. 
we'd be sitting ducks for whatever madman decides to take us out. In that case, it's a good thing I'm not a madman, said a man as he entered the room. You, Shields asked, her brow furrowed. What are you? What's the matter? He asked. You've never had your life saved by someone you were surveilling? It's an odd experience, I admit. Ned Edgerton, at your service. Edgerton knelt next to the body and felt for the man's pulse. Nice shot, Black said. Edgerton smiled as he fished the handcuff keys out of the dead man's pocket. Like shooting fish in a barrel. Thanks, Shield said. Of course, Edgerton said as he unlocked her restraints. Now, you want to tell me why you were tailing me earlier today? Shields rubbed her wrists. I've heard a lot about you, and I wanted to make sure you weren't playing blunt. I'm fiercely loyal to him. That makes two of us, Edgerton said as he released Black. Three of us, Black said. But I guess this begs the question. What the hell are you doing here? I was counter-surveilling your partner there, Edgerton said. When I noticed she had a tail, I decided to follow you and see what was going on. So you saw the wreck? Shields asked. Edgerton nodded. Every second of it. Her eyes widened. And you just let them drag us out like that? There was a whole team of people involved, several of them armed. So I hung back and waited. Once they removed you from their van and dropped you off here, everyone left except for this unlucky bastard. And you just waited for just the right moment to strike, Shields asked as she crossed her arms. I had to find out what was going on first. She glared at him. Next time, don't cut it so close. Edgerton shrugged. A thank you would be nice. Where exactly are we? Black asked. We're in the back of a lab just outside the city, Edgerton said. Supposedly, this place went out of business months ago. That was either a lie, or they just left their stuff behind and these lowlifes have been squatting here. Black nodded at the body on the ground. You recognize this guy? His name's McGinty, Edgerton said. He was an insufferable wretch of a human being. Then you know him, Black asked. Knew him, Edgerton corrected. But yeah, we crossed paths a few times. He was a decent interrogator, but an awful shot. I'm surprised he lasted this long. So, just a gun for hire? Shields asked. No, that's the ironic part. He worked for the government, under the full good initiative. A government worker, Black said. That explains the ineptitude. Shields backhanded him across the chest. You're missing the big picture here. What exactly is the Full Good Initiative? It's a special ops group controlled by Pentagon officials. Which ones? Black asked. I wish I knew. And if anyone should, it'd be me, since I did some freelance work for them. But I never received my orders from a specific person, and the whole process was shrouded in secrecy. I've never heard of the Full Good Initiative either, Black said. That's no surprise. It's almost as highly classified as Firestorm. Almost, Shields asked. Who do you think knows about us? More than you might imagine, Edgerton said. So now what? Black asked, unbothered by the potential exposure. Edge pointed at McGinty. We've got a body to dispose of. Chapter 16 Blunt had never before considered hanging up on the president, but the earful Blunt was about to receive made him ponder, if even for just a fleeting moment, how wise or foolish such a move might be. Michaels had one of his right-hand men, Mike Lohman, warn Blunt about going on the show, advice that he blew off without hesitation. And now the president was calling himself. After a split-second internal struggle, Blunt decided to face the music. If he's gonna chew me out, I might as well hear it. But I won't be listening. Well, Mr. President, isn't this a surprise, Blunt said. What do you want to talk about tonight? 
You know damn well why I'm calling. Then you know I wasn't about to let someone go after my reputation like that. Michael sighed. Jeez, Blunt. You were a senator for several terms. I didn't know you had any reputation left to speak of. I heard your message loud and clear. But I refuse to allow Roberts' claims against me to go unchecked. I don't want the press digging into me any more than you do, okay? We're on the same team here, and are trying to achieve the same goal, no matter what Roberts might say, sir. Blunt realized the emphasis he put on his last word might be perceived as somewhat antagonistic. He took a deep breath before proceeding. What I mean, Mr. President, is that I can't let Roberts frame the narrative against me. If I didn't respond quickly and vehemently, I would have lost any chance of stating my case later on. At that point, the horse would have been out of the barn, and we both know how difficult it is to put the horse back. I understand your concern, but I've already seen what a master manipulator he is. Nobody waltzes into Washington like that and starts rocketing up the ladder of power without some deft political skills. Political skills? Blunt scoffed. He's controlling people by getting dirt on them, just like he tried with me. The bastard threatened to release that audio recording of me unless I spoke with Wilcox and urged him to pass Roberts's authored Homeland Safety Act. Well, I'll just veto the damn thing then. Have you read it? Blunt asked. It doesn't do anything, really. You'd gain more political clout by showing your ability to bridge the partisan divide by signing it into law than vetoing it. Are you sure about that? Yeah, it's just window dressing. Like 90% of the crap we passed when I was in the Senate. Okay, I won't stir up anything. But just lay low for a while, will you? This'll all blow over soon enough. I'll do my best, sir. JD, this country needs what you and your team are doing now more than ever. We need the ability to strike against terrorists without putting soldiers into certain parts of the world. And we need to do it without anyone knowing. That's what we do best. Then let's keep it that way. Don't give Roberts any opportunity to take you down. I understand. I'll keep my mouth shut and avoid any more public appearances until this is long forgotten. Good. And JD? Yeah, Blunt asked. Keep up the good work. He hung up and exhaled. After defending himself against Roberts's claims, Blunt was happy to comply with the president's request. But Blunt wasn't about to let Roberts take over Washington with such tactics, ones that were dirty even by Washington's subterranean standards. As Blunt drove home, he called Edge. I was just about to check in with you, Edge said after answering. Well, you wouldn't have been able to reach me, Blunt said. I've been a little busy tonight dealing with a mess our good friend Vernon Roberts made. So, anything interesting to report? As a matter of fact, there is. Edge filled in Blunt on his counter-surveillance of shields, followed by the attack against the senator's two agents and their subsequent rescue. Sounds like you've had a busy night, Blunt said. I'd prefer to drink a Michelob Light and watch a basketball game. But a man's gotta eat. Blunt chuckled. So what's this full good initiative all about? I've never even heard of him. And that takes some doing for me not to know about something of this magnitude. All I know for sure is that a group of Pentagon officials is running this group. And according to your agents, they were demanding answers about why you had someone in Malawi. Damn, Blunt said as he pounded his fist on the steering wheel. I hate it when I get more questions than answers. Nature of the business, sir, Edge said. It's the part I hate. Well, you better get used to it. In my experience, this won't make full good go away. It'll only make them more intent on striking back. Blunt grunted. In that case, we better get ready. I'm not about to go quietly. Roger that, Edge said before he hung up. Blunt pulled into his driveway. He turned off the engine before interlocking his fingers behind his head and looking skyward. The more he knew about his enemies, the better positioned he was to confront them. 
but an unknown enemy? He might as well be fighting a ghost. However, Blunt intended to change all of that. Full good initiative. You're going to wish you never messed with me or my team. Chapter 17 Washington, D.C. Blunt bit down hard on the end of his cigar as he hobbled into the conference room at Firestorm headquarters. Instead of just a couple occupied seats, he had a room buzzing with conversations among his burgeoning team. He leaned hard on his cane while he scanned the attendees. Black and Shields were joined by Jana and Edge, as well as Robert Besserman. Let's get this party started. Good morning, everyone, Blunt bellowed, putting an abrupt end to the chatter. Thank you for joining me. We have a lot to discuss, especially in light of the events over the past 24 hours. Yes, we do, Jana said as she stood. Starting with your cane. Blunt frowned as he glanced down at his cane. What's wrong with this thing? Abe and I have been around the world together. He's about the most reliable thing in my life. Outside of you guys, of course. Then allow me to introduce to you Abe 2.0, Jenna said, extending both her hands, a new cane resting on them. Blunt lumbered over toward her and took it from her hand, studying it curiously. Hmm... This is interesting. What makes Abe 2.0 so special? Jana gave him a tight-lipped smile. Do be careful, sir. I wouldn't want that thing just going off in any direction. He raised an eyebrow. Going off? Yes, sir, she said, gingerly rotating the cane's handle. As you can see here, there's a small trigger button just beneath the handle. If you ever get into any trouble... You can quickly end it by aiming the foot at your would-be attacker. And then what? he asked. Jana raised the cane and pointed it toward the fall wall. Then you just pull the trigger. A puff of air was followed by a thump. Everyone in the room turned to see the end of a small dart jutting out from the textured sheetrock. Whoa, Blunt said. What was that? It's a tranquilizer dart, sir, Jana said. It'll inject a fast-acting tranquilizer into your target's bloodstream, rendering them incapacitated in a matter of seconds. How many seconds? Two or three, she said. But it'll slow them down enough that you should be able to get out of harm's way. Should be, Blunt asked, his cynicism growing. In a pinch, it gives you more of a fighting chance than nothing, sir. Blunt shrugged. Thank you but let's hope I don't have to try it out anytime soon. Now, where were we? You said we had a lot to discuss, Besserman said, and I think you know I'm running short on time these days. Yes, of course, Blunt said. Now, let's get down to business. Why don't you start us off, Bobby? Besserman templed his fingers and took a deep breath before beginning. Last night, J.D. called me and asked me to stop by this morning to fill you in on the Full Good Initiative, so I have some information for you that I hope you will find helpful. It better be helpful, Shield said. I'm not happy about the idea that someone in my own government tried to kill me. Besserman stood and then paced as he spoke. About ten years ago, the Pentagon was struggling to cut through some of Washington's thick red tape and responding to different situations around the world with some journalists getting more aggressive about exposing every secret about our military. Leaders were growing reticent about retaliating for attacks against military installations abroad. Since every move was documented and could be exposed through a congressional hearing, they wanted a way to respond without worrying about that possibility. Blunt sighed. Before too long, our entire military might be a shadow organization. Besserman gave a tight-lipped smile. The irony isn't lost on me that I'm here talking to one such organization. However, Firestorm was created to address specific threats to national security without engendering ill will against our country with more precision strikes. The Pentagon created the Full Good Initiative to more or less avoid accountability. And this group has been allowed to continue? Black asked. It's never really been about permission, 
Besserman said. The Pentagon has discretionary funding, and we know that some of that money is going toward these efforts, and nobody can say a damn thing about it. So they can just run around and kill whoever they want? Shields asked. Besserman shook his head. They're not sanctioned, and if they get caught, they're subject to the laws of the land like anyone else would be. But they do run around killing people, and are pros when it comes to covering up those deaths. Why don't you just stop them? Jana asked. You can't stop something that doesn't really exist, Besserman said. Blunt shifted back and forth in his chair before sitting up straight. Any idea who's behind all this? Ever since we learned of the Full Good Initiative, we've been trying to infiltrate the organization and find out who's calling the shots, Besserman said. And from what we've been able to ascertain, there doesn't seem to be a single person making the assignments. However, we believe that Colonel Ron Marshall, who heads up the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, is likely in charge. He's got the most to gain, as well as the means to provide a viable paper trail to cover up any actions taken by Full Good. He messed with the wrong people, Shield said. I'd like to shove eight pounds of carbon fiber and titanium up his ass. Blunt held his hands up. There'll be time for that. But first we need to figure out why they wanted to stop us from addressing the uranium enrichment in Malawi. That seems like the kind of operation that would be right up their alley. Look, before you start following through with all these threats, Besserman said, understand that you have the agency's full blessing to dismantle full good. However, you must know that these men are dangerous and won't like to have their power stripped by you in this manner. You must use extreme caution in moving forward. Always, Black said. Besserman pointed at Black. You of all people need to heed this the most. Your reputation precedes you. Black smiled. I'll take that as a compliment. Just be careful. Colonel Marshall has powerful allies, Besserman said. More powerful than the president? Shields asked. Besserman shot her a sideways glance. Far more powerful than Michael's. Blunt clapped his hands. Okay, thanks for the briefing, Bobby. Now we've still got plenty more to discuss. Shields didn't wait around to engage in any of the small talk surrounding the end of a meeting. She scooped up her documents and strode back to her office, focused and on a singular mission. Where are you going so fast, Shields? Black called out after her. She didn't turn around. Got work to do. Bastards to expose. He muttered something that she couldn't make out, but she didn't care. The fact that there was a member of a government entity, the same government she worked for, out there assigning an agent to detain and threaten her, made her angrier than she'd been in a long time. Though she detested terrorists and their despicable methods, she didn't loathe them as much as she did traitors and Colonel Ron Marshall had become her target. Before her butt hit the chair, she'd already dialed the number of Mallory Kaufman, her friend at the NSA. Kaufman had become a loyal ally to Firestorm missions in the past, doling out information that helped Shields stitch together pieces of evidence. Agent Shields, Kaufman said. What a pleasant surprise. I'm surprised your burner phone is still charged, Shields said. You're not the only one who has this number. Now, what can I do for you? Based on the angst in your voice, I'm assuming this isn't a social call. No, it's not. But it is urgent. Fire away, Kaufman said. I'm trying to find out a number for Colonel Ron Marshall's burner phone. I know this might be a long shot, but not as long as you might think, Kaufman said. I just got a request to unmask Colonel Marshall from an incoming phone call by a Russian diplomat one of the agencies has been tracking. Just give me a second, and I'll access the file from my laptop. You're still at home? Shields asked. Kaufman's fingers could be heard pounding on her keyboard. Yeah, I'm working the graveyard shift this week. Now, just one more second, and... Aha, there it is. Lay it on me. Shields said. Kaufman gave Shields the number. Happy hunting. Shields dug into the data and didn't emerge until two hours later. 
When she did, she stormed into Blunt's office, where he was chewing on a cigar and talking with Black. Blunt's forehead creased as he looked up at her. Got something on Colonel Marshall for us? I got something, all right. But I'm still trying to make sense of it all, she said. Well, don't keep us in suspense, Black said. Shields glanced down at her notes. I got Marshall's burner phone number and traced all calls he made on the day Black was going out to the Malawi mine. Blunt cocked his head to one side and put a finger to his temple. And? There was one call made to a satellite phone, which I was able to determine was located in Malawi at the time. I haven't figured out who the owner of the sat phone is yet, but there's almost zero chance that's a mere coincidence. Agreed, Blunt said. And until we know more, we simply know that Marshall's involved, which is exactly what we knew when our meeting ended two hours ago. She squinted and subtly shook her head. I'm not finished. Proceed, Blunt said, gesturing for her to continue. Since Marshall rarely uses that phone, I decided to dig into his incoming and outgoing calls from his office line, Shield said. Turns out there was one placed just a few minutes before his call to Malawi. And who made that call? Blunt asked. Well, this is where it gets interesting, she said. It came from Capitol Hill. More specifically, it came from the office of Senator Ned Schwartz. Blunt sat upright, his eyes widening. Schwartz? The mining magnate from Nevada? That's the one, she said. This can't just all be one big coincidence now, can it? Black stood and moved toward the door. I saw Schwartz Corp logos and stickers plastered all over Karanga when I was there. I think we need to go pay someone a visit, Shield said. Chapter 18 Senator Ned Schwartz twirled a quarter through his fingers with one hand, while holding a report in the other. He peered hard at the numbers for a moment, before sliding the glasses off the top of his bald head and onto the bridge of his nose. After scanning them quickly, he returned his spectacles to their resting place and continued reading. He was buried deep in thought when the door to his office flung open, barely noticing the commotion brewing around him. Senator? A woman called. Senator! Schwartz raised his eyes, casting his gaze on Valerie, his trusted administrative assistant for more than two decades. I'm so sorry she explained. I tried to stop them. Schwartz glanced to Valerie's right and saw a man and a woman eyeing him closely. His face relaxed into a smile as he peeked at the clock above the door. Val, you know I always make time for constituents, he said. They aren't constituents, she said. They're journalists. Schwartz motioned toward the chairs across from his desk. I make time for them too. Please, have a seat, Mrs. Underwood, the woman said. Colleen Underwood, with the Hill website? Schwartz nodded before turning toward the man. And you are? Tim Weston, he said, also with the Hill. Schwartz furrowed his brow. That's interesting, because I've never heard of either one of you. We're both new to the beat, Underwood said. Schwartz looked at Valerie and motioned for her to leave. It's all right. I can handle it from here. She eased out of the room, pulling the door shut. Well, I'm afraid you've upset my assistant, Schwartz said. But since you're new, I'll cut you some slack. But please, for her sake as much as mine, make an appointment. I'm far more open to talking to the press when I know we're going to be engaging in a serious interview, instead of gotcha journalism. Underwood removed a pen tucked neatly away in her bun. Sir, if you think that we're here to trap you into saying something, Schwartz raised his hands. I'm not trying to be adversarial here. However, I do want to make a point with the two of you, since you're both new, that we'll all have a much better conversation if I'm prepared, especially regarding the topic on your mind. Weston shrugged. Well, our questions for you this afternoon don't have anything to do with a topic you need to prepare for. If you don't know the answers to these questions, we have far more serious issues to write about. Schwartz sighed. 
In that case, fire away. But make it quick. I have a meeting in 15 minutes. Okay, Underwood began. Your mining company has a large international presence. What can you tell me about your mining activities in Malawi? Schwartz narrowed his eyes. Is this some kind of setup? Sir, I'm just asking you a simple question, Underwood replied. It certainly doesn't sound that way, he said. What my colleague is asking should be able to be answered simply, Weston said. That is, unless there's something to hide. My mine? We don't own any mines in Malawi that I'm aware of. We sell equipment all over the world. And if some of it happened to end up in Malawi, that doesn't mean it belongs to me. Deny it all you want, Underwood said. But your mine in Malawi is helping enemies of this country. And if you don't know how you're doing that, I'll be more than happy to inform you. Schwartz turned his focus toward the wall gazing at the shadow box displaying his purple heart from Vietnam. He then looked down at his hand and rubbed the nub where his pinky used to be. Do you know how I lost my finger? He asked. Schwartz didn't wait for Underwood or Weston to reply. One night I was on a reconnaissance mission in the La Drang Valley when one of my fellow soldiers stepped on a landmine, Schwartz said. We both froze when we heard the click. But before I could help him, he shifted his weight, setting off the charge. Seconds later, I barely felt the shrapnel that ripped my finger off, as I was in shock from looking at my friend's body blasted all over the jungle. Now, I tell you this story not to garner any kind of sympathy from you, but to emphasize how much I sacrificed for this country. You'll be hard-pressed to find someone on Capitol Hill who loves these United States more than I do. We're not questioning your patriotism, sir, Underwood said. But we are concerned about profiting off a mining operation that is simultaneously posing a threat to our national security. Schwartz huffed. You two have no idea what it takes to keep this country safe. And I can assure you that the last thing I'd ever do is put the safety of Americans at risk. Respectfully, sir, the actions at your mine in Malawi say otherwise, Underwood said. I don't own any mines in Malawi, Schwartz said with a growl. And even if I did, our mines aren't munitions plants. They're simply a place where you dig for rare metals, some of which are vital in producing revolutionary new medical machines, the kind that will save lives, not destroy them. If you don't want to address the uranium being enriched there, that's fine, Weston said but we'd prefer to get a comment from you on the record before we run. Enriching uranium isn't a crime, you know, Schwartz interrupted. But that's not happening at any of my mines. Underwood arched an eyebrow. So your mines are designed to search for rare metals as well as enrich uranium? Mine facilities can have more than one purpose, Schwartz said. But I've found that focusing on one thing makes for a far more productive operation. However, where we do mine for metals that could be considered dangerous, we have top-notch security teams that ensure all such products are secured so that they don't fall into the wrong hands. Weston glanced down at his notebook. Our sources say, Your sources are wrong, Schwartz said. Now, I've got a busy afternoon, and I've been more than generous in giving you my valuable time to answer your questions. Now, if you don't mind seeing your way out, I'd appreciate it. After the reporters left, Schwartz leaned back in his chair, seething for a couple minutes. The gall of those two. It's unbelievable. Schwartz glanced at his planner for a moment before slamming it shut. He grabbed his briefcase and left his office. Sir, where are you going? Valerie asked. You've got an appointment in 15 minutes. Cancel my meetings for the rest of the day. Schwartz said. Something's come up. Okay, she said. Is everything all right? Everything's fine, Val. I'll see you tomorrow. He watched her frantically shuffling papers on her desk before closing the door. Valerie was an organized assistant who ran a tight schedule, but when everything was interrupted, she didn't handle a sudden change very well. 
Schwartz smiled at the scene he'd just witnessed as he marched down the hall. Dad? What's up? Schwartz's eldest son, Kyle, stood by the door with a furrowed brow. Oh, nothing you need to worry about, the senator said. Just a couple of troublemaking reporters. Somebody stirring stuff up for you? asked Kyle, who was serving as his father's chief of staff. It's called a day that ends in Y in Washington, Schwartz said, trying to keep his son from worrying. I'll talk to you later about everything tonight. However, once Schwartz exited his office, his eyes narrowed. He needed to have a serious conversation with someone at the Pentagon. Chapter 19 Shields waited until she and Black were in the car, before she removed her glasses and let her hair down. She flung her notebook onto the dashboard and let out a string of expletives. Slumping down in her seat, she clenched her fists and let out a short scream. Black pushed the ignition button as the engine roared to life. She caught him casting a sideways glance at her. What? she said curtly. A faint smile appeared on Black's face. I know I probably shouldn't feel this way, but I really like the pissed off Shields. This isn't funny, Shields said. That bastard straight lied to our faces in there. Did you really expect him to tell us the truth? Or even get trapped telling a lie? Black asked. Schwartz is a politician. He hasn't lasted in office this long without having some smooth talking skills to avoid saying something that will get him in trouble with the press. Besides, Schwartz Corp doesn't officially own any property in Malawi. I checked. Everything there is owned by a company called Kingston Limited. I know Schwartz is lying. That's how he's lasted in office as long as he has. He's been telling bald-faced lies and doling out favors to his donors. Black nodded. You mean, he's just like every other elected official in Washington? No, that's not what I mean, she said with a huff. Schwartz is different. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you were holding a personal grudge of some sort against him. Have you ever had any run-ins with him before? Is that why you were so adamant that we approach him in disguise? Shields set her jaw and shook her head subtly. If you only knew... Black shrugged. Well, we're stuck in traffic for at least the next half hour. Why don't you tell me about your history with him? Fine, she said as she sat upright and then leaned her head back against her seat. If you really want to hear it, I'll tell you. I'm all ears. Shields closed her eyes and took a deep breath before continuing. When I was growing up near the Okefenokee in Georgia... Some hunter named Francis Calhoun stumbled on oil bubbling out of the ground, just like Jed Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies. Black snickered. Yeah, I know, she said. It's funny, but that's life in the swamp for you. Anyway, Calhoun decided to cash in on this big discovery on the edge of his property. And as you might imagine, word spread pretty quickly. This guy was living in a cinder block house with a roof that looked like it might collapse any minute. His yard looked like a graveyard of cars from the 70s, including two El Caminos, an early model Honda Civic, and a rusted-out Volkswagen Beetle. Did he have any of those pink flamingos near his mailbox? Black asked. No, but he did line his driveway with painted white tires buried halfway into the ground. Fancy. Yeah, Calhoun's yard was the pride of Charlton County. So you get the picture. Black nodded and grinned. Crystal clear. So once Calhoun noticed this, he calls a buddy who knows somebody who knows somebody. And before we know it, someone from Schwartz is out investigating the oil leaking out of the ground, which is less than 50 yards from a popular lake. Wouldn't you want that oil out of there so it didn't leak into the water? Of course, Shield said. I didn't have a problem with that. It's what Schwartz officials did next that ruined everything. They started knocking on every door, asking if they could inspect each person's property, basically prospecting for oil. By that point, everybody saw Francis Calhoun abandon his property by selling it to Schwartz for a hefty sum. The rumors ranged from his payout being a seven-figure sum 
to as much as a healthy eight-figure amount. I'm not sure how much he got paid, but everyone saw him driving a brand new pickup truck in town, along with a $50,000 boat behind it. Living large in the Okefenokee, Black quipped. Was he also swilling yingling beer as he drove through town? No matter how much money Calhoun had, I doubt there's anything that would make him ditch PBR. But I digress. Now, once everybody saw how wealthy Schwartz made Calhoun, they all wanted a piece of the action. Suddenly, the area was awash with the company's reps, searching for more oil wells. Most of the spots were near the small spring-fed lake, the one I used to practice on in order to become the junior barefoot skiing champion of Charlton County. Fun fact I didn't know about you. She gave him a tight-lipped smile. Anyway, after a couple of months, one well ruptured and started leaking into the water. In a matter of weeks, all the fish were dead, and the area looked more like a scene from a post-apocalyptic movie than a once thriving recreation area. In the end, all the property values plummeted, and most people moved because of what happened. And what happened to our friend, Mr. Calhoun? Aside from becoming the most hated man in Charlton County, he squandered all his money in less than two years. The last time I went home to visit my dad, Calhoun was living in a dilapidated shack on the edge of town, with a few inoperable boats to go along with a more newly updated graveyard of cars. So, you hate Schwartz because of this? Wouldn't you? She asked, shaking her head in disgust. Schwartz blew into town without going through all the proper channels, in an effort to take advantage of a country bumpkin and make some money. They bought their way out of it in a class action settlement from all the people who lived around the lake, but I guarantee you Schwartz still made out like a bandit. It still makes me so angry when I think about it, even today. And you're holding Senator Schwartz personally responsible? Black asked. It's his company, with his own name on it. If he didn't want this type of stuff going on, he should be more cautious in how he manages his business. If he allows this predatory practice to continue, I can only assume that he approves of it. Thinking that he's ignorant of what's taking place under his nose is a naive response at best. Black stroked his chin with one hand as he maneuvered through a detour with the other. I understand why you feel the way you do about Senator Schwartz, but none of this should carry over into how we handle the current situation we're facing. That bastard only cares about his bottom line. He's dangerous, and now his greed is putting our country's safety at risk. Those are heavy accusations to bring against Schwartz. He's well-connected and won't be so easy to bring down. We better make damn sure we have rock-solid proof of his personal involvement and knowledge before we start making these claims. Don't you worry, Shield said. He won't buy his way out of this one. What are you thinking? I'm thinking we need to go investigate Schwartz Corp's headquarters in Vegas and conduct a covert investigation. Sin City, here we come. Chapter 20 Blunt relaxed in his chair as he waited in his usual spot for President Michaels to join him. The routine of keeping their meetings shielded from public view had become comfortable even as Blunt loathed the inconvenience of it all. Ultimately, he understood the importance of making sure prying eyes weren't able to connect the two men together, other than at social gatherings. While waiting for Michaels to arrive, Blunt pulled out a cigar and started gnawing on it. The habit he developed that helped him quit smoking many years ago had since morphed into a new one. Whenever he needed to mull over something, he chewed on a cigar when the door flung open, a Secret Service agent walked inside and scanned the room before making way for the president. Blunt leaned on his cane to stand up. Michaels waved him off. Oh, come on, J.D. No need to get up for me. Blunt grunted. I've never disrespected the commander-in-chief, and I'm not about to start now just because it's not as easy as it used to be to get up. Michaels peered at Blunt's cane. Is that new? Good eye, Blunt said. It's my new toy from an engineer we stole from Mossad, who we're given a trial run. Michaels gave Blunt a long look, 
before taking a seat. You stole her from Assad? Please don't create more trouble for me than necessary. Maybe stole isn't the right word, Blunt said. She came on her own volition, but only after we rescued her when Massad left her behind. That little detail certainly changes the story. Blunt eased into a smile. Well, let's not waste any more time on that. I know you're busy. And I can see that you're stressed, Michael said, gesturing toward Blunt's cigar. Stressed? Michaels nodded. The more you work that thing over in your mouth the more bothered you are by something. It's your tell. I'd whip you six ways from Sunday if I ever played you in poker. I'm not trying to hide anything, but I am very concerned about something I just learned. And what's that? What do you know about the full good initiative? Blunt asked. Michaels cocked his head to one side and frowned. The full good initiative? Yeah, that's right. Ever heard of it? I can't say that I have, but I'll ask around about it. I'd be careful about that if I were you. Michael squinted. I'm the president of this country, and I shouldn't have to be careful about asking about something like that. Mind telling me what's so dangerous about this organization? That's what I'm trying to figure out, Blunt said. All I know at this point is that they are run by some people at the Pentagon. And what exactly do these people do? Like I said, my knowledge is limited. However, I know that they tried to kill two of my agents this week. And if it hadn't been for a freelancer I hired, those two would be dead. Which two? Black and... That wouldn't be so bad now, would it? Michaels quipped. I know you don't like him, but he has saved your life a couple of times. I thought you were past your petty feud with him. Anyway... You were saying that you don't know much about them other than they tried to kill two of your people and are controlled by someone at the Pentagon. That's right, Blunt said. But there is one more thing. And what's that? When Black and Shields were apprehended by this full good agent, he inquired about Black's presence in Malawi. I'm assuming he was there on a mission. Blunt nodded. A very important one. We have credible intelligence that claims the Iranians are enriching uranium there and transporting it into the country. You have proof of this? That's what Black was in Malawi to find. Why would they want him stopped? Michael shook his head. I don't know. It sounds like the beginning of a conspiracy theory to me. Just ask around and see if anybody knows anything about him. I've been told that Colonel Ron Marshall at the Pentagon is running this group, but I have no definitive proof that he is. Just speculation at this point. I'll see what I can do, Michael said. But in the meantime, I want you to lay low. Your stunt on television wasn't exactly what I had in mind when I had one of my aides call you to tell you to stay out of the limelight. Blunt grunted. I won't allow Roberts to trample my honor. That man is a snake in the grass if I've ever seen one. I'm not sure what his endgame is, but I can promise you that it isn't to assist with your administration's agenda. I'm very well aware of what Roberts' agenda is, which is simple to define. It's his own. He's got a bone to pick with most of Washington, and he's doing a pretty good job of getting what he wants. I mean, you ever remember somebody getting on so many major committees this early? It's obvious what he's up to. That's why I refuse to let him be the one who dictates the narrative for my legacy and what I'm really about. Fine, Michael said. But you better not get too far out in the weeds with him and lose sight of what needs to be done. It sounds like you have more serious issues to handle than defending your honor. If push comes to shove, I'll stick up for you. Thank you, sir, Blunt said. Is there anything else you want to discuss with me? Nothing at the moment. Just be careful out there. Always. Michaels exited the room, leaving Blunt to sit alone for a few minutes before returning to his office. He chewed more vigorously on his cigar before finally receiving the all-clear signal to vacate the room. Following the Secret Service agent's directive, Blunt rose to his feet and then meandered down the hall. He entered the tunnel 
finally emerging in the underground parking garage. As he headed for his car, he wondered if Michaels was being truthful about his knowledge of the Full Good Initiative. That also made Blunt consider if the president acted likewise if ever confronted about Firestorm. No matter what Blunt decided was more likely, he wasn't confident about anything, especially with Michaels. His constant dithering on positions made him a challenge to predict. When Blunt reached his vehicle, he dug into his pocket to pull out his keys. He mindlessly clicked the button that unlocked the door. However, he was so engrossed in his thoughts that he didn't immediately see the man leaning against the passenger side door. You gonna give me a ride, Senator? The man asked. Blunt jerked his head toward the sound of the man's voice. Who are you? The man walked slowly around toward Blunt. We need to talk, sir. Hold it right there, Blunt said, placing his hand out, palm toward the oncoming man. The man stopped. I just want to talk. How'd you find me here? Much less get in here, Blunt asked. That isn't any of your concern right now. I have far more pressing issues at the moment. The man put his hands on his hips, pushing back the flaps of his jacket as he did, and revealing the weapon strapped to his belt. Blunt glanced at the man's gun and scowled. Is this some kind of threat? He asked. I'm not trying to threaten you at all. We need to talk. Blunt eased toward his vehicle, opening the driver's side door with his back to the car. I'm warning you. Get away from me. This is a conversation we need to have in private, not shouted in a parking garage, he said, eyeing Blunt closely. Instead of panicking, Blunt carefully raised his cane and reordered the man to back away. However, he didn't budge. Instead, he moved a couple of feet closer. That's far enough, Blunt said. The man scowled. Get in the car. We need to talk. Blunt barely flinched before squeezing the trigger on his cane, delivering a swift tranquilizer dart to the man's chest. In a matter of seconds, he collapsed to the ground in a heap. Blunt pulled out his phone and dialed Jana Shadid's number. Good afternoon, sir, Jana said. What can I help you with? I'm texting you some coordinates. I need you to meet me somewhere. What's happening? She asked. Just hurry and bring Edge if he's still there, Blunt said. I need help with a body. Chapter 21 Las Vegas, Nevada. The next afternoon, Black strolled into the Palms Casino Resort with shields, both sporting sunglasses and lugging their suitcases behind them. Within seconds, a bellhop hustled over to them and had their bags on a cart. He directed them toward the check-in counter, before hustling over toward the far wall near the elevators. A concierge approached them with a tray loaded with full champagne glasses. Ma'am, sir? Would either of you care for a drink? He asked. Of course, Shields said, snatching a glass off the tray. Black did likewise, before the duo clinked glasses. Wide smiles spread across their faces as they waited to be called over to the next available reservation agent. I could get used to this, Shields said. What exactly could you get used to? Black asked. The bottomless champagne or the posh interior of this place? Do I really have to choose? She asked. Black shrugged. I guess not. The world's your oyster. A man signaled for them to approach his counter. He tilted his head to one side and gave them a tight-lipped smile. Good afternoon and welcome to the Palms, he said. Do you have reservations with us? Of course, Black said before giving the man their information. Five minutes later, they were in their room. Shields cut her eyes toward the couch. That's your spot. Black sighed. I never catch a break. It's not my fault that this was the only room available. We could have stayed at Circus Circus. No, this is fine, Black said. Just get your things put up so we can go meet our contact. When Black and Shields entered the FBI offices, Special Agent Corey Hughes was waiting in the lobby for them. He worked over a piece of gum while fiddling with a dark tie, slung loosely around his neck. 
I was just about to call it a day, Hughes said as he offered his hand. I wasn't sure you guys were still coming. Black and Shields both shook it, before following his lead into a nearby conference room. I apologize for our tardiness, Shields said. We had some issues with our plane. Hughes nodded. I understand. Flying private aircraft isn't always what it's cracked up to be sometimes. Well, thank you for waiting on us, Black said. Based on your call yesterday, I could tell this sounded serious, Hughes said. I'm happy to help fellow federal agents, especially ones that aren't bound by the strict limitations that I have. You mean like the law? Shields asked, as the trio sat down at a conference table. Hughes chuckled. It would be nice if we could just go in and arrest some of these bastards without due process. The number of loopholes that they find is absolutely maddening. We don't get any special privileges when it comes to gathering the amount of evidence we need to prosecute criminals, Black said. Just because we don't officially exist doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want. Then where's the fun in that? Hughes asked. I'd love to get away with the junk you guys do. To never get my hand slapped would be a dream. Oh, believe me, we still get our hands slapped, Black said. Shields cast him a sideways glance. Speak for yourself. Black shrugged. Okay, I get my hand slapped plenty for the both of us. Hughes leaned forward, his hands clasped and resting in front of him. So, how can I help you with the Schwartz Corporation? You sounded eager to assist with our inquiry. Shields said. I have mixed feelings right now, to be honest, Hughes said. I've been trying to put these bastards away for the better part of three years. But so far, no dice. I'm not sure we're going to be the ones to do that either, Black said. We're simply attempting to learn more about Schwartz Corp itself and track some of its overseas operations. They have quite a presence abroad, Hughes said. I'm not sure you'll be able to nail them on anything like that since the company is quite guarded about what it does abroad. But that only makes me think there's more going on than we know about. Shields raised an eyebrow. Is that so? Hughes nodded. Yeah, but our time might be more beneficial if you could tell me a few more specifics about what you're looking for. Black dug out a couple pictures from a file folder he'd brought with him and slid them across the table to Hughes. We want to know more about this mining installation in Malawi. Are you up to speed on this? This is outside Karanga, right? Hughes asked as he pointed at the photo. That's the one, Black said. I wasn't aware there were any others in Malawi. There aren't, Hughes replied as he eased the picture back to them. But there has been talk of building a second one south of Karanga. Shields picked up the image and inspected it. We want to know what you know about this one. Hughes took a deep breath and leaned back in his chair. It was a big deal in Malawi that a large multinational corporation from the U.S. was investing there. But here it went largely unnoticed. And other than the little controversy about who Schwartz hired to run the facility, the whole thing happened rather quietly. Controversy? Black asked. Yeah, Malawi officials wanted more of their own people hired to management positions in the initial phases. But it wasn't a big deal. The Schwartz leadership made a public commitment to hire more Malawians as the operation began to expand, and to my knowledge, they followed through on it. So, this organization is keeping its nose clean, then? Shields asked. There's something else going on, Hughes said. I just haven't been able to pinpoint it yet. What do you mean? Black asked. They are very forthright about all they're doing in the U.S., but it's like they almost don't want anyone to know about their operations abroad. Like I said, you probably wouldn't notice or even think much of it on the surface. But for someone like myself, who's been investigating this organization for as long as I have, something's amiss. I guarantee it. If they're hiding something, Shields here is a whiz at cracking into networks, Black said. It wouldn't be that easy, you said. If it was, I would have been in a long time ago. Besides, Ted Porter, the company's CEO, is a paper guy. Meaning, Shield said as she drew out the word. Meaning Porter doesn't keep any sensitive information on his computer, Hughes said. He's old school. So there's a literal paper trail? Shields asked. Hughes nodded. 
All you gotta do is know where to look. You'll be able to walk right out of there with it. However, it doesn't matter how incriminating that information is. None of it will be admissible in court. Unless we give it to you, Black said. Good point, you said. I might be able to tell you where in the building it is, but getting inside could pose a problem for us. Black shook his head. Don't you worry about that. I've got it covered. Are you sure? Shields asked. Black nodded emphatically. We'll be in and out with all the information we need before we know it. And a little birdie will pay you a visit and drop all the evidence you need into your lap. Hughes clapped and then rubbed his hands together. I like the sound of this. Black turned to Shields. I hope you weren't planning on running the blackjack table tonight. Why's that? We've got a big night ahead of us, Black said. And an even bigger morning tomorrow. Chapter 22 Undisclosed Location, Virginia Blunt endured several minutes of pounding on the trunk, coupled with demands to be released from his new prisoner. While Blunt considered the possibility that he may have overreacted, he always trusted his instincts in a high-pressured situation, and he decided incapacitating the mystery man was a better outcome than taking a couple of bullets. Come on, Senator Blunt, the man said, his pleading continuing. I just want to talk. Ignoring the man, Blunt paced around the wooded property of the Firestorm safe house. Dusk fell as fireflies began ascending. He pulled out a cigar and started to chew on it. For the moment, his captives stopped begging, as the forest's evening symphony consisted of an even mix of chirping, croaking, and hooting. Blunt hated being blindsided, and it had already happened twice since agreeing to help out Massad to extract Jana Shadid. Meeting resistance in Malawi was bad enough, but then to get cornered in an underground parking garage? Blunt's team had obviously stumbled into something, but he wasn't about to let go until he found out what was going on. And the more effort the Full Good Initiative put into stopping him, the more determined Blunt had grown. In the distance, he heard tires crunching on gravel. Blunt spun around to see Edge driving his black Camaro slowly toward the house with Jana riding shotgun. When they got out, Edge pulled out his weapon and shoved it into the back of his pants. I hope that won't be necessary, Blunt said, eyeing Edge's gun. Always be prepared, Edge said. Now, do you mind telling us why you dragged us all the way out here? You sounded so urgent when you called, Jana said. The pounding on the trunk resumed, along with the calls to be released. That's why I called. Blunt said, cutting his eyes toward his vehicle. Who is he? Edge asked. That's what I'm hoping you'll help me find out. Blunt unlocked the trunk, revealing a man bound with zip ties around his wrists and ankles. I just wanted to talk, the man said as he scowled. This is all so unnecessary. I was assigned to deliver a message to you, and... Blunt slammed down the trunk as muffled cries continued. All those zip ties and you didn't have anything to gag him with? Edge asked, shaking his head. That would have been the first thing I did to someone who talks like that. He wasn't saying anything when I hoisted him into my car, Blunt said, casting a quick glance at Jana and winking. Her face lit up. Did you use your new cane? Blunt nodded. Worked like a charm. This guy was out cold in about three seconds. Outstanding, she said. Sounded like it worked better than it did when I was testing it. But he's talking now, which is what we want, Blunt said. I've got more than a few questions for this punk. Blunt and Edge discussed how they were going to set up the interrogation before transferring the prisoner into the house. Once they had him settled into a chair, Blunt sat down opposite the man. The firestorm director cocked his head to one side, resting his chin on the palm of his hand. This is ridiculous, the man said. There's no need for you to treat me like this. I just want to have a conversation with you. What's your name? Blunt asked. Tom. Do you have a last name, Tom? Smith. 
So this is how it's going to be? I ask you questions and you feed me lies? Why do you immediately think my name is a lie? I just want to make sure you understand the ground rules for this interrogation, Blunt said. All I want is for you to be honest with me. If you aren't, I'll let my friend here teach you some manners. And I can promise you, you don't want him involved. The man's eyes cut over toward Edge, who smirked while cracking his knuckles. Okay, the prisoner said, throwing his hands in the air. My name is Will Tuttle. Happy now? Maybe, Mr. Tuttle, Blunt said. Or maybe you just got a little more creative than Tom Smith. And while I do care about your name, I'm more concerned with the names of the people who sent you. I get it. You think I'm dangerous and that I've been sent to harm you. But let me tell you the truth. I'm here for your own good. Blunt's eyebrow eased upward. Is that so? I was actually sent to warn you, Tuttle said. Warn me? About what? I work at the Pentagon, and I was instructed to deliver a message to you, though I was told you might be combative. Blunt chuckled. So, somebody at the Pentagon knows me well. Edge laughed as well. That's a well-documented fact in Washington. Yeah, Tuttle said. You didn't disappoint in that area. So what's the message? Blunt asked. Someone in the Full Good Initiative is after you, Tuttle said. Is this supposed to be news to me? Blunt asked. I just recently learned about this organization, but they seem to know a hell of a lot about me, and apparently I've done something to piss them off. Tuttle nodded. That's right. So what did I do? Tuttle shrugged. I'm just the messenger here. You don't work for the Full Good Initiative? Blunt asked. Tuttle glanced over both his shoulders, as if he was looking around for someone listening in. I hear whispers, but I don't really know much. Someone called me this afternoon while I was couriering over some documents to the White House. They asked me to give you a message, a warning about Full Good. And who exactly gave you this order? I was told not to tell, sir, Tuttle said. This person fears his own life and wanted to protect me as well. Blunt huffed. Likely story. Unfortunately for you, it's not as easy as simply saying you can't tell me who told you that, because I'm not letting you leave until you do. You don't understand, sir, Tuttle said, angst washing over his face. If I give you that information, this person will know that I said something. It's your choice, Blunt said before nodding at Edge. He's all yours. Edge grinned as he marched toward the man. Should I start with his face or his knees? Okay, okay. I'm not a tough guy. Just a messenger. I'll tell you what you want to know. Blunt held up a finger, signaling for them to pause. He thought he saw a flicker of lights outside the mountain cabin and meandered over to the window to investigate. What is it? Jana asked. Blunt peered through the curtains. I don't know, but I'd swear I saw headlights. They must have found me, Tuttle said. Who's they? Blunt asked as he moved back toward his prisoner. The Full Good Initiative, Tuttle said his voice barely louder than a whisper. Someone must have been following me, or they tracked me here. Damn it, Blunt said. We're running out of time. Tell me who sent you, or I'm going to leave you strapped to this chair. It was General Ryan Carmichael, Tuttle said. He's the one who called and asked me to give you that message. That's curious, Blunt said. Curious, Edge said. Blunt nodded. Yeah, General Carmichael hates my guts. Tuttle's eyes widened. Don't look at me like that, and don't shoot the messenger. Blunt unlatched one of the restraints on Tuttle's arms, as Edge kept his weapon trained on their prisoner. Nice and easy, Edge said. Now, I want to know why you were at the White House, Blunt said. Tuttle rubbed his wrists as Blunt moved to help his captive to his feet. I told you that I was just delivering some documents. By whose orders? Blunt asked. 
Colonel Marshall, Tuttle said. Edge and Blunt locked eyes, both looking at each other knowingly. None of this makes sense, Blunt said. I agree, and... The conversation was interrupted as bullets peppered the room. Blunt, Edge, and Janna dove to the floor. While lying down, Blunt quickly unlatched Tuttle's foot restraints. But by the time Blunt freed the Pentagon employee, he was dead from two shots to the head. Blunt let out a string of expletives. This was a setup. We've got to get the hell out of here. Chapter 23 Las Vegas, Nevada while reading up on the Schwartz Corporation, Black discovered something important about one of the company's strategic partnerships. As Schwartz Corp began expanding its mining empire and venturing into less stable countries, security needed to be increased tenfold. Unsure of what to do, Ned Schwartz reached out to Tom Colton, the founder and CEO of Colton Industries. Black knew from several previous missions that Blunt had a close relationship with Tom one that rose above any monetary agreement the two companies had. And when Black needed a favor regarding Colton Industries, he was confident Blunt could cash it in. Shield stared down at her access badge. Really? You gave me the name Millie Muller? That sounds like something from a children's picture book. Black chuckled. I didn't pick the legends, so direct your ire at Blunt, not me. She growled and cast him a sideways glance. I see that smirk hiding beneath your tight lips. Black refused to crack, even though he was howling with laughter on the inside. He figured she'd forgive him one day when she found out the truth. I know you're full of it, she said, especially when you get a name like John Banks. I think I can rest my case. Take it up with Blunt, Black said, doing his best to keep from revealing his guilt and coming up with Shields' name. I'm gonna kill you she said. I'm going to take you to the shooting range again, but instead of blasting away at targets, I'll turn on you. Okay, Millie, Black said with a wry smile before they completed a check of their comms. The duo got out of their rental car and headed toward the front doors of the Schwartz Corp headquarters. Located just inside the city limits, the facility utilized architecture that resembled that of a mountain. With a front facade that towered above the rest of the building, Windows looked like portholes carved into the rock face. Snaking around the top were rails with a small train of mining carts, a nod to the industry's history. Looks like a ride at Disneyland, Shield said as she gazed skyward. You couldn't pay me enough money to get me on a ride like that, Black said. Really? Of all the things you've seen, that scares you? He shrugged. I hate heights. And the ocean, she said. Come to think of it, is there any place you do like? A mountain ridge with a dozen hostels, he said with a wink. Well, today we're facing a CEO and an administrative assistant, she said. Think you can handle that? Black held the door open and gestured for her to go inside. After you. Ever the gentleman, she said before stopping and leaning in close, her voice little more than a whisper. The scared gentleman but a gentleman nonetheless. Once inside, they were stopped by a guard who directed them toward a security gate. Black and Shields placed their belongings on a conveyor belt before being waved inside. A man waved a wand over them and then motioned for them to proceed. The pair went over to the reception area and spoke with a woman who wore a headset while typing on her keyboard. Shields cleared her throat to get the attention of the woman. Oh, I'm sorry she said. Can I help you? Yes, we're here to see Ted Porter, Shields said. Of course, let me ring his office. What time was your appointment? We don't have one, Black said. I see, the woman said as she hung up the phone. In that case, you're going to need to come back once you've scheduled a time to meet. Mr. Porter is very busy and doesn't take walk-ins. Call back to his office and tell him we're with security for Colton Industries, Shields said. We're not leaving until we see him. The receptionist smirked. That's not how this works, honey. Shield shrugged. Then I'll let you be the one to tell him that his $200 million contract is getting pulled 
because he failed to allow a spot inspection. Whoa, 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 the receptionist said. Just a minute. Black and Shield stepped away from the desk and waited. Nice work, Black said under his breath. Very convincing. Excuse me, the receptionist said as she held her phone against her chest. What were your names again? Millie Muller and John Banks from Colton HQ, security team, Shield said. After the woman finished her conversation, she turned back to the two visitors. Someone from Mr. Porter's office will be down momentarily. Black and Shield stood in silence while studying their surroundings. A few minutes later, a man dressed in a suit got off the elevator and approached them. Miss Muller, Mr. Banks. The pair nodded. Follow me, please, the man said before introducing himself as Nigel, Ted Porter's administrative assistant. Thank you for responding so quickly, Shield said. Your receptionist could play goalie for the Blackhawks. She's not letting anything through. You can never be too cautious in this day and age, Nigel said. I would have been up here sooner, but I had to verify your employment with Colton, per protocol. That's understandable, Black said. Otherwise, you would have flunked the security check before we even arrived. Nigel nodded. I'm very well aware of protocol, even though other members of your team were here just a few weeks ago. When you manufacture sensitive equipment like we do, you can never be too safe, Shield said. Nigel offered a faint smile. Of course. Once the elevator reached the top floor, the trio exited. Nigel led them into Porter's office, where the Schwartz CEO stood with his back to the door while overlooking the company's spacious campus. When he turned around, Black knew they would have a tough time getting anything out of Porter. Aside from a stern demeanor, he was bald except for a small tuft of hair hanging on up top. To Black, that was a sign of stubbornness. Porter invited Black and Shields to have a seat before lighting up a cigar. Back so soon? Porter asked. I'm beginning to think someone at Colton Industries doesn't trust us anymore. Shields tucked a pencil into her bun. You can never be too careful these days. Besides... It's not you that we're worried about, as much as it is those intrepid interlopers from China trying to steal all our technology. As you know, our cybersecurity team is the best, bar none, Porter said. It also helps when you keep the majority of your most sensitive information on paper. Shields tapped her temple and shot a look at Black. Now that's a thinking man right there. Porter sat down and leaned forward. So... What is it you're interested in this time? Well, sir, Black began. We were interested in how you were using the ultrasonic blaster in your minds, and how well it was being guarded. Porter frowned. We're just rolling it out now in some of the mines we're exploring. Black tapped his pen on his notepad. And where exactly are those mines? That's a good question, Porter said. We have mines all over the world. We only gave you three of them. Shield said. Porter leaned back and blew a plume of smoke upward out of the corner of his mouth. I believe it's in our mines in the Congo, Lesotho, and Malawi, but let me double check on that. Take your time, Shield said. This is important. The Schwartz CEO sifted through some papers in his desk. After a brief, unsuccessful search, he excused himself, retreating to a door in the back of his office. He entered a four-number combination, which Black noted, before disappearing inside. Did you get that? Black whispered. Shields nodded as she pointed to the four digits on her pad. That's it, Black mouthed. Seconds later, Porter emerged with a folder, hoisting it into the air. Found it. And were you right? Shields asked. His face cracked into a smile for the first time. I should know by now not to doubt myself. Okay, Shield said. That's good to know. We just need to learn a little bit more about the precautions you're taking to ensure that those devices remain in your possession at all times. Everything you'll want to know is located in this file, Porter said. I'll just need to get a duplicate copy made for you. He depressed a button on his desk phone. Nigel, can you please come in here for a moment? 
I've got something I need you to do for us. Nigel entered the room and took instructions from Porter, before darting out again. Now, where were we? Porter asked. Black broke into a coughing fit. He tried to speak between coughs, but couldn't get many intelligible words out. Are you all right? Porter asked. Black shook his head, trying to respond between coughs. I need some water. Then come with me, Porter said as he stood. I'll show you where the water fountain is. Black followed Porter down the hall, slowing down the trip by stopping and coughing. While he stalled, Shields would go to work. Just keep him occupied, Shields said over the comms. This might take me some time to figure out where the financial documents are. Black hid his, Roger that, response in a couple of coughs. Are you sure I can't get you anything else? Porter asked, placing his hand on Black's back as he hunched over with his hands on his knees. Something must have really gotten down into your lungs to send you in a coughing fit like that. Black held one hand up in the air before he started a new round of coughs. Keep stalling, Shield said. I'm still looking. Black did his best, continuing the charade for several minutes before he decided he couldn't go on any longer without being unable to convince Porter that a doctor was necessary. Black, I still need a few more minutes, Shields said over the comms. I think you finally kicked it, Porter said. Yes, Black said. Finally. Now, let's get back to your office before my partner thinks that we've abandoned her. Black hoped that Shields received the message. Shields cursed under her breath once she heard Black signal that they were returning. She had just found the filing cabinet that contained all of Schwartz Corp's international contracts. It was a veritable jackpot, but she needed some very specific info and couldn't just take everything. In about a minute, she's going to start wondering where we are, and maybe even call your security, Black said. It shouldn't take us longer than that to get back to my office, Porter said. So we'll be there in about a minute? Black asked. We'll be there before you know it. Excellent, Black said. I hate it when she worries about me. Shields fumbled through the folder. The door was open, and she could hear footsteps headed her way. I don't have it yet, she said. There was no answer. Just more footsteps. Seconds later, the lights flickered out and then the door to Porter's filing room was pulled shut. Chapter 24 Undisclosed Location, Virginia Smoke filled the safe house as Blunt tried to get his wits about him. He couldn't have imagined that he was being set up when he saw the stranger standing by his vehicle in the White House parking garage. If anything... Blunt figured he had the advantage over whoever was attempting to assail him. Blunt was still prone on the floor when he looked over and saw Tuttle's lifeless body just a couple feet away. He probably wasn't even wittingly part of all this. A damn shame. As Blunt regrouped, he saw a canister fly into the room through the open window. Everybody out now, Blunt said. Jana and Edge scrambled out of the room with Blunt right behind them. He didn't get all the way out before the flashbang went off, disorienting him again. His ears rang as he tried to focus. Before he could move, someone grabbed his arms and yanked him into the hallway. Blunt looked up to see Edge's face. You don't think I'm letting you go down like this, do you? Edge asked. No, Blunt grunted. That's right, Edge said. Me quitting is as likely as a blizzard in July. Now I'm betting you've got an escape route, and this would be a great time to tell us where that is. Blunt took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. He scanned the area and snatched his cane off the ground. Does that have a special kind of key in there or something? Edge asked. No, I need it to get up so we can hustle out of here. More bullets whizzed through the house. From the looks of things, we're going to have to shoot our way out of this, Edge said. Looks can be deceiving, Blunt said. An explosion rocked the house. Edge peered around the corner. Now our ride is gone. 
Not that we were getting away in it, he said. I hope you've got a good backup plan. Always, Blunt said. Follow me. The firestorm director crawled on his hands and knees down the hallway to the master bedroom. Once there, he ushered the two agents into the closet, where he pulled up on a handle from a latch coming out of the carpet. The floor lifted, revealing a stairwell beneath the house. Where does this go? Jana asked. Secret passageway, Blunt said. Go ahead. I promise you'll be fine. Jana went first, followed by Blunt, who Edge insisted go before him. Edge held a flashlight up, illuminating their path. After a short walk, they reached an iron ladder. What's up there? Edge asked. My backup plan, Blunt replied. The trio ascended the steps and seconds later found themselves standing in a garage, burrowed out of the side of a hill. Blunt flipped on the lights. We still have to drive off this property, don't we? Edge asked. Blunt shook his head. This takes us out a back way. They'll never see us leave. The only question now is whether or not we take the Land Rover or the Jeep. Land Rover, Jana and Edge said in unison. They all climbed inside, Edge volunteering to drive. Blunt sat in the front seat to navigate, as well as to keep Jana safer in the back seat. The last thing I'd want to happen is that we rescue you, only to have you killed by some American goons, Blunt said as he looked at his new team member. That's the last thing I'd want to, she said. Just stay down, in case we run into any trouble. Edge revved the engine as the garage door slowly lifted. As soon as Edge hit the gas, a series of explosions rocked the ground. The car fishtailed as it left the garage and sped down the dirt road. Blunt looked out the back window to catch a glimpse of the scene. He counted at least four men decked in military gear, guns trained on the various exit points around the house, which was engulfed in flames. That was a hit job, Blunt said. They used that poor kid as bait, knowing exactly what I'd do, and they wanted us all in there to make sure there were no witnesses. Standard operating procedure for a black ops mission, Edge said. No doubt they're pros. Blunt slammed his fist on the dashboard. This is treasonous. I swear I won't stop until these guys are shut down. We have to find a way to expose them, Jana piped up from the back. Maybe you can help me with that, Blunt said. But in the meantime, we need to take our operation underground. They obviously know who I am and don't like the fact that I'm nosing around in their business even though I'm not quite sure what to look for. You have an alternate office location? Edge asked. Blunt nodded. I'll show you how to get there. An hour later, Edge pulled off the main road and onto a long dirt driveway. Where does this thing go? He asked. It just winds around a bit, Blunt said, gesturing toward the road. Keep going, you'll see. The car rumbled over the ruts, the tall weeds in the middle scraping against the vehicle's grill. When they rounded a corner, there weren't any structures visible. If I see a plantation house up here, Edge began as he shook his head, I just might punch you in the face. Blunt chuckled, I get what I deserve. They drove around another bend before the dusty road spit them out into a small clearing with nothing but grass. We're here. Blunt said, as he unbuckled his seatbelt and opened the door. Edge scowled and turned toward Jana. Am I missing something? She shrugged. I've heard the CIA has some cloaking device, but I didn't know it was operational yet. Get out, you two, Blunt said as he used the cane to propel him to his feet. Blunt led Edge and Jana about 50 meters away from the vehicle to a tree that helped form the perimeter of the clearing. He opened a panel on the tree, revealing a control console. What the hell? Edge said as he stared slack-jawed at Blunt. Stand back, Blunt said as he flipped a few switches. Edge cocked his head to one side. Stand back from what? Keep watching, Blunt said. Moments later, the earth rattled, and then a piece of it started to slide back, revealing a hatch into the ground. This is your secret headquarters? Edge asked. 
Blunt nodded. After you? The trio trudged down a couple flights of stairs, the lights blinking on the farther down they went. When they reached the bottom, Blunt placed his eyes over a retina scanner, and the door swung open. Inside, they could see a fully equipped office, almost a duplicate of all the equipment available at Firestorm headquarters. Welcome to my home away from home, Blunt said. You had this built in the middle of nowhere, Virginia? Edge asked. We do serious work, Blunt said. If we were ever incapacitated, that wouldn't be good for our country's national security. So I wanted to make sure we were never shut down. I'm impressed, Edge said. Not nearly as impressive as my next move, Blunt said, as he lumbered toward an office located in the center of the room. You're claiming the biggest office? Edge asked. I mean, it's your place and all. Not sure I would consider that impressive, though. Blunt chuckled and waved off Edge dismissively. Now, I'm talking about how I'm going to get rid of these guys once and for all. And how will you do that? Jana asked. Just watch, Blunt said. He shifted the phone toward the corner of his desk and picked up the receiver to test for a dial tone. Then he dialed a number. Congressman Roberts, this is Senator Blunt. I'd like to speak with you for a few minutes if you have the time. Blunt put the call on speaker so everyone could listen. Edge frowned, obviously unsure of what Blunt was doing. Out with it, Blunt. I don't have all day. I know you're on the warpath searching for organizations that are operating outside the bounds of the law. Like yours, Robert said. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I run a consultant firm. However, there is one that I'm very familiar with that needs to be exposed. I'm game, Robert said. Excellent, Blunt said, clapping and then rubbing his hands together. Have you ever heard of an organization called the Full Good Initiative? Chapter 25 Las Vegas, Nevada Shields rifled through the folders she'd grabbed, taking pictures of as many documents as she could. While she hustled, she heard muffled voices outside the door. She glanced at the clock on her phone. More than five minutes had passed, and she knew there wasn't much time left, or else she'd be stuck inside. Are you back yet? She asked Black over the comms. He coughed a, no. Well, I'm still in here, she said. You've got to delay getting back to his office. She replaced all the files and eased up to the door. Black asked Porter about getting a cup of hot tea for his sore throat. Of course, Porter said. We have a small break room right around the corner. Shields exhaled and slipped back into the room. Instead of sitting down, she strolled around the room to investigate all of Porter's achievements plastered to the wall. Plaques and pictures told a brief story of his time as a basketball player for Duke, his subsequent coaching career on the collegiate level followed by an entry into the corporate world. A picture of Porter with his arm around Senator Schwartz was the focal point of all the decorations on the far wall. In the background, a banner hung behind them for the U.S. Mining Expo 2001. Porter had plumped up since then, wrinkles now pulling on his once tight skin. Shields could see the resemblance, but he was barely recognizable from his glory days playing for Coach Krzyzewski. She wondered if the mileage came as a result of working in a top-level position in a stressful industry, or from cooking up ways to increase profits outside the confines of the law. Maybe they're one and the same. As she was about to sit back down, Nigel entered the room. Oh, Miss Muller, Nigel said, eyeing her closely. Did everyone abandon you? Banks had a tickle in his throat, she said. Couldn't stop coughing so Mr. Porter was kind enough to take him down there. He cocked his head to one side. Oh, well, that's odd. I came in here a few minutes ago and didn't see you. The story of my life, she said. I'm just a wallflower. Good thing I didn't do my dance then. Your dance? Yeah, I like to cut loose every chance I get. You know, dance like nobody's watching. Except I would have been watching. And probably laughing, too. Well, we were both saved that embarrassment, weren't we? She smiled at him and nodded. It's the little things. 
Nigel exited the room, leaving her alone with her thoughts. Was he the one who shut the door to Porter's secret filing room? She didn't have time to ponder that question before Black entered the room with Porter. After a few brief questions, Shields stood and announced their intention to leave. You've been most helpful, Mr. Porter, she said. I think the security team at Colton Industries will be pleased with our report. He grinned and nodded subtly. Thank you, Miss Muller. That's always nice to hear. And if there's anything else you need, don't hesitate to give me a call. Porter handed each one of them his business card and asked Nigel to escort them to the lobby. Later that afternoon, Black and Shields returned to their room at the Palms and rendezvoused with Corey Hughes. The FBI agent brought a portable printer so they could sift through paper documents, decreasing the time it would take to go through everything Shields captured. They all sat around a desk in the corner of the room and studied the pages. Much to Hughes's dismay, there wasn't a smoking gun. However, there was an interesting link between a company located in Stockholm named Nielsen International. Of course, there isn't any questionable activity stateside for me to justify expanding my investigation, you said. But if I were you, I would look further into this. He pointed to the contract between Schwartz Corp and Nielsen. I thought that was peculiar as well, Black said. They are granting Nielsen exclusive permission to sell their mining equipment to African territories. Exactly, Shield said. Why not establish something on the continent like in Kenya or Ghana, depending on where you want to explore? Running everything out of Stockholm doesn't make much logistical sense, especially when you're selling ore out of there. But it makes good business sense, Hughes said. That is, if you intend to engage in some underhanded activity. How so? Black asked. They can reroute sales through offshore accounts and get away with not paying as much in taxes. Plus, nobody wants to deal directly with African governments if you don't have to, Hughes said. There's a paper trail, but it won't be easy to find. What do you mean? Shields asked. We've just got a piece of it here, Hughes said, holding up a stack of documents. The mine in Malawi is being operated by Kingston Limited. However, searching for Malawian business records online is a nightmare, and I can't get anyone at the embassy there to help me. My best guess is that Kingston is probably a shell corporation, designed to keep anyone from linking what's going on in Malawi back to Vegas. So they run all their international dealings through Nielsen, which then does what? Shields asked. Nielsen has a partner somewhere, because if they were working directly with the Iranians, red flags would be going up everywhere, Hughes said. You're going to need to piece this together. By going to Stockholm? Black asked. Hughes explained that he'd found some mob-related activity linked to Nielsen in another case he was working, but the Bureau's best hackers couldn't crack the company's firewall to verify the information. The job required going on site in order to break into the Nielsen system. Are you sure we can't do this from here? Shields asked. Hughes shook his head. I don't see any other way. We'll need a good cover, Black said. I doubt that will be a problem for you. Hughes said. I've never heard of anyone gaining access to Ted Porter that easily. Shields glanced at her watch. Well, let's get out of here. We've still got time to leave tonight. Call the pilot, Black said. Black and Shields checked out of their hotel and headed for the airport. According to their pilot, a flight plan had been filed, and they would be ready to leave within an hour. As Black drove through the streets of Vegas... He glanced in his rearview mirror several times. What do you see back there? Shields asked. Oh, probably nothing. I'm just being a little paranoid. A little? You're more focused on what's behind than what's ahead. Black shrugged. I keep thinking I see someone following us. You sure? I mean, nothing would surprise me. We've pissed off countless people. Take your pick as to who it might be. I don't know, Black said. I'm probably seeing something that isn't there. They drove up to the hangar in the executive portion of the airport, where their plane was waiting. The pilot told them that he'd be ready to go in a matter of minutes, if they wanted to load up. 
Black and Shields returned to the car to retrieve their luggage, when the sound of a click made them both freeze. Well, if it isn't Millie Muller and John Banks, though we both know those aren't your real names, said a man. Black turned around slowly to find Ted Porter wielding a gun. Mr. Porter, I'm afraid this must be some kind of misunderstanding. I don't think so, Porter said, his long arms training his weapon on Black's chest. I called Colton Industries to ask them about you. They verified who you were. Black scowled. So what's the problem? Then I called Tom Colton personally. He told me the only team he still hires personally is the security team. And he'd never heard of either of you. It's a big team, Shield said. I'm sure our names just slipped his mind. I'm not buying that, Porter said. Especially after I went back and looked at the footage from my office's hidden camera. While Mr. Cough Up a Lung here was doing his act, Miss Snoopy Snoop was breaking into my storage room. I wasn't, Shield said. Don't even try to deny it, Porter said as he shook his head. The whole episode was captured on video. Just put the gun down, and we can talk about this, Black said. Porter frowned. That's not going to happen. But what is going to happen is you're going to hand over all the documents that you took from me. I want your cell phones and your laptops, too. Black scanned the hangar and noticed someone moving toward them behind Porter. Lower your weapon, Mr. Porter, the man said. Porter glanced over his shoulder to see a man approaching with his gun drawn. Agent Hughes. That's right, Hughes said. Put your gun down, sir. Porter followed Hughes's command. I can explain. No need to, Hughes said. I know what's going on here. These two frauds broke into my files today and stole some documents from my office, Porter said. I know, Hughes said, and now they're under arrest. With mouth agape, Black stared at Hughes. Are you serious? As a heart attack, Hughes said. I don't know who you two really are, but I'm going to take you downtown to the bureau and find out. You've got to be kidding me, Shield said. Nope. Hughes said as he slapped handcuffs on her. Mr. Porter, I'm assuming you'd like to press charges? Absolutely, Porter said. Hughes motioned for Black to turn around. The FBI agent tightened cuffs around Black's wrists and shoved him toward the car. I'll handle it from here, Hughes said. Whoever these two are, we'll make sure you get justice. Damn right, Porter said, sneering at Black and Shields through the open car door. Black threw his head back and exhaled. Hughes climbed behind the steering wheel and turned on his flashing lights before roaring away from the hangar. Chapter 26 Washington, D.C. Blunt donned a disguise of a mustache, dark sunglasses, and a fedora before he ventured into the diner a few short blocks from Capitol Hill. He'd managed to convince Roberts to meet and discuss the full good initiative. The partnership, if it happened to gel, would be an unlikely one. Blunt didn't trust Roberts, but the freshman congressman's ambition could be leveraged into a more favorable outcome for Blunt. Handling Roberts was one thing, but full good was far more dangerous. And while Blunt wasn't under any pretenses that Roberts would call a truce after handing over a treasure trove of information, an irresistible opportunity arose. All Blunt had to do was guide the situation to its natural outcome, ahead of schedule. Robert slid onto the bench across from Blunt. Is that supposed to fool anybody? Blunt shrugged. Maybe throw someone off my trail? Roberts chuckled. This must be really bad for you to humble yourself like this and ask for my help. It's bad for me and it'll soon be bad for you if you don't do something about it. Okay, Robert said. Tell me why you're doing this again. You must know that I'm more inclined to see this as some sort of entrapment. Blunt grunted and then signaled for the waitress. After she took their orders, Blunt clasped his hands, resting them on the table in front of him. My goal here is to build trust, Blunt said. So any fears you might have that I'm out to retaliate for what you did to me, 
should be alleviated with this conversation. I'm telling you the truth. Fair enough. But why me? With all the hundreds of other people out there you could have handed this information off to, some of which I can only presume you like more than me, why give it to me? I can see that we share similar goals. Roberts laughed. So you want to take yourself down too? I've been watching you ever since you arrived in Washington, even before I ever knew your father's story or figured out what your agenda is. And I think we are kindred spirits, crusaders against injustice. I can't believe you can even look at me and say that with a straight face after all that you did to ruin my family's life. There are always unintended consequences in Washington, Blunt said. One man's trash is another man's treasure, and vice versa. The ripple effect is real for every decision you make. But I see you trying to make waves about the right things. Except for one. And which one is that? Roberts asked. Me. Unfortunately, whoever has told you about what I'm doing in Washington has misled you. But if you decide to start trusting me, I'm sure you'll soon discover what I'm saying is true and you'll be a national hero to boot. Robert sighed. Let's suppose I believe you. What exactly do you want me to do with this full good organization? Expose them. Burn them to the ground. Let the American people know what a travesty this was, and vow that you'll root out all such instances of corruption wherever it exists in our federal government. It's a message that will make you an instant media darling. I'm not here for fame, Robert said. I assumed you knew that already. But fame isn't a bad byproduct. It gives you more clout, more sway in the court of public opinion. And if you're going to take on some of the behemoths you mentioned on your website, you're going to need plenty of power to decimate this city's ruling elite. Roberts nodded. You're probably right. Of course I am, Blunt said. I've been playing the game in this city long enough to know how it goes. If you want to be an actual agent of change, you must have allies, and plenty of them, too. So how do we do this? Blunt placed a flash drive in the center of the table. On that device is everything you'll need to expose them and take them down. All I ask in return is that you make this your top priority. Don't delay in eliminating them. Like I told you on the phone last night. They tried to kill me yesterday. Roberts pocketed the item and eyed Blunt. You know I'm going to come after you when this is all over. I have nothing to hide, Blunt said. I already told you that someone has given you false information about me. I'll consider this, Roberts said. But I'm not making any guarantees. I'll review what you gave me and see if it passes the sniff test. Or figure out if you're just trying to play me by distracting me. I would never do the latter. You have an important job to do both on Capitol Hill and away from it, Blunt said. I don't want to stop you. I want to help you. Roberts gave Blunt a tight-lipped smile. You're a damn good talker, J.D. Except I'm not blowing the usual political smoke up your ass. Everything I'm telling you is real, and it's up to you to act on it. If you want to be vaulted into the limelight as a federal watchdog looking out for citizens eroding liberties. If I do something with this, you'll know about it soon enough. Blunt nodded as Roberts walked away, leaving the firestorm director alone to finish his breakfast. A few minutes later, his phone rang with a call from Edge. Did he go for it? Edge asked. He didn't commit to anything, but he said we'd see something, quote, Soon enough. Sounds promising. At the moment, it's all we've got. In the meantime, I'm going back to the bunker. Keep me posted on what else you discover. Roger that. Blunt hung up and took a deep breath. He wasn't sure he'd done the right thing, but he had to try. Chapter 27 Las Vegas, Nevada Black and Shields sat quietly in the back of Agent Hughes's car as they exited the airport. The FBI agent didn't have a chance to say anything on the short ride back to the Bureau's downtown offices. 
He chattered away on the phone, explaining that he had a pair of detainees and needed to process them. When he hung up, he guided Black and Shields into the offices, with Porter trailing right behind them. Come on, you two posers, Hugh said. Have a nice comfy seat in this interrogation room. I'll be right back. Can you believe this? Black asked. Shields shook her head slowly. Blunt's gonna have this guy's lunch. Only after Blunt finishes having ours. This is the last thing he wants. Shields waved dismissively. He'll get over it. The point is we got what we needed out of this operation. It won't make any difference since we're now in FBI custody. I was really looking forward to going to Stockholm, she said. That place is one of my all-time favorites. Even if they have soiled the reputation of the city with a stupid psychological condition. Black chuckled. The thing that makes this most annoying is the fact that I never saw this coming. I thought Hughes was on our side from the moment we set foot in this building. Maybe he saw nabbing us as a good win and a way to curry favor with Porter. A few seconds later, the door swung open. Porter stood outside, wearing a wide grin on his face. Well, you got half of it right, he said as he looked at Shields. Half of what you just said. And which half was that? The part about currying favor with Porter, Hughes said. And the other part? Black asked. Pure fiction, Hughes said, followed by a brief pause. Especially since I'm not really arresting you. Shields scowled. What was all this then? A charade? Hughes nodded. That's exactly what it was. I would have told you sooner, but I didn't trust your acting abilities, and I needed Porter to believe I was serious about bringing you in. If I wasn't, he would have sniffed it out, and seen little more than vacant looks on your faces. I promise I wasn't trying to be a jerk, but I needed real pain and anguish on your faces. Betrayal is a look worn like no other. Is this where we thank you? Shields asked. If you wish, Hughes said. Though I'd prefer to be thanked by you sending me everything you find on the Nielsen server. I'd still like to make a good case against Schwartz, one I could confidently take to a federal prosecutor. We'll see what we can do, Black said. Great, you said, gesturing toward the exit. Again, I'm sorry, but there is a car waiting for you around the back of the building. It'll take you straight back to your airport. Your pilot has been notified and is still waiting for you. In that case, I must say thank you, Shields said. And I take back all the mean things I said and thought about you over the past hour. Black followed her down a long corridor to a car behind the Bureau's offices. Less than an hour later, they were on a plane and headed back to Washington. That didn't end how I expected it to, Shields said. Black nodded. Me neither, but I'm not going to complain. We still have plenty to do. Like getting ready for a trip to Stockholm and seeing if we can finally put enough pieces together to take down Schwartz. Call Blunt, Black said. We need to let him know what we're planning and we need to move quickly. Chapter 28 Firestorm Bunker, Rural Virginia Blunt strode through the halls of his state-of-the-art bunker and ran his hands along the smooth concrete walls. They were cold to the touch, but the space seemed warm due to the lighting system he had installed. A faint smile appeared on Blunt's mouth as he admired his design. The place felt futuristic, almost as if an episode of Star Trek could be shot in the new facility. He eased into a big chair at the head of the conference table, using it to prop up his feet. Leaning back, Blunt interlocked his fingers behind his head and surveyed the glass monitors adorning the walls. After a few seconds, his daydream ended abruptly when his phone buzzed in his pocket. Please hold for a call from the President of the United States of America a woman said. Blunt took a deep breath and exhaled slowly as he waited. J.D., how the hell are you today? President Michaels asked, his voice a bit more chipper than usual. Just another day cutting off terrorists at their knees, Blunt said. How's yours? Well, I wanted to call you back and let you know that I did my due diligence on the Full Good Initiative. 
And nothing, Michael said. At least, nothing new. I had a couple people tell me they thought Colonel Marshall was behind it all, but no proof. From what I can gather, that's just a big rumor. Nobody even knows his level of involvement. He could be a fall guy or even a red herring. Anything to keep us from knowing the truth about that shadow organization. I appreciate the effort, Blunt said. When not even the president can get straight answers. It makes me wonder if it's even real. You have seen the aftermath of their destruction, haven't you? Yes, Blunt said. But that doesn't mean it's happening as a result of a coordinated and organized attack. Could just be some random actions taken and authorized by a few generals at the Pentagon. And full good could be made to seem like it's something to contend with. I mean, look at us. We're spending plenty of time and energy chasing something that may only exist in our mind. Good point. I'd never put anything past these generals trained in psyops. However, something is going on, Blunt said. I was confronted in the parking garage as I left the White House the other day. And? Let's just say I escaped with my life, but little else. Blunt explained in detail about the ambush and attack at his safe house, resulting in his team having to move its operations to a bunker on an old Virginia farm. Well, good luck. I'll be in touch if I hear anything else more substantial. In the meantime, you stay safe and keep me apprised of what's happening with you and your team. Will do, Mr. President. Blunt hung up and wandered back into the hallway, where he heard voices heading toward him. Nice digs, Shield said as she surveyed the area. I'm loving this clean, modern feel. It feels like we're about to film a sci-fi movie in here, Black said. Blunt snapped his fingers and pointed at Black. That's exactly what I thought. If you open the meeting with Captain's Log, Stardate, I'm going to get up and walk right out of here, Shields said. Edge and Janna straggled behind Black and Shields, all four of them gawking at their surroundings. Sci-fi decor or not, Janna began, this style seems more suited for what we do. That's because we can be honest about what we do in here. Shield said. Firestorm is just a big front for our organization. And a damn good one at that, Edge said. Blunt motioned toward the conference room. Shall we? Once everyone was seated, Blunt stood and paced. He templed his fingers, pressing them lightly against his lips before speaking. I know this was a bit of a drive for all of you this morning, but in the interest of safety for both our lives and the agency we've built here. We need to meet here for a while, until we can eliminate the people responsible for the full good initiative. I'm a fan, Shield said, and my leg feels right at home here too. Blunt smiled. I'd prefer not to stay out here any longer than possible, so I want to waste no time in addressing this issue. So without further ado, Black and Shields, can you update us on your recent trip to Vegas? Yes, Black said as he stood, and Blunt sat down. And the motto, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, doesn't apply to us here. I'm going to tell you everything, or at least everything I know. Black and Shields tag-teamed an impromptu presentation, detailing what they'd learned at the Schwartz Corp headquarters. They toned down the dramatics of being arrested by Agent Hughes and their subsequent release. This keeps getting more twisted by the minute, Blunt said. We're just following the evidence, sir, Shield said. The fact that Schwartz Corp is running the mine in Malawi where the Iranians are getting their uranium enriched doesn't seem like a mere coincidence, especially when you string that together with the phone call from Senator Schwartz's office to the Pentagon just before Black was stopped stone cold near the mine. It's overwhelming, but we're going to need something concrete to pull this all together and expose what's happening. Black looked at Edge. What's happening with the Roberts situation? The boss man has that handled, Edge said, turning and winking at Blunt. Blunt cleared his throat. Yes, I'm making some headway there. How so? Shields asked. Blunt stroked his chin. I gave him some busy work. She raised an eyebrow. Busy work? I gave him some info on full good and told him to unleash the hounds, 
if he promised to stop pestering me. I even apologized to him. And you think that's going to ward him off? Black asked. Blunt squinted. Probably not, but it buys us some more time and might take the target off our backs if he's out there mucking around in full goods business. In that case, it seems like it's clear what we have to do, Black said. We need to go to Stockholm and secure the evidence necessary to prove Schwartz's involvement in aiding the Iranians. Let me know if you need anything, Blunt said. As a matter of fact, Shields began before pausing. What is it, Shields? Blunt asked. She cut her eyes toward Jana, who'd remained silent for the duration of the meeting. We need her. Me? Jana said, pointing at herself. Yes, we need you to come with us, Shields said. Jana threw her hands in the air. Wait a minute. I'm not like you guys. I'm a lab rat. I make stuff or learn stuff. I'm not a field-trained operative. I'm sure you could hold your own out there, Black said. But we need you to help us with some tech issues we're bound to encounter there. Breaking into a company with tight security like Nielsen won't be easy. Shields is more than competent, but based on what Agent Hughes told us, we're going to be in for a big challenge. Jana looked at Blunt. Do you need me here? Blunt waved dismissively. No, you go. We don't need you right now. Besides, this cane has already proved to be incredibly valuable for my personal protection. If you did nothing else for us, you did that, which may have saved my life. Or cost you your life, she said. If you hadn't tranked that guy, you may have never been in that harrowing situation in the first place. Or it could have been much worse, Blunt said. But you have my blessing to go. If Black and Shield say they need you, they need you. All right, she said. I'll go. Shield slapped the table with both hands and smiled as she looked at Jana. Trial by fire. Jana stared at Shields. I don't find that reassuring. Shields winked at her. Well, let's get going. You need to pack. Black nodded and grinned. Wheels up in two hours, Proby. Chapter 29 Stockholm, Sweden The trio of Black, Shields, and Jana entered their downtown hotel around noon the next day. The long flight, combined with the time change, cost them plenty of time, but they weren't planning on sitting around. They retreated to their rooms and unpacked in preparation for their mission in less than 24 hours. Jana and Shields shared a room, while Black had his own across the hall. Once they'd all got settled, Black met with his two colleagues. We've got a big day ahead of us, Black said. Shields nodded. Our first challenge is setting up a meeting with someone at the Nielsen headquarters. I've been doing some research, Jana said, and I think our best bet is to approach the head of research and development, Ellen Holmberg. What's our angle? He asked. Ellen will want to talk with us about the new technologies we have for sale that will have the time to develop minds, Jana said. What do you think? Brilliant, Shield said. You see, we brought you along for more than just your ability to create cool gadgets. Just so happens I have some of those too, Jana said. Really? She nodded. If we're going to hack into their database to get information, we need to be able to patch into their mainframe without being detected. And you have a way of doing that? Shields asked. While you two were in Vegas, I created this pencil that has a transmitter in it. There's a coffee shop across the street from Nielsen headquarters that I calculated would be well within range, no matter where in the building Ellen's office is. Shields glanced at Black. What do you think? I like it, Black said. Let's see if we can go set something up. Black and Shields headed toward the lobby of the hotel. On their way out, Black stopped and spoke with the head concierge. Can you do me a big favor? Black asked, flashing a $100 bill. The man's eyes fell on the note, and he nodded. Sure, what do you want? I'm in room 302. If anyone inquires about me. And your name, sir? Mick Wilson. Okay, Mr. Wilson. If anyone asks about you, what am I to do? 
You call me immediately and tell me someone is on the way. I hate surprises. Of course, sir, the concierge said, before easing the money from Black and pocketing it. And you let me know if you need anything else. Black hustled to catch up with Shields before they stood on the curb and awaited their ride. A few minutes later, they were on their way to the Nielsen offices. Black and Shields strode confidently up to the receptionist's desk and asked to see Ellen Holmberg. Do you have an appointment? The woman behind the counter asked. No, but we're here from Colton Industries, and we need to speak with her about some new technology that she will be very interested in. So you're here on a sales call. I guess if you want to call it that, you can, Shield said. But we're not really... I'm sorry, but Miss Holmberg doesn't accept unsolicited sales calls. You'll need to make an appointment with her office. We tried that already, Black said. We decided a more direct approach might be best. The woman shrugged. Sorry, that's her policy. And part of my duties is to ensure that she doesn't get bombarded with outside sales calls. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get back to what I was doing. Shields tried one final plea. But ma'am, we came all the way from our corporate offices in Houston, Texas. We can't just go home. Stockholm is lovely this time of year, the receptionist said. I'm sure you can find something to do to make the most of your trip. Shields continued her protest. But, please ma'am, I have work to do. If you must see her, set up an appointment with her office directly. Otherwise, I need to get back to work. So if you'll excuse me. Shields sighed and spun on her heels, clicking hurriedly across the floor toward Black, who had stepped away during the exchange. So, how'd it go? Black asked. She shot me down, Shields said. We won't be able to get a meeting with Ellen Holmberg. And you're just going to give up like that? Black asked, snapping his fingers for emphasis. I'm sure we can figure something else out, Shields said. Well, we're not going to be able to do it here, he said. Let's regroup at the hotel. That sounds like a plan. A half hour later, they were both pacing around Black's room. Their newest partner was hunched over, pecking away on the keyboard. Once she saw both of the Firestorm agents enter the room, she perked up and leaped to her feet. Did it work? Jana asked. Not even in the slightest bit, Black said. Jana's face fell. So now what? We were hoping you could tell us, he said. Shields is too deflated to come up with anything creative. Watch your tongue, Shields said, wagging a finger at him. In that case... Maybe we can take a different route, Jana said. Such as, Black suggested. Maybe we can partner with a cleaning crew that handles the building. He vehemently shook his head. No, too many cameras. There are other ways. Name one, Shield said, her jaw set. We sneak in, Black said. We don't even have the schematics for the building, Shield said. It'll take me a while to get those, too. Black fell onto the bed and stared at the ceiling. There has to be some way we can get in there. We need those files that we looked at with Hughes, Shield said. There has to be something in there that we can use. Jana went back to her room to search for the files. Black stood and paced, trying to think of what their next move might be. Then the phone on his bedside rang. Mr. Banks, this is Carl from the concierge's office. You told me to call you if anyone ever inquired about your room? Yes, Black said. Four men dressed in suits just asked what room number you were in, as well as Miss Muller's room. The lady at the desk stalled, but then gave in when they slipped her some money. I just wanted you to be aware that they are headed towards you now. Thank you for letting me know, Black said, before he cursed and hung up. What's wrong? Shields asked, reading his face as Jana re-entered the room. I think Nielsen is sending some of their security goons up to our room, Black said. What? Jana said, her eyes widening. Right now? Shields asked. Black nodded. Shit, Shields said. We don't have time to gather up everything and leave now. They'll see all our stuff and know what we're up to. There might be another way, Jana said. Both Black and Shields cast a wary glance toward her. 
Don't look at me that way, Jenna said. You brought me along for a reason, didn't you? Come on, Black said. Out with it. We don't have much time. Chapter 30 Firestorm Bunker Blunt eased the cigar in front of his nose, inhaling deeply as he did. A smile spread across his lips before he clipped the end of the stogie and stuffed it into his mouth. Within seconds, he was chomping away on the tobacco. He picked up the remote off his desk and turned on the television. Blunt flipped through several channels looking for a baseball game until he stopped on a cable news station. The description stripped across the bottom of the screen caught his attention. FBI confirms Pentagon officials charged in conspiracy plot. The perky blonde wore a dour look as she stared at the camera while delivering the update. Today, in a dramatic announcement, an FBI spokesman admitted that several top brass Pentagon officials were questioned today regarding a potential scandal brewing at the nation's defense headquarters. Sources within the Bureau have said that a clandestine organization known as the Full Good Initiative was suspected of running operations on U.S. soil against the country's citizens without authorization. While details have been slow to emerge, the fallout could be far-reaching if proven true. Blunt smiled while he listened to the rest of the report. That bastard made it happen. I can't believe he actually followed through with it. The news anchor continued with her report. While the entire case is stunning, one of the most shocking revelations from the arrests was the fact that General Ryan Carmichael was charged with two acts of conspiracy to commit murder. Shocking to whom? That doesn't surprise me in the least. The woman concluded her story. All of this came to light as a result of freshman Congressman Vernon Roberts, a Pennsylvania representative who ran a campaign on the promise to weed out corruption in Washington. Earlier today, many of Roberts's colleagues were quick to praise him, designating him as the new guardian of freedom on Capitol Hill. He got exactly what he wanted. Late this afternoon, reporter Kelly Epson tracked down Roberts outside his office, where he had this to say. Blunt sat up in his chair, his eyes glued to the screen. Ever since I arrived in Washington, I viewed this time as an incredible opportunity to represent my district, full of great Pennsylvanians who care about their state and this country. When I was running, I made a vow to them, a promise I intend to keep, to fight against corruption in Washington. Today was a big victory, not just for me, but for all of the people who cast their faith in me to do what I said I was going to do. And although I'm very pleased about what this means for the future of our country, understand this, I'm not done yet. If you're out there trying to operate outside legal bounds, you will be found out and punished to the full extent of the law. Robert stared directly into the camera and held his gaze. The report ended awkwardly almost as if Roberts was waiting for someone to signal for him to relax and look away. But he never did. He glared at the screen so deeply that Blunt wondered if the representative could actually see through the lens and television sets. The picture finally faded to black before transitioning to the anchor woman. She glanced at her notes, almost unaware that she was back on the air. Thank you for that report, Dana, the woman said. In other news... Blunt grunted as he turned off the television. Roberts's dramatics were enough to make Blunt want to throw a few punches. But that was the end of it. Until Blunt's phone rang. Well, Senator Blunt, did you happen to catch my appearance on the evening news tonight? Said a familiar voice. Blunt wanted to hang up on Roberts, but resisted. I did. Quite an impressive feat. Just like I told you it would be. And I appreciate that, Robert said. But I need to be frank with you. The last part of my message for the cameras was directed at you and your ilk. If you think throwing me a bone is going to curry any favor, you're sorely mistaken and don't know me as well as you think you do. I was never under any pretense that you would leave me alone, Blunt said. I used you to get Fullwood off my back. 
You see, I've been in Washington a long time and know how the game is played, so I appreciate you playing along. This isn't over, Robert said. I'm going to out you and your little band of Robin Hoods, exposing you for the frauds that you are. Like I said before, I'm afraid you have me mistaken for someone else. I run a consultant firm that happens to deal with national security issues. Whoever you think I am, or whatever you think I do, is wrong. We'll see about that, Robert said, before he hung up. Blunt eyed the screen for a moment, before sliding it across his desk. If you take a shot, you better not miss. Chapter 31 Stockholm, Sweden Jana Shadid never felt danger while working at the Ford Al facility in Iran. The job was what she was trained to do, aside from passing along bits of information she gathered to Mossad. The protocol for passing secrets was simple enough and would have been difficult to prove, even if she was suspected by officials at the plant. But this was different. She took a deep breath. Okay, don't laugh, but I brought a hazmat suit. Jana took a deep breath before she donned the hazmat suit, venturing into the hallway with yellow tape. While Black and Shields had been vague about what to pack, Jana considered, bring whatever you feel you'll need, to mean gear sufficient to maintain safety while handling nuclear matter. She figured they were bound to encounter it at some point, since the impetus for the mission was stopping Iran from getting weapons-grade nuclear material. Black and Shields looked at her like she had two heads when she first mentioned that she'd brought the protective gear. But her brief explanation, coupled with the fact that they didn't have much time to consider any other plans, won over the two American agents. As she exited the room, she wrapped the yellow tape around the door handle, moving back and forth between a set of four doors. Just as she was finishing, a trio of men entered the hallway from the stairwell. One of the men held his gun down, while the other two hastily holstered their weapons when she made eye contact with them. Hello, gentlemen, she said, waving to get their attention. They all took a few steps back, apparently uninterested in engaging with Jana in conversation. That's right, she said, shouting to make sure they could hear her, despite the helmet muffling her voice. You don't want to go anywhere near these rooms. One of the men broke ranks and took a step forward. What's going on here? A couple of guests started feeling sick and asked us to take a look, Jana said. Apparently, one of them stole radioactive material without handling it properly. I know I shouldn't laugh, but it's difficult not to. People who play stupid games win stupid prizes, one of the men said, edging closer. A distinct tinge of an American accent to his voice. Jana pounced on the opportunity to learn more. You sound like you're from the U.S. The man shrugged. So what if I am? Exactly. So what? I don't care. But you look like you're itching for trouble. Something my Swedish friends would never do. Now, I'm not going to warn you again. But you need to leave before you get exposed to radioactivity. The other man joined his colleagues, as if in an act of solidarity. Prove it. Prove what? She asked that there's radioactive material on this floor, because I'm not sure I believe you. Jana fetched the Geiger counter out of one of her pockets and turned it on. Then she waved it around the room, tweaking one of the buttons to make the device shriek. After a couple of passes, the man nodded his head. Looks legit to me, he said, and I'd advise you to exit this floor as soon as possible if you don't want to get sick. The American glared at her, We'll take our chances. He ripped down the yellow tape and walked up to the door. Sir, please, Jana said. I urge you to back away. You're not properly equipped to enter that room. I'm not sure you understand just how high the levels of radioactivity are in... The American screwed on a noise suppressor to the end of his gun before firing a couple of shots at the door. Seconds later, the door came unlatched as he pushed his way in. Sir, please... Jana pleaded. It's very dangerous in there. She followed behind him, manipulating her Geiger counter to squawk. 
One of the other men pushed his way past her before shoving her aside. Nobody believes your little stunt, except for maybe our friend over there. But he's always scared about everything. It's not a stunt, Jana said. I was asked to come up here by hotel management to tape off the area and urge guests to exit a different way. The hotel is relocating everyone on this floor. You mean, there's no one around? The man asked. And for a good reason. You may all get sick and die the longer you stay in this area, Jana said. We still haven't even removed the uranium yet. Have you considered that maybe that's why we're here? The other one asked. Please, she said. I'm begging you. Leave this room now. You're not properly protected from any radiation. The American shoved her backward. She stumbled before falling to the ground. Then another man slammed the door shut. Jana scrambled to her feet and knocked on her room door. Black jerked it open and poked his head into the hallway. They're inside your room, Jana said. You need to hurry. Black and Shields tore off down the corridor, heading toward the stairwell, which was on the opposite end of the hall as the elevators. Jana raced toward the elevators when she heard the men rush out of the room. Jana turned to make sure they didn't see Black and Shields, who were still hustling away. Over here, gentlemen, she said as the elevator doors opened. I'm going to send security up to deal with you once I get down to the lobby. So I suggest you leave if you don't want to invite more trouble into your life than you already have. One of the men acted as if he might look over his shoulder, but Jana reacted quickly. Hey, I'm over here, she shouted. You need to leave, now. The man put his hand to his ear, feigning as if he couldn't hear her. He spun around to look down the hall, but it was empty. When Jana reached the lobby, she ambled up to the reception area. The man behind the counter eyed her cautiously. May I help you? He asked. There are three armed men running around on the sixth floor, Jana said. You might want to deal with them. Why are you dressed like that? The man asked. Before Jana attempted to answer, a ding sounded the arrival of an elevator. When the doors slid open, the three men stepped out. There they are, Jana said, pointing at them. The man behind the desk picked up his phone and dialed a number as he watched them carefully. Jana listened as the man reported the gunman to the hotel's head of security. The three men dispersed, sprinting in different directions. Seconds later, two guards hustled through the lobby, taking directions from the receptionist as to which way the gunman went. Jana exited into a nearby alley where the team planned to rendezvous. But instead of finding Black and Shields waiting, Jana stumbled upon a street brawl where Black was getting handled by a pair of men. One man stood behind Black, locking his arms behind him, while the other pummeled Black with body blows. With each hit, Black grimaced more. Can I get a little help here? The man administering the beating stopped and turned toward Jana. What do we have here? Chapter 32 Washington, D.C. Blunt drove back to the city to meet with Edge and discuss what he'd learned over the past 24 hours. With the full good initiative exposed and two of his agents investigating Schwartz Corp, Blunt focused on Roberts. As expected, handing him the dirt on full good bought Blunt more time, but not much. He met Edge at a restaurant downtown and discussed his findings. Everything you need is in there, Edge said, handing Blunt a folder while saddling onto the seat next to him at the bar. We can't let him expose Firestorm, Blunt said. The president was very clear about that. What this organization does is vital to national security, as well as mitigating threats without creating pretexts for more elevated conflicts. I understand, Edge said before taking a pull on his glass of bourbon. I can tell you've got a good team who care about this country. And they care about you, too. They're very convincing actors. Edge waved dismissively at Blunt. You can try to pretend like that doesn't matter to you. But I know it does. Anybody who cares about his people as much as you do appreciates the reciprocation. Your agents are loyal. And it's no secret why. 
Blunt finished his drink, slamming it down on the bar. He huffed a laugh through his nose and then shot a sideways glance at Edge. What? Edge asked. If you're trying to make me cry, it's going to take a whole lot more than that, Blunt said with a smirk. It's okay to have feelings. Who says I don't? Edge leaned back and studied Blunt for a moment. You project a hard exterior, but I think inside, you're a softy. Keep this up and you'll get the business end of my cane. And I promise you that you won't like what will happen to you while you're knocked out. Edge cracked a smile and shook his head. So are we going to nail this bastard or not? He asked, tapping the folder. If everything you told me is in here, we've got a good chance at nailing him. Good, Edge said. I've got cases stacking up on me that I need to get back to. Well, I'd like to put you on retainer just in case I need you to do something else for me regarding this case. Would you be okay with that? Retainers are always welcome, especially when coming from you, Senator. Blunt ordered a couple shots for them and then called for a toast. To Vernon Roberts, the wily bastard who wasn't quite wily enough. The two men threw their shots back before Blunt followed Edge out of the bar. Edge waited at the curb for an Uber ride, despite Blunt's offer to give him a ride home. I've got to make a stop somewhere first, Edge said. But thank you anyway. I'll be in touch. Blunt waved goodnight and checked both lanes of traffic before ambling across the street. His car was parked around the corner on a side street. When he arrived at his vehicle, a short man was leaning against it and appeared comfortable. He pushed himself forward with his back and stood upright. Senator Blunt, the man said. Blunt froze, looking the man up and down. Yes? I was wondering if I could have a word with you. Blunt raised his cane slightly, bettering his odds in case the man made a sudden move. Who are you? I'm Jake Collins with The Post, and I wanted to give you the courtesy of allowing you to comment on a story that I'm working on regarding Firestorm. Chapter 33 Stockholm, Sweden Black struggled to break free from the man standing behind him. With Black unable to move his arms, he needed to get creative to get loose. The moment the other thug delivering the punches turned his attention toward Janna, Black didn't hesitate. Staggering forward to his knees, Black pulled down the man behind him. A quick roll to Black's left broke the man's tight grip and enabled Black to scramble away. Dancing toward Janna, Black was unaware of his new colleague's fighting skills. You ready? Black asked as he cut a sharp glance at Janna, who was still clad in her hazmat suit. Let's do this she said. Black rushed toward the Punisher, crossing up the two combatants for just a moment. Janna, following Black's lead, rushed toward the other man. Black landed two body blows and a headshot before his opponent could strike back. When he crouched down and then exploded an uppercut, Black dove to the ground and proceeded to sweep the man's legs out from underneath him. Before he could recover, Black was on top of him, pummeling him. The beating would have continued for quite some time had he not been distracted by the sound of electricity crackling. He took a quick peek at Janna, only to find her with a taser jammed into the other man's neck. A little more than a second later, he collapsed to the ground. She strode over toward Black and shoved her taser into the man's neck. Nice work, Black said as he hopped off the man. Black went through the man's pockets and retrieved his wallet. What did you find? Janna asked. Just as we thought, Black said as he shook his head. This guy works for Nielsen. Now, where's Shields? I'm still alive and kicking, she said over the comms. Did you encounter any hostiles? Black asked. Just one, she said. But I took care of him. He's tied to a pole at the moment. Roger that. Meet us in the northwest corner of the hotel. Less than a minute later, they converged at Black's suggested point and discussed their next move. Did you get everything out of the room? Jenna asked. Black nodded. The concierge is holding it for us. I tipped him a hundred bucks again. 
so he better not lose it. I need to get out of this thing, Jenna said, tugging at her suit. That was some quick thinking, Shields said as she winked at Jenna. We're going to need some more quick thinking if we're going to get the information we need, Black said. We won't be able to walk right into Nielsen, so we need a plan B. Any ideas? Shields looked at Jana. Your last idea panned out, since we're all still alive. Got any creative juices stirring inside that noggin of yours? Jana smiled. As a matter of fact, I've got just the thing. Chapter 34 Washington, D.C. Blunt pursed his lips as he lowered his cane. Upon closer inspection, the man claiming to be Jake Collins wasn't a physical threat. Even with a bum knee, he figured Blunt could take the frail newsman. However, the pen he wielded with the post was threatening. Frightening, if Blunt was being honest. He needed to tread carefully to escape the trap he'd been ensnared in. No doubt set by Vernon Roberts. So, you want to comment? Blunt asked. Collins nodded. I'll tell you what, Blunt said. Let's go down to the monocle, and I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Anything, Collins asked. Blunt nodded. Within reason. Over the years, Blunt had fended off several reporters hoping to strike the big time by exposing a shadowy government organization. But this run at Blunt and his organization felt different. Roberts had access to some documents that could likely sink any kind of cover story Blunt had concocted in the past. Escaping this jam was going to require some skill, and Blunt needed time to think. Collins shrugged. Okay, I'll follow you there. At the bar, Blunt led Collins to an empty table in the back of the room. After ordering drinks, Blunt leaned forward in his chair and rested his elbows on the table. He scanned the room before speaking. So, tell me what you think you know about me. I know that you were on the Senate's Intelligence Committee at one point when you were in office, Collins said, and then you parlayed that knowledge into a leadership position over a special black ops unit that runs missions all over the world. Blunt shrugged. Well, you got half of that right. So, I have to warn you that you're not really convincing me that you know what you're talking about. That's why we're here, right? To clear things up? To give me your statement about these claims? I'm always curious where you reporters get your information from, Blunt said. Do you just make it up out of thin air, approach a target, and see if they will react to it? That's not how we work, especially not in this case, Collins said. We get tips and then we verify. We do this over and over again until we have something that's printable. Even if it's not even vaguely true? I would never, Blunt held up his hand. The problem with that method is that you have to assume that everyone verifying information to you is acting in good faith. I'd be willing to bet that Vernon Roberts wasn't really acting in good faith when he told you about me and what I'd do. Collins's eyes widened just a bit. It wasn't much, but it was enough that Blunt noticed and helped him realize he was onto something. There are plenty of snakes in this city, Blunt said, and maybe you haven't been around here long enough to learn that, but I can assure you that if there's a big snake in the grass right now on Capitol Hill, it's Roberts. Lies effortlessly roll off his tongue. Then he fits right in with everyone else I'm covering in this town. Blunt nodded and pointed his index finger at Collins. But Roberts is the most dangerous type. How so? I bet you've wondered to yourself in recent days, how does a freshman congressman have a meteoric rise to the top of his party with barely a seminal moment to speak of? The thought has crossed my mind, Collins said. And what answer did you come up with? I never really came up with one. Roberts is smart. He's created a far-reaching network that has dirt on everyone in the entire city. I bet he told you he could get you a better gig at a better publication. Maybe a magazine job? Collins looked down. That's how he got you, isn't it? Blunt said, not waiting for a response. 
He'd sell you the moon if you'd just run a story he cooked up on J.D. Blunt. But for the record, the story you're working on right now is fiction. Why would he want to damage you? Collins asked, scratching a few notes on his pad. Revenge, Blunt said. I wrote a bill that rooted out some corruption in Pennsylvania. Cost his dad his job. Probably some nice fringe benefits, too. But you would have thought I authored legislation that made children become permanent wards of the state after stripping parents of their rights. Roberts's reality was different than most people's, but the result was sheer hatred toward me. And you're sure of this? All of that is verifiable, Blunt said. He didn't single me out by name, but it was all campaign rhetoric for him. He talks about the bill all the time. Go look it up if you don't believe me. That still doesn't change the fact that you are running a black ops program outside the law. You think that's a fact? Blunt smirked and shook his head. Have you verified that? You haven't denied it. If I had to deny to the press every lie someone brought against me, I'd never get anything done. Collins shifted in his seat. So, there is a program you oversee? Blunt chuckled. I can assure you that our agency isn't all that exciting. We're just a bunch of policy wonks, trying to help our country stay safe. That's not an answer to my question. Let me ask you this. Since you've already fallen victim to Roberts's game, what would you perceive to be a greater threat to this country? A black ops program that quietly cuts terrorist organizations off at the knees without having to invade countries? Or a rogue congressman? who has been amassing little more than embarrassing details about people's lives to manipulate them into doing whatever he wants. To be honest, I'm not quite sure, Collins said. I'm not a fan of any shadow organization run by the federal government. Look, I know Michaels may not be the most popular president, but I can promise you that he isn't the enemy you think he is. Now, are you interested in exposing one of the most corrupt politicians ever to arrive in Washington and launch your career? Or do you want to write a speculative piece without any proof other than whispers? Why can't I do both? Blunt shook his head. You can only do one without me. And that option will be forgotten by noon the day your story runs. Those articles are a dime a dozen around here but exposing Roberts will have you on television talking about one of the biggest scandals in recent modern politics. I'm not a fame-seeking whore. I just want the truth to get out. In that case, I'm willing to give you the truth on a platter. The truth about Roberts. I've got all kinds of documentation that will make your editors sleep easy at night. Let me mull this over. I'll give you until the morning to decide. Otherwise, I might just give this story to one of your hungry colleagues. Collins nodded. I'll give you my answer tomorrow. Chapter 35 Leading Goose, Sweden Black squeezed the steering wheel as he sped along the highway. The clock on the SUV's dashboard flickered as it turned to midnight. Traffic was almost non-existent, giving them an uneventful trip. A short drive east of Stockholm on the island of Lidingu, Nielsen maintained another facility. The primary function of the campus was manufacturing, but it also housed the company's computer servers. Since Black and Shields had already been compromised at the downtown building, sneaking into it would prove to be a formidable challenge. Add in the pressure they felt to get some actionable intelligence sooner rather than later, and the team realized it needed to take the path of least resistance. The leading goo plant was easily that route, something Black may not have even considered had they not run into so much trouble downtown. Nervous? Shields asked. No, he lied. Why do you ask? I'm afraid you're going to snap the steering wheel in half you're gripping it so hard. Maybe I'm a little tense. Are you afraid we're going to get caught? Jana asked. If we do, I have full confidence that we'll be able to claw our way to freedom he said. That's not exactly an answer brimming with optimism, Shields said. Black bristled. We'll be fine. What makes you so confident? Shields asked. 
because I'm working with some professionals, he said, winking at her and doing his best to project an air of self-assurance. And I don't think they'll expect us out here at this facility. Situated on top of a small hill, the main building faced Lake Maladen. The structure was more or less a giant concrete box, mostly windowless, with the exception of a few corner offices on the southwest side. A six-foot stone wall stretched across the front of the property, interrupted only by a guardhouse flanked by entrance and exit lanes. Black stopped about a hundred meters from the entrance, pulling into the parking lot of a nearby restaurant to take a few minutes to scope out the scene. What do you think? Black asked. I see a few blind spots from the cameras mounted on the corners of the building, just like we saw in the schematics, Shield said, while peering through his binoculars. Black studied the device in his hand. And you're sure all I have to do is get this transmitter onto one of the servers? Jana nodded. It's got a range of a half mile. Based on all our calculations, we'll be close enough from here to harvest all the data we need, probably before you even get back to the car. The shift change happens in three minutes, Black said, glancing at his watch. It's go time. Good luck, Shield said as he stepped out of the vehicle. And don't forget the other thing I gave you, Jana shouted. Black secured his backpack and headed toward the property. Using the tree line that defined the property's boundary, he stayed in the shadows before reaching one of the security camera's blind spots. How am I looking? Black asked over his comms. Everything's still a go, she said. Just keep moving. Black eased up to the edge of the building, before launching a rope with a grappling hook onto the roof. Once he pulled the rope taut, he ascended to the top, scaling the distance of four stories with relative ease. Still looking good, Shield said. Black crouched low and hustled to the door leading to the interior. He gave the handle a swift tug and went inside. I'm inside, he whispered. Roger that, Shield said. Head toward the northeast corner stairwell to access the server room on the first floor. When Black reached the ground floor, he cracked the door and peered down the hallway leading to the server room. Are you ready? She asked. Isn't there a better way to do this? He asked, swallowing hard. You're the one who said this plan would work, Shields replied. Besides, the consequences for a breaking and entering charge here are minimal. I don't plan on getting caught, he said. Then what are you hesitating for? Make it happen. Black took a deep breath and sprinted down the empty corridor toward the server room. He blasted the lock with his gun, kicking the door open. I'm inside, Black said. The clock's ticking. Tell me what I'm looking for. There should be a computer that looks like it's housed behind a pair of double doors. Almost like a refrigerator, she said. Just slip the device into a USB port on the back and you'll be good. Black scanned the room. At first, all he saw were rows and rows of computers, none of them looking like what Shields described. He rushed up and down the aisles, searching for anything that resembled the main server. Anything yet? She asked. Nope. Better hurry, she said. I'm monitoring the guard's radio channel. They're sending two men your way now. Black cursed under his breath as he continued his quest. After a few more tense moments... He located the units just as Shields had said. He jammed the device into a port. It's done, he said. Give me a second, she said. He could hear her typing furiously over the comms, but that was quickly drowned out by the approaching footfalls. They're here, Black said. Gotta bounce. It's working, she said. Get out of there. Already on it. Black raced toward the exit and then plastered himself against the wall. Seconds later, two guards rushed inside and turned on the lights. Black blindsided one of the men and sent him crashing into the other guard before darting down the hallway. He hit the first flight of stairs before Shields gave him an update. They're sending everyone after you, she said. How many? I'm having a hard time distinguishing all the voices, but from what I can tell, it's maybe four. Damn, Black said, and they're armed too. If you can reach the roof, you should be all right. Black cruised up two more flights before he encountered a guard hustling up behind him. 
The man shouted at Black, but he ignored the commands. The guard fired one shot that ricocheted off the wall. By the time he fired a second, Black was already on the roof. Where are you? Shields asked. I'm about to rappel down, Black said. Get the car ready. Roger that, she said. They're sending two guards to look for you on the perimeter, so be careful. Black zipped down the rope. When his feet hit the ground, he noticed two guards converging on him. Black dug into his pocket and fished out the other device Jana had given him. She called it the special and warned him only to use it in case he was in trouble. With two armed guards sprinting toward him, Black deemed the moment as sufficient trouble. He slammed the device onto the ground. A huge plume of smoke shot up, followed by the popping of what sounded like a firecracker. Black didn't stick around to see the guard's reactions. He sprinted toward the tree line and then hustled through the shadows. I'm coming, Black said. We're waiting, Shield said. A few seconds later, he jumped into the front seat of the passenger side before Shield slammed her foot on the accelerator. Black jerked backward in his seat as they tore away from the facility. He looked behind them to see one guard staring, mouth agape at their getaway. That was close, she said as she turned back onto the main highway. A lot closer than I wanted it to be, Black said. Well, you'll be happy to know it was worth it, Jana said from the back seat. Did you find everything you needed? He asked. More or less. We're still in the dark a little bit, but at least we have another clue to follow. Black scowled. What do you mean? I was able to get into Nielsen's records and learned that it doesn't actually do business in Africa, Jana said. In fact, the curious thing is they aren't dealing directly with any African nation. Then what are they doing? They're using a company called Kingston Limited, located in the Cayman Islands. Name ring a bell? Now we have the link, Shield said. Yes, but we're going to need to go to the bank to find out who's involved in that company. There weren't any names in the records I searched. Black smiled. Well then, maybe Shields will finally get a chance to work on that tan of hers that she's always complaining about. I'll call the pilot now, Shields said. Chapter 36 Washington, D.C. Blunt awoke the next morning to a rather benign edition of the Washington Post. He sat on his back porch and consumed several articles before checking his watch. While he was sleeping, he'd received a text message from his agents that they were headed to the Cayman Islands to follow up on a lead they'd found while in Stockholm. The news didn't excite him, but it did give him hope that they were closing in on whoever was behind the stunt in Malawi. However, the implications of the fallout still remained murky. He tidied up his kitchen and prepared to go to the firestorm bunker when his phone rang. That was fast. So, have you made your decision? Blunt asked as he answered the phone. I have, Jake Collins said. I slept on it last night and wanted to let you know first thing this morning. And what are you going to do? I've decided that I'm going to forge my own path. Blunt furrowed his brow. What exactly does that mean? I recorded our conversation last night, so I don't really need any of your favors, or permission for that matter to write a story about Vernon Roberts. And I certainly won't stand for you manipulating me into discarding an earth-shaking story about you and your clandestine enterprise. First of all, there's no such thing. Second of all, you might want to reconsider, Mr. Sexton. The line went quiet. Oh, Blunt continued. You didn't think I'd find out about who you really are. You just thought you were going to drift through life as Barry Sexton without anyone ever finding out about your past. And when I get through with you, no employer will hire you to even operate a lawnmower. More silence. Barry, are you listening to me? Blunt asked. Still nothing. I have solid proof about your past and your lengthy criminal record. I'm sure your editor would love to discover that in his inbox before he's finished with his morning coffee. This is America. Everyone gets a second chance. No, they don't. 
Not when they did what you were arrested for. It was a mistake. A one-time thing. I've moved on. Blunt grunted. You've moved on. But what about that young girl? You think she just moved on after what you did to her? I paid for what I did, and now you didn't. Your father paid a judge to give you a light sentence, and then you paid to have your name changed, hoping your past would never catch up with you. But all this comes out when you try to fabricate a story against a well-connected ex-senator. Did you think I was going to take your accusations lying down? I'm a fighter, and I'm going to land the last punch. I guarantee it. Go ahead, Collins said. I'll spin it as another Washington bureaucrat attempting to extort me. Blunt chuckled. You think that's all I've got on you? I'm just getting started. You know that story you wrote last year on the cyber attacks from China? It wasn't true. Somebody at the Defense Department fed you that one, which might not be a big deal except for the fact that the story you won your first big press award for was a fake. The intelligence community used you, and you had no idea. You pumped out a story with lots of anonymous sources, which were all planted. Now you're going to have a hard enough time getting up off the mat after I reveal who you really are. But when I tell all your colleagues that you are nothing more than a hack who regurgitated DOD talking points, you'll be reduced to a pile of rubble. That's not how I want this to go, but keep pushing your luck and that's how it'll turn out. You good with that? You're bluffing, Colin said. Try me, Blunt said, before he hung up the phone. He wasted no time dialing the cell phone number of the managing editor of the Washington Post. A half hour later, Blunt glanced down at his phone and smiled. Mr. Collins, to what do I owe the pleasure of this call? Blunt asked. You win, you bastard, Collins said. Whoa, that's not exactly how I'd talk to your best source in the city. Collins sighed. I know what you did this morning. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't play dumb with me. I know you called my editor. Do you now? Blunt asked. He told me that he learned my story on the Chinese cyber attacks wasn't accurate, according to one of his sources. He told me that he was going to keep that quiet for my sake, since he thought I was a well-connected reporter. But that was my final strike. Hmm, Blunt said. You dodged a bullet. Congratulations. I resigned, Collins said. And while I think you're a snake, I trust that you'll keep the truth about my past our little secret. Of course, Blunt said. I'm a decent human being. Every man is entitled to a second chance. That's not exactly the sentiment I got from you yesterday. Things change, Blunt said. But I appreciate you being man enough to call me back and inform me of your decision. However, I must say that I'm a little disappointed that you didn't choose to run with a story on Vernon Roberts. Find someone else to carry your water, Blunt. I'm done with you. The line went dead. Blunt wasn't proud of himself, but sometimes that's what the job demanded. He hated getting down in the muck and mire of Washington whispers, but he only did it when it was absolutely necessary. Collins probably deserved better even though he deserved much worse for what he did to that girl when he was in college. Blunt considered it a wash, willing to forge ahead knowing that protecting Firestorm from being exposed was sometimes an unsavory assignment, but one that might potentially save millions of lives one day. He snipped off the end of a cigar and bit down on the stogie. There's still work to be done. Chapter 37 Georgetown, Cayman Islands The firestorm jet touched down at the airport the next evening. The team retreated to their hotel to review their plans to infiltrate Caribbean Islands Bank and unmask whoever was behind Kingston Limited. While Black confessed their mission was taking on the feel of a wild goose chase, he refused to quit since they'd already come this far. Plus, he wanted to confirm who'd called the Pentagon and had the full good initiative order a team of ex-Navy SEALs to stop him in Malawi. Once they were settled, 
They discussed how to best proceed. Not that I'm complaining, since I get a trip to the Caymans out of this, Shield said. But I think we've got more than enough on Schwartzkorp to get the Justice Department to file charges against him. But this is treason we're talking about here, Black said. You don't just fling that charge around without solid proof. The fact that we're here having this conversation is proof enough in and of itself, she said. It doesn't matter, Black said, shaking his head. If someone accused me of doing something like this, I hope they would have gone to great lengths to make sure I was betraying my country. Jana chuckled. Mossad would have already shot him dead while he was playing tennis, or drowned him while he was out sailing. Gathering truckloads of evidence can be tedious. Black raised his index finger. True, this process is laborious. However, it's also necessary for us to continue to function as a free society. You think we're really free? Shields asked, followed by an exaggerated eye roll. Freer than most, Black said. But that's beside the point. We can't claim to hold the moral high ground when we're doing underhanded things ourselves. The rule of law is the rule of law. Fine, Shields said. Let's just get this over then, okay? Either we find something connecting Kingston to Schwartz, or it's just a rogue operator, maybe even funneling money back to Schwartz. Black shook his head. I don't remember seeing anything on Kingston Limited when we combed through the cache of papers you took from Porter's files. Remember, we didn't see everything they had, Shield said. There were mountains of documents I never saw. That information could have been easily hidden away there. Of course but that's why we need to find it another way, Black said. We're not getting within a country mile of Porter's office again. All right, Jana said. Let's figure this operation out. Black looked at their newest addition to the team. I get the feeling you really like this business. She nodded. The bar was low for me, as you'll recall. I lived and worked in a cave underground for 90% of my working life since graduating from college. I'm sure you can see how much more appealing this is. You don't see me clamoring to get behind a desk, Black said. Now, let's discuss how we're going to pull this off tomorrow. The next morning, Black and Shields went to breakfast at the Georgetown Yacht Club. While Shields would have preferred to hack into the bank's records from the comfort of her desk in Washington, that wasn't possible. Caribbean Islands Bank handled its online transaction with unprecedented security. After a rash of cyber attacks, the bank built a portal for its clients to submit transactions. The bank was staffed 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, to handle whenever customers needed to transfer money. Unless you could get access to the mainframe computer at the bank's downtown building, it was impossible to hack into the database. This extensive and cumbersome security protocol was the mastermind of Kellen Harding, who sat one table away from Black and Shields. Harding maintained a desktop computer in his home, which was the only way to get into the bank's system without being on site. Dressed in periwinkle sports coat and a yellow button-down shirt with khakis, the Caribbean Islands Bank CEO sipped a mimosa with a blonde who appeared to be in her mid-twenties, some thirty years his junior. That's him, Shield said in a hushed tone, as she glanced at her phone and then back at Harding. Commence phase two on my lead, Black said. A few minutes later, Harding's companion excused herself to go to the restroom. Time to strike, Black said, as he nodded at Shields. Well, it seems to me that the longer we've been married, the worse your taste in art has become, Shield said. Me, Black said increasing the volume of his voice. You're the one who thinks Degas is better than Winslow Homer. That's just absolutely absurd. Well, I'd much rather prefer to see the grace and beauty and elegance that Degas finds in portraits of introspective people, rather than simple landscapes. Landscapes speak to my soul, Black said. Black shot a glance over at Harding, who was watching the argument with a bemused look on his face. Sir, Black said turning toward Harding. You seem like a man of sophisticated tastes. Which would you prefer, the portraits of Degas or the landscapes of Homer? Harding squinted as he tapped his temple with his forefinger. Can I let you in on a little secret? Black and Shields both nodded. 
I've been having this same debate myself for years, and I honestly still can't decide. You're not being very helpful, Shield said. Perhaps not at the moment, but maybe you'd like to continue this lovely discussion at my home, Harding said. And why would we do that? Shields asked. Because I have a painting from each of those two artists in my private gallery, Harding said as he offered his hand. Kellen Harding. Alexander Rhodes, Black said. And this young woman here is my beautiful bride, Camille. It's a pleasure to meet both of you, Harding said. I'm actually hosting a cocktail party tonight and would be delighted if you would join me. A cocktail party, Alexander? How wonderful. Shield said before turning to Harding. We just came in from the Hamptons, and I was grousing last night to Alexander about how the thing I miss the most about visiting the Caymans is the lack of social scene. Then your fortunes are about to change tonight, Harding said. I'll introduce you to all of the movers and shakers on Grand Cayman, and before you know it, you'll be sick of social engagements. Sounds delightful, Shield said, softly clapping her hands. Harding produced a business card from his pocket. The festivities begin around eight o'clock. Feel free to bring your boat, too. We have plenty of space to dock for the night, in case you don't want to drive home. Better safe than sorry is what I always say. Thank you, Black said. We'll see you and your paintings tonight. Harding's companion returned from the restroom, and both parties resumed eating. When Harding finished, he nodded and smiled at them, before escorting the woman out. Well done, Black said to Shields, once Harding was gone. However, I'm somewhat concerned over how well you played the part of a socialite from the Hamptons. For a lady born and raised in South Georgia, that was even more impressive, and quite frightening. Shields smiled. I met plenty of those women while raising money for the Wounded Warriors Project. They're caricatures of themselves. It's not a hard impression to nail. Well, your work isn't finished. Let's see if you can continue this charade tonight. She nodded. In the meantime, we need to rent a boat. Black and Shields eased into the slip along Harding's dock in their Sea Ray 450 Sundancer. After securing the boat, Black smoothed out the wrinkles in his coat jacket and stood in front of Shields. How do I look? He asked. Like a man who's about to lose an argument over Winslow Homer she said. What about me? Stunning, he said, studying her floor-length red sequin dress. Though if you wanted to be a bit more inconspicuous, I wouldn't recommend going to a party looking like that. Turning heads and breaking hearts, Shield said. That's what the sheriff used to always say about me whenever I got ready to leave the house. In that case, not much has changed. You still look good, and there's an armed man who has your back. Except I'm packing heat, too. Jana chimed in on the comms. Hopefully we won't need guns tonight. Amen to that, Shield said as she strode toward the party. There was an open bar on the veranda of Harding's sprawling estate. Tiki lamps and decorative lights lit the area as guests congregated around several fire pits. Black also noticed people milling around inside the house. Once Black and Shields made eye contact with Harding, the host excused himself to welcome his new guests. You made it, Harding said with a wide grin. Welcome to Blue Haven Estate. This place is fabulous, Shield said. Thank you, Harding said. Now, after I get a drink in your hands, what would you like to do first? Meet the island's socialites or settle your art debate? Black widened his eyes and shook his head. You've presented us with quite a difficult decision. Shields hit Harding on the arm. Yes, but I'll feel much more relaxed after I settle this row with my husband. Please, point me to where I can get a gin and tonic, and then show me to the art. With pleasure, Harding said. After getting drinks, Black and Shields followed Harding upstairs. He led them to a wide corridor that was adorned with paintings on each side. Each piece of art included an engraved placard with information about the artist and the date of creation. Exquisite, Black said as he studied a Monet painting of water lilies. Monet is my favorite impressionist, Harding said. But what you two want to see is a little farther down the hall. Black followed their host 
until he stopped in front of a Winslow Homer painting of the beach in Bermuda. I've never seen this one, Black said. That's because it was from Homer's private collection. In fact, this piece has never even been shown publicly. What a treat, Shields said, clapping her hands. Harding smiled. I've got an even bigger treat for you on the other side of my office here. I've got goose flesh on my neck, Shields said. As he continued to walk down the hall, he pointed up. Say hi to the camera. Shields glanced at it and waved, as did Black. When Harding stopped, he gestured toward the painting. And here is my Degas. Shields gasped as she stared at it. Magnificent. I think so, Harding said. My daughter was into ballet when she was younger. This reminds me of her whenever I see it. I think I could just stand here for days and look at your collection, Black said. Be my guest, Harding said. I'll leave you two alone to settle your dispute. And when you're finished, come find me, and I'll introduce you around. Terrific, Shield said. You're such a gracious host. Harding flashed a wide grin. It's my pleasure. Now, if you'll excuse me. Black watched Harding disappear down the hall with a little skip in his step before turning to Shields. What are we going to do about that camera? She asked. Jana gave me a little something to take care of it, Black said. Just let me know when you're ready to go to work. The two casually stared at the pictures before Shields gave her partner the signal. When she did, Black activated the device that was designed to make the camera fail. Shields picked the lock on Harding's office and announced her entry over the comms to Black. While she worked, he sauntered along the hallway, taking in more of the high-priced art. How's it going? Black asked. I just gained access to Harding's desktop, Shields said, working on cracking into the bank's files. Black shifted from one side of the gallery to the next. After a couple minutes, he reached the top of the landing and was looking at the first piece on the left when he glanced down and locked eyes with Harding, who was at the foot of the stairs. Have I saved your marriage yet? Harding asked with a chuckle. Still trying to decide, Black said with a wink. Well, take it from me, Harding said. That alimony check is the most painful thing you'll do each month. Try to make peace if you can. Black shook his head and smiled. Sage advice. I wish I had taken it myself before I got divorced three times, Harding said with a shrug, before mingling with more guests. Off to scope out wife number four. Black waited until Harding was gone before requesting an update. How's it looking in there? I'm downloading the information now, Shield said. It won't be much longer now, but I've almost got all the files we need to figure who's involved with Kingston Limited. All right, Black said. The coast is clear for now. No sooner had he said that than he turned and saw a man dressed in a suit standing a few feet away. Who are you talking to? The man asked. No one, Black said with a smile and shake of his head. Just a bad habit I have of muttering to myself. The man pulled his coat back, revealing his weapon. Are you sure about that? Black nodded. I'm just going to continue looking at these paintings down the hall if it's all the same to you. He didn't wait for a reply, moving away from the guard and out of the guest's view down below. Where are you going? The man asked. I have some questions for you. Well, I'm not much of an expert on 19th century art, but I might be able to help you out, Black said, trying to remain cool. I'm not talking about Mr. Harding's art. I'm talking about why my security camera stopped working when you came up here, and now your wife is missing. Black cocked his head to one side and squinted. I'm not sure I understand what you're referring to. The fact that the camera stopped working right after Mr. Harding left you here isn't just some odd coincidence. I know you had something to do with it. Still don't know what you're talking about, Black said, keeping up the charade. The guard drew near to Black, who reached in his pocket and pulled out a syringe. He jammed it into the man's neck. As the man went unconscious, Black caught him before he hit the ground and eased his body to the floor. Shields, we gotta go, Black said. 
Not quite done, she fired back. Well, you're going to have to be, because I just incapacitated one of their guards, and I have to leave the body right here since all the doors are locked. We're going to be found out in a matter of seconds, if not sooner. Just casually head to the boat, she said. I'll meet you there. Roger that, Black said as he strode toward the steps. Once he reached the bottom, he saw another burly man pushing his way through the crowd toward Black. The man's gaze met Black's. They're on to us, Black said into the comms. Get out of there right now. He spun and squeezed past guests, who were less than accommodating. Hustling past the bar, Black directed Jana to fire up the boat. I thought I was just supposed to hang out here and hide, she said. Don't have time for this. Can you do it or not? Black asked. I can handle it. Good. Then do it because we're about to be in major trouble if we can't get out of here. Black broke into a full sprint, bumping partygoers and sending drinks flying in the process. The activity drew a few scornful shouts, but Black ignored them. He glanced back at the house and noticed two more security guards pushing their way through the crowd. Shields, where are you? Black asked. I'm coming around the side of the house, she said. Jana, how's the motor coming along? She's humming, Jana said. Just ready for you to get here. Start untying the boat. When Black hit the dock, he saw Jana frantically ripping the ropes off the cleats. He was less than 20 meters away when he heard Shields squawking over the comms. It's gonna be tight, she said. I don't have much of a lead on these goons. Black began working on the final rope when he made it to the vessel. Jana, get behind the wheel. And when I tell you to hit the gas, go wide open, he said. Turning the motor on is one thing, but I've never driven a boat before, Jana said. We don't have a choice. Just do it when I give you the signal. He looked up as he heard footsteps thundering down the dock toward them. The two guards were closing in on shields, and Black determined his options were limited. She couldn't jump very far, and if Black kept the boat close enough to the dock, he'd have a real fight on his hands. Shields, you ready to put your money where your mouth is? Black asked. Stop being so cryptic. Tell me what you want me to do. Dive for the rope, Black said as he tossed a ski rope onto the dock. Hit it, Jana. The back end of the boat sat down on the water as the engine slowly accelerated. Black watched Shields getting closer and closer to the edge. She didn't flinch when she noticed the boat moving either. In one smooth motion, she hit the end of the dock and dove headlong into the water, red sequin dress and all. Both of the guards, who were only a few feet behind her at the time, followed her. But when she re-emerged, she was holding on to the rope, leaving her pursuers in her literal wake. Within a few seconds, she was skimming on top of the water, barefoot and smiling. She blew Black a kiss. Black rushed to the helm, and after a half minute, came to a stop so they could get shields into the boat. Once she was aboard, they roared away. Still want to challenge me on the lake sometime? Shields asked with a wink. Black chuckled and shook his head. I'm fine with declaring you the Firestorm water ski champion. That was amazing, Jana said. I've never seen anything like it. Where'd you learn to do that? Shields held up the flash drive. I'll tell you all about it after we sift through this data. Black piloted the vessel to a slip on the other side of the island. As he was tying off, the women emerged from the cabin below. Did you find anything? Black asked. Uh-huh, Shield said. And you're not gonna believe it. Chapter 38 Washington, D.C. Blunt paced in Judge Harold Welker's chambers chewing on a cigar. While Blunt resisted the label of being a Washington insider, he used it to his advantage when the time called for it. And there wasn't a better opportunity to test his relationships than right now. Welker, who'd been a U.S. district judge for over 40 years, scratched his beard as he read Blunt's request. In the past, the two men had been hunting together on several occasions, with Blunt allowing the judge to get the first shot on some elk. Judge Welker missed the first two chances he had, so on the third time, Blunt shot with the judge, 
and insisted that Welker was the one whose bullet struck the imposing bull elk. Blunt was counting on his previous goodwill to pay dividends. You know, I haven't even had my coffee, Welker said. That's why I brought you this one, Blunt said, placing a cup in front of Welker. Welker took a sip. Black, no sugar. You really know how to butter me up. It's the least I could do for beating you to your office this morning. So tell me, J.D., why didn't the FBI bring this warrant request to me? Welker asked as he scanned the page. I guess everyone is afraid of having their name tied to this, Blunt said. And I can only imagine you might be as well, considering that Vernon Roberts has tried to blackmail you also. Who told you that? Blunt shrugged. Just a hunch that you confirmed for me. That's a dirty trick, J.D., Welker said. Almost as dirty as you killing that elk and pretending like I was the one who killed him. Blunt forced a smile. I don't know what you're talking about. Welker grunted. Don't lie to me. You know how much I hate lying and how much I value honesty. Okay, fine, Blunt said. I did it. I killed it. He glanced up at the elk head towering over Welker's desk. You haven't forgotten, have you? Welker asked. Remember it like yesterday, Blunt said with a chuckle. Well, you didn't try to embarrass me then, and I won't do the same to you either now. But I'm gonna have to deny this. Don't tell me he got to you too, Blunt said as lines creased his forehead. It was one time, J.D. I drank too much, and I couldn't resist the temptation of the buxom blonde at a party one night, Welker said. Roberts is holding it over me like a two-ton anvil. If he found out I did this, this is exactly why Roberts needs to be reeled in. He's attempting to extort half the city to get his way. I know. I even told Gertie years ago and begged for forgiveness. She obviously forgave you, Blunt said. Welker shot a glance at the photo of him and his wife that was well faded. It'll be 44 years in August. Best woman I've ever known. Then what do you have to lose? Blunt asked. It about killed her when I told her what happened 20 years ago. But I love her, and I felt like the only way to handle my sin was to be up front about it. If she left me, I figured I deserved it. What I did was stupid, and I didn't want to live the rest of my life in fear of what might happen if she found out. I had to confront what I did as soon as possible and let the chips fall where they may. But there's a big difference between confessing something privately versus the entire world finding out about it. I know Gertie well, and it'd crush her if that story leaked to the press like Roberts promised to do. He's doing this to the whole city, and you have the power to stop him. Why do you think I'm here standing in place of the FBI? Everyone's compromised to some degree. What's he got on you? Welker asked. Nothing. Though that's not to say there aren't some things I've done that I'm not proud of. If you're scot-free, why do you care so much? Because Roberts is a vindictive asshole, and I'll be damned if I'm going to let him leverage the sins of this town to gain power. No matter what he thinks, he holds no virtuous high ground. I tend to agree with you there, but my whole career might get flushed if it comes out that he had the goods on me. It'll look awfully self-serving. Sign this warrant, and I'll make sure that stuff never surfaces again, and Roberts will never be seen in this town again. Welker signed and stared at the document one more time. You sure there are at least 45 counts of attempted extortion? That we know of. Just sign it, Harry. Welker scratched his autograph on the piece of paper and handed it to Blunt. Good luck. Blunt walked out of Judge Welker's chamber and immediately dialed his FBI contact. I've got the signed warrant. Get ready to move in. Blunt sat in his SUV a few houses down from Roberts' home. The FBI team was positioned a block away, ready to roll up on Roberts and take him down. Roberts sauntered out to his mailbox and collected the morning paper. Wait for it. The front page of the Washington Post included an article about a past report on cyber attacks from China and how it wasn't true. 
In order to save face, the Post editorial board included a piece on how it would be handling sensitive information from government sources. It also included a short sidebar about the resignation of the man who wrote the now debunked piece. Five minutes later, Blunt's phone rang. Well, J.D., someone was busy yesterday, Robert said after Blunt answered. I hope you can live with obliterating a reporter's career over this, because I've got another one lined up. Oh, do you? Don Trapper over at CNN. He's got no journalistic ethics and tons of credibility to burn. If you try and spin this another way. Blunt texted the FBI team. Move in. Well, I have a feeling that Trapper will be more interested in another scoop I'm going to give him. Really? A scoop bigger than an unchecked clandestine military organization wreaking havoc on the free world? You have a curious delusion about who I am and what I do, Blunt said. But yes, I have a much bigger story. Please, by all means, share your big scoop with me so I can tune in to watch. I'm not sure that'll be possible. How come? Blunt smiled as he watched the FBI team skid to a stop outside Roberts' house. Seconds later, Roberts peeked through the curtains. What's going on? Roberts demanded. I think Trapper might prefer a story on a sitting congressman who extorted over 45 federal judges, politicians, and bureaucrats to gain power in Washington. We certainly don't want that kind of activity to go unchecked, do we? You son of a bitch. You'll never get away with this. Blunt could hear the knocking over the phone. I think I already did. Blunt hung up and waited a couple minutes before driving by slowly to watch Robert's frog march to the FBI van and shoved inside. Watching Don Trapper on scene recording the whole incident made Blunt break into an uproarious laugh. It's been good knowing you, Vernon, Blunt said aloud as he drove off. Chapter 39 Washington, D.C. Later that morning, Blunt met with the Firestorm team and its two newest honorary members at the offices. With full good out of commission, Blunt felt it was safe to return to normalcy. Edge had an Americano waiting at his seat, while Jana had a latte at hers. Blunt wore a wide smile as Black and Shields entered the conference room. What's this? Black asked as he glanced at the drinks and the lack of them at his and Shields' spots. Are you playing favorites now? All the time, Blunt said with a chuckle. It's how I keep everyone in line, including the golden boy. Oh, so we risk our lives to do our jobs, and you single me out and disparage me in front of everyone. Uh-huh, Blunt said with a wink. Something like that. Black shrugged. In that case, maybe I should keep this bourbon I bought for you in the Caymans. Maybe I'll reconsider, Blunt said, craning his neck to see the label, which Black had strategically covered with his hand. Not until you take it back and apologize for calling me the golden boy, Black said. We all know Brady Hawk is your favorite anyway. Okay, Blunt said. Whatever it takes. I'm sorry. Good, Shield said. Now that your middle school drama is over with, we have some serious business to discuss. Blunt grunted as he stood. What did you find? As I texted you last night, Shields began, we found out who was behind Kingston Limited, which was running the mine over in Malawi. It was Schwartz, wasn't it? Edge asked. Close, Shields said, holding up her index finger. Caribbean Island Bank identifies its customers with last names as well as a customer ID, Jana said. Schwartz was the name, along with a four-digit number. That seemed compelling enough to Shields, but I looked a little harder. Black smiled. I like this budding rivalry. The four digits corresponded with the last four of the social security number for Schwartz's son, Kyle, Jana said. I warned you that Senator Schwartz was a good man. Black said. I wouldn't go that far, Shields said. But that doesn't change the fact that we've still got a major problem. Indeed we do, Blunt said. And we need to solve it before Kyle Schwartz absconds to a foreign country with all his cash. 
If Caribbean Islands Bank warned him that there was a breach, he's likely going to leave the country. Are any of your friends at the FBI up for a doubleheader? Black asked. I mean, they've probably all still got their gear on. I'm one step ahead of you, Blunt said with a wink. They're already on the way to pick him up. Blunt opened up his laptop and clicked a few buttons. Seconds later, the conference room projector whirred to life, and images from an FBI agent's body cam appeared on a screen against the far wall. What's this? Shields asked. This is the raid on Kyle Schwartz's big estate on the Potomac, Blunt said. The entire team watched as the SWAT team swarmed the property. As they drew closer to the house, the body cam focused on the front door. They all froze as they read a hastily written note plastered on it. What's it say? Jana asked. A warning not to enter because the house is rigged with explosives, Shields explained. Fall back! Fall back! The agents could be heard shouting once they digested the note. He's probably bluffing. Black said. You want to test that theory? Shields asked. Black nodded. I would if I was there. The Firestorm crew watched as the team regrouped near its fleet of SUVs. Sir, one of the men said as he looked at the commander. There's an incoming call being patched to us. It's Kyle Schwartz. The commander put the call on speaker so everyone could hear. Kyle, this is Special Agent Peter Langston with the FBI. We need to speak with you. It doesn't look like you guys are interested in having a conversation, Kyle said. We don't want anybody to get hurt, but we have a warrant for your arrest for treason, the commander said. You need to come out, or else you may not live to even regret your decision. I knew it, Kyle said, his voice more frantic than ever. You're just going to blow me away, aren't you? That's not what we're going to do at all, especially if we don't have to. Langston said. We'd prefer that this situation end peacefully. I want to speak to a negotiator, Kyle said. We have plenty of those around here, Langston said. In fact, I'm qualified to speak with you in that capacity. No, I want a specific person. Langston scowled as he looked around at his agents. Okay, I'll play along. Who do you want? I want Titus Black. Black's mouth fell agape. What? How does he even know who I am? Damn it, Blunt said. That son of a bitch is about to burn you. I need to talk with Special Agent Langston right now. Less than a minute later, Langston was on the speaker in the conference call room. JD, it's been a while, Langston said. Can you help me out here? I know who Titus Black is, Blunt said. He's a black ops agent. If any of this gets out, he's going to be burned. You've got to promise me, for Black's sake, that all your men's body cams are turned off. This agent can't be identified in any form of public record. I'm afraid we're not authorized to make that call. Langston, I've known you for several years, and you know I wouldn't just ask this frivolously. No, Langston said, you wouldn't. But that doesn't matter when it comes to protocol. Screw protocol. That's the condition of me helping you connect with him. Otherwise, you're on your own. And I'm sure shooting the son of a sitting senator won't be something you'll want on your record. Langston sighed. Fine. But this is on you if I get called on the carpet about this. You'll be fine, I promise. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure you don't suffer any blowback. I'll take the heat for you. All right, Langston said. Send him to Kyle Schwartz's house. I'll text you the address. Blunt hung up and looked at Black. Good luck. You're going to need it. Black pulled into the driveway of Schwartz's Tudor-style home and rang the doorbell. Moments later, a walkie-talkie dropped through the mail slot in the front door. Pick it up, Kyle said over the device. Black adjusted the comms in his ear where he could hear the FBI team discussing what to do as they listened in. I'm Titus Black, and I'm here to help. Kyle laughed. Sure you are. I mean, you wouldn't be here for any other reason, would you? Tell me what you want, and I'll see if I can help, Black said. I'd like a private island, 
A billion dollars and five babes in bikinis to escort me in a new corporate jet, Kyle said. I like a man who aims for the stars, Black said. But don't you already have more than enough money, along with corporate jets and your own family island? Forget it, Kyle said. What I really want is immunity. Immunity? Black asked as he looked back at Langston positioned on the curb. Langston vehemently shook his head. Black scanned the area and noticed a couple men with sniper rifles on nearby rooftops. Did I stutter? Kyle asked. Immunity from what? Prosecution for my testimony. Testimony against whom? Black asked. The men who are behind all of this. Black took a deep breath and exhaled. I'm sorry, Kyle, but you're being very vague. I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. You know more than anybody. You're aware of the Full Good Initiative, aren't you? Uh-huh. And? Well, General Carmichael was just the tip of the iceberg. So General Higgins wasn't involved at all? Black asked. If you want to know the answers to these questions, you need to get me an immunity deal. Because if you think that my involvement with that mine in Malawi was my own invention, you're sadly mistaken. Okay, so why do we need to negotiate? Black asked. In his ear, he heard the chatter of Langston and two snipers. One of the men said he had a shot. No, Black said over his comms. I've got this. He then turned back to his walkie-talkie. Kyle, are you there? Yes. Are you going to answer my question? A moment of silence before Kyle continued. There's a bomb. A nuke, to be exact. A bomb? Black asked, trying to stay calm. Here? No, somewhere in the city. And if I don't get an immunity deal within an hour, it's going to detonate. Okay, Black said. Let me see what I can do. I got the shot, one of the snipers said. I can see him through the window. Hold your fire, Langston said. Black put down his walkie-talkie. Tell your men not to shoot, Langston. I've got this. We can't authorize an immunity deal. He's facing treason, and there's no one who would go for that. Let me talk to Blunt and see if we can work something out. If Kyle has a nuke set to go off in the city, we're talking about catastrophic loss of life. Okay, Langston said. You've got five minutes. Black hustled back to his vehicle to call Blunt. But the sound of glass breaking made him sick to his stomach. No! Black shouted as he spun around. From the walkway, he could hear the sound of a body hitting the floor. Black turned toward the house and then rushed inside to confirm Kyle's death. Got him, sir, the sniper said in Black's comms. He felt for Kyle's pulse and confirmed the senator's son was dead. After a deep breath, Black emerged from the house and glared in the direction of the shooter. Damn you, Black growled under his breath. Chapter 40 Washington, D.C. Black hustled down the walkway toward Langston and the other FBI agents gathered around their vehicles. Langston's face was red with rage as he was in the middle of dressing down the shooter. Black's hue was a similar color, and he didn't wait for Langston to finish before tearing into the man who had administered the kill shot. Did you hear what was going on down there? Black asked. We're screwed now. We've got less than an hour to find a nuclear bomb or millions are going to die. And I'm holding you personally responsible, if you live. Black paced back and forth before calling the firestorm team. What the hell happened out there? Blunt asked. Total shit show, Black said. Some guy wanted to be the hero and took out Kyle before I had a chance to milk any more information from him. So now what? Shields asked. Should we start sounding the alarm? It won't matter much, Black said. We'll have mass chaos, and the number of people who will actually be able to make it to safety will be minimal, with how the beltway will be gridlocked. Do you have an alternate plan? Blunt asked. As a matter of fact, I do, Black said as he hustled back into the house. Hold on a minute. He snatched up Kyle's phone and held it in front of him to gain access to the device. Once Black had all the files open, he raced back outside to get Langston. 
Can I borrow your laptop for a second? Black asked. Sure, whatever you need. Black connected Kyle's cell to Langston's computer. You there, Shields? I never left. Good, Black said. I'm extracting all of the GPS data from Kyle's phone over the last 24 hours. And how's that going to help? Blunt asked. We don't have much time to meet out theories, but based on the timeline of how everything went down, I think Kyle did this last night. In fact, I would bet he did this almost immediately after receiving a mass text message from Cayman Islands Bank President Kellen Harding. I thought we determined that he didn't say anything to protect his bank's image. Didn't say anything publicly, Black said, but privately is a different matter. I found a message from him almost immediately on Kyle's phone that was sent about an hour after we left the party. That would have given Kyle more than enough time to set up a fail-safe bomb in case he was arrested like he was, Shields said. Black nodded, excited that his partner was jiving with his theory. I'm sending this data to you, and I want you to decipher where he most likely would have gone. Okay, Shields said. I'm receiving this now. You're gonna need to give me a minute. Black paced around the front yard while he waited. Langston apologized to Black and asked what they could do to help. Just sit tight, Black said. We've got to try something, and I'm hoping that I guessed right. A few minutes later, Shields came back online. I've got some news for you, but I'm not sure it's the best news in the world. Anything's better than learning that there's a nuclear bomb set to detonate somewhere in your city within an hour, Black said. Here it goes, she said. There are three potential locations. The Jefferson Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, and Ford Theater. I'll go to the Jefferson Memorial, Black said. Edge, I need you to go to the Lincoln Memorial. I'll get the FBI team here to head to Ford Theater. And what about us? Shields asked. You and Jana hang at the office, Black said. We're going to need you. That much I'm sure of. Better hurry, she said. You're down to 40 minutes if Kyle was telling the truth. Black hung up before updating Langston and drafting his team's help. Black pressed the ignition button on his car, and the engine roared to life. He tore off down the street behind the FBI impromptu motorcade. They ripped through the city streets on the way to their destinations, before splitting off in different directions. Black switched to the Firestorm comms and had Shields and Jana figure out a way to connect everyone together on the same channel. I'm almost there. Black said as he dodged cars, weaving in and out of traffic. A couple minutes later, he barely waited for his vehicle to come to a full stop before he was sprinting toward the Jefferson Memorial. Anybody see anything? Black asked. I'm in the president's box at Ford Theater, Langston said. There's nothing here that I can readily see. Edge? Black asked. The Lincoln Memorial appears fine, Edge said. I just completed a sweep and I don't see anything that looks remotely like a nuclear weapon. But I'll keep looking and let you know if I find something. Black jumped out of his car and raced toward the Jefferson Memorial. Once he hustled up the steps, he pushed his way through the line of tourists waiting their turn to look at the landmark. Black raced inside and circled around the statue of Jefferson. Nothing. Next, Black looked skyward to see if he could see anything tucked in the top of the memorial. Nothing was readily visible. Black's odd behavior drew the attention of a park ranger, who asked Black what he was doing. I know this sounds crazy, but I need to see anywhere else someone could hide something in this place, Black said. Hide something? Like what? Black shrugged. I'm thinking maybe something about the size of a suitcase. The ranger frowned. What's going on? Is there something I need to know about? Black tugged on the man's sleeve getting him to retreat over to the side away from all the prying ears of tourists. I'm with the feds, Black said, flashing his credentials, and we have reason to believe someone might be planning an attack here. What kind of attack? Black glanced around the room before speaking in a hushed tone. A bomb. The ranger's eyes widened. A bomb? Shh, Black said, putting his index finger to his lips. Yes, a bomb. Well, I would have seen something like that, the ranger said. I make a sweep of this place every morning before we officially open up to the public. What about the basement? The basement? 
It's darn near impossible to get down there without one of the rangers knowing. Black locked eyes with the man. Humor me. Okay, follow me. They hustled down the steps and into the basement, which was a cavernous area, containing plenty of support beams for the structure overhead. You've got ten minutes by my rough estimate, Shields said over the comms. Roger that, Black said. The ranger whipped around. Excuse me? Sorry, Black said, pointing to his ear. Just talking to my team. How serious is this? It's a nuclear bomb. Running now won't do you any good, so you might as well stay and help me. That's a good one, the man said, breaking into a chuckle and shaking his head. A nuclear bomb in the Jefferson Memorial. I'm not kidding around, Black said. I'm as serious as a heart attack. The man picked up the pace, clicking on his flashlight to illuminate a few dark spots in the basement. I'm not seeing anything. Are you? Nothing, Black said. Anywhere else down here that you might be able to hide something about the size of a suitcase? Well, there's one more place, the ranger said. Look over here. His light fell on a large 3D model of the Jefferson Memorial. When this place was first constructed, engineers used this model to determine how they could light the monument at night, since there was so much ambient light around Washington. Black rushed over to it. I'm sure it's a fascinating story, but save it. We need to move this thing and see if the bomb is under here. The ranger followed Black's lead, and the two men lifted up the model. Once they moved it aside, Black noticed a large gray box. Is that supposed to be there? He asked. I've never seen that before, the ranger said. Black knelt next to the object and opened the lid. Inside, he scanned the mechanical pieces of a bomb with a screen display counting down the time. Holy shit, the ranger said. What are you going to do? What are we going to do is the better question, Black said. Did you find anything? Shields asked. We got it, but we have less time than you estimated, Black said into his comms. We're just under four minutes. Any idea how to dismantle this thing? I'm all ears. Send me a picture, she said. Black promptly texted her a picture and waited. Am I going to die? The ranger asked. We all are one day, Black said. It's unavoidable. The man shook his head and paced around the model. I don't want to go like this. I only started this job because my internship fell through last summer. I thought I'd be doing something more related to my major. What was your major? Psychology? At least you're getting a chance to dabble in the psychology of fear, Black said. I don't think we really need to try and find a silver lining here especially if I'm going to die. Black sat down and leaned against one of the concrete pilings. He tapped the ground, gesturing for the man to join him. I mean, there's so much more I wanted to do with my life, the ranger said as he took a seat next to Black. I wanted to get married, have kids, tour Europe, start a foundation for kids with reading disabilities. All very noble goals, Black said. Is there anything you wished you would have done? Black shrugged. If this doesn't work out, I'm going to die doing what I loved, which is protecting innocent people in the service of this great country. It's all I've ever wanted to do. All the other stuff you do in life is just the icing on the cake. You love the ones closest to you, and you do what you love, and you'll have a great ride, no matter how long or short it is. Black glanced at his watch and exhaled. So, if this isn't what you want to die doing, quit today and start fresh tomorrow, Black said. We still have to turn that thing off, the ranger said. Your sage advice will mean nothing in three minutes and twenty seconds if we don't get it turned off. So let's not fail today, Black said, pulling out his knife. You got one of these? The man nodded. We'll get it out. We've got work to do. Shields' voice crackled on the comms. All right, I think we've got it figured out. I'm all ears, Black said. You're going to need someone to help you, she said. Already taken care of. I've drafted a park ranger here to help me. Good, she said. Now, you can cut the circuit on this bomb setup, but only if you snip the wires at the exact same time, in the order I tell you. We're ready, Black said. 
before explaining to the ranger what they were about to do. Keep those hands steady. Clip the blue wire first, Shield said. Blue wire on three, Black said. He counted down, and the two men snipped the wire in unison. We're still here, Black said as he checked the timer. And this baby is still counting down. Three more wires to go, Shield said. They moved through a progression of red wires, followed by green. The only ones remaining were yellow and orange. Now which one? Black asked. Just leave the yellow one and cut the orange. Black glanced at the LCD screen, which showed 45 seconds remaining. Ready? Black asked. This orange one is the last one. The ranger nodded. Black counted down. One. A bullet whizzed past both men as a gunman took aim at them. Black rolled to cover, dragging the ranger with him. When Black went to put both hands on his gun, he realized his left was covered in blood. I think I've been hit, the ranger said, his eyes widening from shock. Just hang in there, Black said. The gunman took several more shots at Black before ditching his pistol for a semi-automatic rifle and spraying bullets everywhere. Black covered the ranger until the shooting stopped. Then, Black waited in silence, the timer still counting down in his head. He rose and took aim at the man streaking across the room. Black only needed three shots to take the man out. The first one missed, but the next two hit the man in the chest, putting him on the ground. Come on, Black said, dragging the ranger, his name tag of Jefferson spattered with blood. I don't think I can do it, Jefferson said. I feel weak. We've got ten seconds, Black said. Millions of innocent people will die if you can't help me. The man growled as he staggered to his knees and leaned over the bomb. Clip the orange wire on two, Black said. One, two. Snip. The wire snapped in half, and then Black backed away from the device. The timer froze on three seconds. We did it. Black said over his comms, followed by jubilant screams from Shields and Janna. He scrambled over to Jefferson, who was struggling to breathe. Shields, get me a medic ASAP, Black said. I've got a park ranger down. Black applied pressure to the man's wound in his chest. I'm gonna die, aren't I? He asked, his eyes barely open. Not today, Jefferson. Not today. Black squeezed the man's hand and waited for the paramedics to arrive. I'm not coming back to the office today, Black said. I've got something I need to do. Chapter 41 Washington, D.C. Two days later, Black pushed Jefferson in a wheelchair out of Walter Reed Hospital and to his car. The ranger grasped Black's hand and smiled. In the lobby, a handful of Jefferson's colleagues and family members were there to greet him. Thanks, Jefferson said. I don't think I would have held on if it hadn't been for you. Black smiled and tousled Jefferson's hair. You did great, man. Hopefully you'll never have to risk your life like that again in the future. Don't bet on it, Jefferson said. I know what I want to do now. Oh, Black said, his eyes widening. What's that? I want to be a federal agent, like you. Black chuckled. Whenever you need a recommendation, you let me know. I'll make sure anyone who turns you down would be a fool. And Jefferson? The ranger stood and turned to face Black. Yeah? Thank you. You did a good thing. And I'm glad you didn't have to make the ultimate sacrifice for all those people. See you soon, Jefferson said with a wry grin. Later that afternoon, Black reconvened with the rest of the Firestorm team to discuss the aftermath of the near calamity. Blunt was handing out celebratory glasses of bourbon and wearing a wide smile on his face. He used his cane to push Black's tumbler across the table. Don't point that thing at me, Black said, or feed me that inferior liquor of yours. It's a glass of scotch, Agent Black. You didn't think I'd subject you to this knockoff Kentucky brand, did you? I'll be the judge of that, Black said, before he took a long pull. Now this is how to celebrate. 
I'm glad you approve, Blunt said. But before we break out the disco ball, there are a few loose ends we need to discuss. Yeah, Black said, clinking glasses with shields. Like these ladies, who helped deactivate that bomb. How did they do it? Jana took an engineering class at Georgia Tech that had a competition on how to dismantle different types of bombs, Shield said, cutting her eyes at the team's newest official member. She won the competition. Everyone clapped. In pressure situations, I find that I thrive. That's why I'm so excited about joining this Stella group. And who was the shooter in the memorial? Black asked. I never even bothered to look for him. When the police got there, they couldn't find anyone, Blunt said. There was obviously a gunfight, but no other weapon or person was found at the scene. Black shook his head. Well, that's odd. In the meantime, you'll be happy to know that Senator Schwartz has shifted oversight of the Malawi mine to a Dutch company located in Karanga that dismantled all machines with uranium-enriching capabilities. And Roberts? Shields asked. Any word on him? Don't expect him to be out of jail in your lifetime, Blunt said. He's going to get hammered with a huge sentence. Sounds like I have a chance to take a vacation, Black said. Maybe Tahiti, or somewhere else in the South Pacific, where I can disappear for a month or so. Blunt grunted. If only we were that lucky. I've got plenty of other work for you to do, starting with Al Shiri. Not to mention the Full Good Initiative isn't quite dead yet. What do you mean? Shields asked. I got this cryptic message from an anonymous source at the Pentagon that said not everyone involved has been apprehended, and it implicated another general that nobody even mentioned. I'm not sure how good the tip is, but it's worth looking into. Black looked at Edge. And what about this fellow? Is he going to stick around? Edge smiled and shrugged. Sounds like there's still plenty of work more than what just a couple of agents can handle. Blunt pulled out a cigar and jammed it into his mouth. I'll see you all in the morning with new assignments. Black finished off his drink and looked at Shields. Thanks for all your help. I wouldn't want to do this with anyone else. Shields frowned. Don't get all sappy on me. Now, I think we have a rematch that awaits at the range. You game? Black smiled. I wouldn't dare miss it. This concludes Blowback, Book 5 of the Titus Black series. Written by R.J. Patterson. Performed by Kyle Tate. The executive producer is Eric West. Copyright 2020 by R.J. Patterson. Production copyright 2022 by R.J. Patterson. Be sure to look for book six in the Titus Black series, Honorable Lies. Thanks for listening.